is touching the truth. POV narration Big Mom licked her lips greedily as she stared at Enel. She knew that he was decently strong, so she was rather excited to taste his soul. But first, she decided to take a look at it. She had seen many souls, and she had had the pleasure of tasting most of them. Either marines, bounty hunters, or even her own children. To her, all souls looked the same. But what she saw made her stop in her tracks completely. Her gaze became stony, almost looking petrified. It wasn't something natural, Lin Lin simply couldn't understand what she was looking at. It was strange, but the second she tried to stare at Enel's soul, she felt odd. She realized it rather quickly, Enel simply had no soul. No life energy to speak of, it was as if she was looking at a corpse, but that corpse was moving around perfectly and seemed to be able to talk too. The more she looked at the enigma in front of her, the weirder she felt. She was about to open her mouth and ask Enel where his soul was, but then she felt as if something else was looking at her, something that slightly unnerved her. She felt that she could see another pair of eyes right on Enel's shadow, red eyes that stared at her with disinterest as if she were an insect. She raised an eyebrow at first prideful as she was an emperor of the seas. Her conqueror's hockey flared up at that gaze, as she imposed herself. Her children around her seemed to react to that all of them stepping backwards hoping to not get caught up in her rage. Enel also raised an eyebrow at the outburst, he was getting a rather strange feeling as well. Big Mom was confident in herself, but the more defiantly she stared at Enel's shadow, the larger it became, and the pair of eyes seemed to become more bloodshot as if finally acknowledging her. More and more eyes started appearing inside the enlarged Ned's shadow, tentacles seemed to be extending towards her, trying to grasp at her. She could feel them, not on her body, but on her soul. She had never felt that insignificant before, this was the first time since her childhood that she had felt so panicked, that she had felt she was no longer in control of anything. What the hell is this? Thing. Was all that she could think of. She quickly took her gaze away from him, no longer trying to find Enel's soul as cold sweat filled her back. She could feel it, if she was any weaker, that gaze that had stared back at her would have broken her will completely. She couldn't understand it, but one thing was pretty clear to her, his soul was almost certainly off limits. If he even had one. What? Big Mom herself was shocked by how weakened her tone was. And her children now also noticed that something was wrong. They all rushed to her side as she fell backwards on her ass, she rubbed her forehead in pain. Enel stopped twirling his staff as he looked a bit confused. What? Enel could also feel something strange, it was as if there was someone else standing behind him. He turned around, only to see the hallway he had come from. Completely empty, with no sign of anything even moving. Even the wind refrained from making any sounds. Oven and Katakuri had also rushed to their mother. Even if she was callous and uncaring toward them, they were still fiercely loyal to her. Enel didn't bother stopping them, he was still frozen there as some sweat appeared on his brow as well. What the hell is he doing here? He could recognize that presence. But that didn't serve as any peace of mind. Enel. Was your name, right? Big Mom said as she was slowly starting to get up. She was still clearly weakened, which was shocking to all of her children. Katakuri looked toward Enel with anger in his gaze. What did he do? He knew that Enel didn't move at all, he had been keeping a close eye on him. That question was automatically answered though when Katakuri saw the panicked and confused expression on Enel's face. Yais. That's my name. Enel said as he started regaining his bearings. Whatever that thing's motivations were, Enel knew that he now had to deal with them. I don't know what you've gotten yourself into, but I don't want you anywhere near me or my children. Big Mom said as a serious look reached her eyes. Although she was uncaring to most of her children, she still had her motherly instincts. Seeing all of her children rush towards her, and try to support her even when she was weakened. It gave her a warm feeling. They were her family, even if she had seen them as tools, that didn't matter. They were hers anyway. What did you see Lin Lin? Enel had realized, to some extent, what had happened. It wasn't that hard for him to piece it together. A few minutes of silence passed by, no one spoke a single word, and no one even bothered to address the fact that Enel wasn't using honorifics with Big Mom either. I don't know. But I don't think I want to know either. 
Some things are better left unknown in this world. Big Mom answered, at this point, she seemed to have recovered her strength. Her children looked shocked at the weird turn of events. They also didn't stop Enel when the latter turned around and simply started leaving in a hurry. Harrisparrow and Smoothie were about to follow Enel, to make sure that he wouldn't escape. But Big Mom reached out her arm and stopped the two of them. This made the others even more confused, as they had never seen their mother act like that. Mother. What happened? Oven asked, the concern in his voice was evident as he looked in the direction Enel had retreated on. Enel has no soul. Big Mom ended up saying after another period of silence. The Emperor was still trying to make out what had actually happened, her thoughts were all jumbled up as her mind seemed to be unable to forget the gaze that had stared her down. She didn't bother telling them about it though, to her, they had no need to know that. As she had said, some things were better left unknown. This made the eyes of everyone in the room widen, as they saw their still flabbergasted mother sit on her throne with a loud thud. That must be a mistake, right? Even if he was a resurrected corpse, he'd still have one. Persopero said as he grasped at his hat. All of the people within the Big Mom pirates had a lot of knowledge when it came to souls. Big Mom herself was supposed to have complete control over souls. No one, not one of them had heard of a soulless human before. All living beings had souls, there shouldn't have been an exception to that rule. Anything other than that was simply unnatural. I know what I saw. There is no mistaking it. Don't get involved with him, if you encounter him in the future just run. Big Mom seemed to not budge one bit on this issue, so none of her children insisted on that line of questioning. You understood mother. Let us get you some sweets. We wouldn't want to dampen your mood like this. Perispero, being the oldest son, was quick to recover and try to placate his mother. The last thing he needed was for their mother to throw a tantrum and destroy the chateau again. No. That won't be necessary. All of you can leave, for now, I want to be alone. At this point, everyone in the room was worried. Big Mom wouldn't simply refuse sweets. Still, they decided to just listen to their mother's words and leave. Whatever had happened, she could likely handle it, as she was a Yonko for a reason. But Oven looked at his mother weirdly. He knew that something else had happened, most of his siblings were likely aware of that too. He had also noticed how Enel had turned around in that exchange. Nothing was behind him, but he had simply never seen that much panic in Enel's gaze. Not once during their journey was he that confused, and never did his face turn such a pale color. Whatever their mother had felt inside of Enel, it managed to scare the both of them somehow. And Enel was apparently just as unaware of it as his mother. Oven was quick to start walking towards where Enel had fled, only to not find anything at all. Even with his observation, he couldn't feel him anywhere nearby. On the floor, he could just see a few parchments. On them were drawn schematics for a mechanical arm and leg similar to that of Kairos. Oven smiled at that, Enel must have drawn them while he was sleeping during their flight. Oven exited the palace and looked in the distance with a confident smile. I hope our paths cross again. I will be stronger by then. Maybe I will be the one to help you when we meet. Oven then turned around, going back into the castle as he started contacting mechanics and doctors to put the mechanical limbs together. Not all of his siblings had such positive thoughts though. Persopero, the eldest sibling, only had one thought in mind, soulless or not. We cannot let this slide, I can't forgive him for making a mockery of mother. POV Enel okay, I don't know what the fuck that was. But I really don't think I should hang around this place anymore. I had felt watched in the past, but I hadn't expected something like this to happen. Big Mom herself said that I have no soul, I was able to listen in on her conversation as I was leaving the castle. This doesn't make any sense, honestly. Whatever God did, it turned me into this. Problem is, I have no actual answers as to what I am now. I'm sure that God was there, it likely scared Big Mom away. But I don't know why it decided to do that. I feel. Dirty. I think that's the right word for this. There isn't anyone that can explain this to me either. There are countless religions in this world, so I guess that thing is also present in this place. It only makes sense for it to watch me, it most likely sent me here for its own entertainment. Even if it's something I ultimately wanted. Regardless, I had never seen Big Mom in that state in the show. 
she was always prideful, with good reason as she is a Yonko. But, now she looked almost docile. I do remember that god looking creepy as fuck, but I don't know if a Yonko would react like that if they were just slightly creeped out like I was. I will try to find out more about this after the war. I will have to look into more religions and see if I can find out more about souls in general. I might also have to ask Big Mom a bit more about souls. But for now, I will follow Lin Lin's words and stay away from her and her children. I wanted to make friends with some of them, but I guess that's not possible anymore. At least not yet. Well, Oven is still technically my friend, but I don't know how much he'll help in the future. As he is now, he will be a decent ally, but not someone I can take to the more important battles. I still left him those schematics though, no reason to burn bridges for no reason. If anything, after today, it's improbable that Big Mom will make an enemy out of me. Although, I guess she's also unlikely to become my ally. Well, you can't win them all. Still, a win on my part was passing by the road Pondglyph and copying its writing. No one even knows I was there in the first place, the treasure room was heavily guarded, but I was able to enter it without much issue thanks to my devil fruit. I'll have the time to translate it later on, for now, I need to leave the Cake Islands and find some random island to train myself for a bit. POV narration Enel's departure from Big Mom's territory was smooth, no one actually stopped him because he left really quickly, and he didn't really bother sightseeing either. It wasn't that hard to find an uninhabited island afterwards, Enel also didn't bother using a ship, as he simply turned into lightning and traveled through the clouds. It took him around 15 minutes to reach another island outside of Big Mom's territory. The island he chose was also apparently filled to the brim with wild beasts. This was optimal, as Enel then spent the rest of the month training on it. The beasts helped him train in both Shurgan and Kami. By the end of his island training, Enel had some mastery over all of the six powers, through his mastery of Kami he also gained mastery over Saimai Kikin, which allowed him to control his body almost perfectly. During that month, Enel also trained his conqueror's hockey on the wildlife everywhere on the island. He could easily knock them out, but he wasn't all that consistent in using it at first. Only after a few weeks of trial and error did he start gaining some semblance of control over it. Not without complications, of course. Nothing too concerning for now though. His armament hockey was also stronger than ever now, as he trained by destroying a mountain on that island. It was a long process, that lasted for the entire month, basically, half of his day was spent punching away at a mountain. He only slept for around three hours at night, and he didn't sleep most nights. The mountain training method was also something that Enel had taken from Garp, who had leveled eight mountains for training at some point in the past. Enel didn't really know how much time that had taken the legendary marine hero, but he could only assume that Garp had a lot more time to train than he did. Enel was currently running on a rather tight schedule, at this point he believed he was rather prepared for the war of the best, both physically and mentally. At this point, Enel was well aware that Ace's execution was a few days away. Extremely close to happening. He had timed his training properly, waiting for the right moment. Now, he was about to leave the island and return to Marineford, where most marines were gathering in order to prepare for the war. Well, Enel would have gone there had he not received a call from Sengoku a few hours from his departure. He contemplated not answering the call for a few seconds, Sengoku hadn't contacted him ever since the Dressrosa incident. At this point, Enel was technically supposed to be heading back to the base already. Sengoku didn't really take into consideration how quickly Enel could travel around or the fact that he would stop to train for a month, so he most likely believed Enel was already somewhat close to Marineford with his flying ship. In the end, Enel decided to just answer, whatever happened would happen anyway, no reason to keep postponing the conversation. Hello. Enel here, go for it. Enel said, getting straight to the point. Enel. Glad to hear from you. I called to ask about your whereabouts and the state of your mission. Sengoku's voice could be heard on the other line, sounding rather calm. Mission was completed, don't think the Big Mom pirates will start a war either. Currently heading back to Marineford. Enel said as he twirled one of his earlobes around. Exceptional. I knew you could be trusted with such a mission. I'm sure you saw the news, that a war will be happening in a few days at Marineford. Enel could feel Sengoku stress through the recording. The rear admiral could only guess. The amount of paperwork that had to be done for that specific event. 
The entire thing was to be broadcasted to the world, so Enel knew that Sengoku had a lot of people to talk with and many things to arrange for it. Yep, a bit difficult to ignore the news. Seriously, we went from not wanting to start a war with a Yonko to purposefully starting a war with the strongest Yonko. Enel said while rolling his eyes a bit. He knew the truth though, he knew that Ace was Roger's son, so the circumstances were completely different in this case. Yeah. Things are a bit different here though. You will understand during the execution. For now, I need your help with a little something. Sengoku didn't seem keen on explaining everything through the transponder snail, Enel also didn't bother to press him. Sure, I still have some free time. What do you need help with? Enel didn't really know what else he needed to do, but he assumed it was relatively important since he was contacted so suddenly. Well, we are currently gathering all of the remaining warlords to Marineford. I need you to drop by Amazon Lily on your way to Marineford and pick up Boa Hancock. I was going to send Mamanga, but he seems preoccupied with training right now, and since you're already close and can travel faster, I figured it would be better this way. Enel just stared at the transponder snail for a bit. Fucking great, POV narration Enel didn't need a long time to reach the skies above Amazon Lily, he couldn't quite go at light speed, as he was afraid of being unable to control that speed and ending up somewhere in space. But turning into a lightning bolt and traveling from cloud to cloud as far as his observation hockey allowed him turned out to be an extremely fast method of travel regardless of that. He didn't even need an hour, and he was lounging on a cloud above Amazon Lily, thinking of the best way to approach the situation. Enel knew that he was now bound to meet both Luffy and Boa Hancock, he still remembered how Luffy hid inside the warlord's clothes. Enel didn't really understand how Luffy was able to hide in that way, but he assumed that maybe Momonga's observation hockey was a bit lackluster. Regardless, Enel knew that he'd also have to make a pit stop at Impel Down on Boa Hancock's request. Something that he really didn't care much about. He was going to let Luffy do his thing, even if his current relationship with Luffy was a bit strained, he still had thoughts of befriending the future son god Nika. Or at the very least not antagonizing him needlessly. Luffy was the protagonist of that world for a reason. When it came to potential, Enel knew that Luffy was one of the best in the world. Enel used his gauntlets to create his usual ship, he circled around above the clouds for a bit, then he started descending at the docks, not wanting to park his boat on their castle. Although it seemed like the funny thing to do, it would have been a bit disrespectful on his part, and he had no reason to antagonize Hancock either. He turned his usual chair into a beach chair, lounging as his boat landed on the sand near the docks. Enel wasn't exactly deluded enough to think that his boat could float on water. Enel raised his head a bit, as dozens of bows were pointed toward him as soon as his boat landed on the island. Who are you? State your business. One Amazonist shouted, looking at Enel with indignation. Enel looked at her, not getting up from his chair, he waved his hand to greet the people around his ship. I'm Rear Admiral Enel, great to meet you all. I'm here for Hancock, headquarters summoning all of the warlords to Marineford. Enel said as he stretched a bit in his chair. The Amazon warriors looked at each other for a bit. We will go inform our empress. Don't make any sudden moves, Marine. Some of them proceeded to leave and inform Hancock of Enel's appearance. Enel sighed a bit as he started drinking some wine randomly, he thankfully still had some that Oven had used for cooking. I wish I had brought some rice crackers with me. The rear admiral spent the next hour basically sunbathing on a golden boat. At some point, the Amazon warriors had stopped pointing their arrows at him and were just hanging around the ship, waiting for their empress to arrive. If Enel had bad intentions, he would have done something in the first hour of waiting after all. Eventually, Boa Hancock finally reached the port, accompanied by her sisters. Enel blinked a few times, the pirate empress did look every bit as impressive as was described in the original story. She was relatively tall, around 1. meters, 6, feet, she was rather curvy but otherwise slender. She had long waist-length black hair. She wore a purple dress with her tribe's designs on it and purple high heels. She had snake earrings, rather large by Enel's opinion, but he wasn't about to start dissing her looks. She also wore a large white fur coat, which covered her shoulders and her back perfectly. Enel could feel someone else strapped to her though, something that made him smile a bit. The Empress of the Sea in the Flesh. Enel said, not even getting up from his beach chair. Hancock stared at Enel for a bit, 
Her eyes narrowed as she instantly recognized the person in front of her. Enel. Didn't think someone like you would show up. The Empress scowled a bit. Like most important figures, she had managed to see the recording of Enel's fight with Doflamingo. Boa Hancock had been quite excited at the prospect of being able to help Luffy, the only reason she agreed to respond to this call was for her to give Luffy a chance to reach Impel down. Tricking someone like Enel would be a bit more difficult though. No. All men are the same, I'm sure I can persuade him regardless of that. She ended up smiling and laughing haughtily, raising her head up high, almost doing a backhand bridge as she also arched herself backwards in that same motion. I guess it only makes sense for someone like you to come for I. Enel just raised an eyebrow at the strange way the woman addressed herself at the end. You're not Hina, it doesn't work for you. Yeah, yeah, Enel's words were interrupted by a muffled voice, long ears. It was obviously Luffy finally catching a glimpse of Enel through Hancock's clothing. Enel just had a long face on, his lips pursed as he did his best to keep a poker face. He could see some beads of sweat on the pirate empress's otherwise pristine face. The other Gorgon sisters in the background also seemed to have a similar reaction to Enel's. IIT was just my stomach. Hancock said, while Enel just sat up on his chair and looked at the other Gorgon sisters, who seemed to believe her just about as much as he did. Sure. Enel said with a raised eyebrow, he then extended one of his earlobes and took out another bottle of wine from his backpack. He started to drink it in that instant, something that managed to weird out the Gorgon sisters. What is the meaning of this though? Do you expect someone like me to travel in something so simplistic? I won't be coming if I don't have a room of my own on the ship. Hancock said while looking at the strange rowboat that Enel was sitting on. Fine, have it your way. Enel tapped the ship underneath him, it instantly started to expand into a small sailboat. It was similar in model to a sloop, but it didn't have any mast. Its golden engines were a bit bigger, and Enel needed to use some white gold to make that happen. The ship now had a deck, where Enel kept his throne, and a room underneath it, where he made a table and a golden bed. Now, the boat looked to be gold mixed with white gold, and his staff turned into more of a walking stick now. The Gorgon sisters were rather surprised by the way the ship changed in front of them. It wasn't a secret that Enel's devil fruit did that though, so they were able to recover quickly enough. That's awesome. Hancock's stomach did have a harder time adjusting to that though. Is this good enough? The bed won't be all that great, as it's just made out of gold. But you have your room now. Enel said as he decided to keep his poker face on and ignore Luffy for now. Yais. This is more fitting for someone like me. She started laughing haughtily again, throwing her head back and doing a few more gymnastic poses. Enel just blinked a few times. Can you please just get on? His tone was starting to sound exasperated to the other Gorgon sisters. Only on one condition. If you are able to stop by Impel down on our way to Marineford. I want to visit someone there. Hancock said as she tilted her head slightly to the side this time. Sure. Just get on already. Enel said as he stared at Hancock with pleading eyes. In the end, the Empress got onto the ship and went directly to her room instantly. Enel decided to completely ignore Luffy's stomach as she passed by him. The other two Gorgon sisters looked at the flying ship depart, they then looked at each other for a bit, before one of them spoke up. He definitely knows. Yup. POV narration Enel lounged on his chair for a few hours, randomly reading a newspaper that he was holding with his earlobes. He wanted Luffy to free the prisoners in Impel Down, he needed some of them to be free, to be more exact. People like Crocodile could prove to be allies in the future, and Ivankov was also someone he thought would be a good ally to have. Ivankov was part of the Revolutionary Army, so him being released from Impel Down was rather important to Enel. He didn't think much about Boa Hancock and how disturbingly bad she was at lying. Well, Luffy was at fault for all of the hiccups, but the fact that Hancock was still trying to cover up for him made it a lot worse. Enel started whistling a bit as he navigated the ship above the clouds, looking into the sunset, it was a beautiful scene. The sun was setting and stars were slowly appearing on the horizon. The world appeared so much larger when sitting above the clouds. Enel's calm was unfortunately disturbed though, as he could hear a pair of high heels make their way up the stairs and towards him. Enel didn't bother to greet her, as he felt that she was one of the more annoying individuals he came across. 
he knew of her distrust in men, and of her hatred for the world government and marines. He knew that she had a rough past, but many escaped slaves had difficult stories, and not all of them were this annoying to talk to. That didn't mean he hated her, he just didn't care to bother associating himself with her. If it weren't for Sengoku's mission, he likely would have never exchanged a word with her. She could have been a useful ally, but she'd end up as his ally anyway if he became friends with Luffy, so it didn't matter in the end. The stunt he was going to pull during the war was definitely going to help him befriend Luffy, but he still needed to think of a way to not make it too painful for the friends he had made as a marine. Some people he cared about, hell, even Sakazuki, the lava-spitting admiral, proved to be trustworthy and helped him when necessary. He and Sakazuki had quite literally been at each other's throats since they had met. But still knew he could trust him to have his back if they were off to fight some pirates. The problem there was that Enel wouldn't be only fighting pirates in his future. He would also be fighting the world government. While he stood there, contemplating his plans, Hancock just rubbed one of her arms and stared at the clouds in the distance. She was stunned by the view, it wasn't every day that she got to see the world from so high up. It was her first time witnessing such a scene actually, so she stood there for a few good seconds. The way the clouds seemed to change their colors, the storm that was raging underneath the ship, the orange horizon and the dotted sky that was promptly filling up with stars. It was a mesmerizing scene. One that very few people in that world had actually seen. The sky people were used to it, as it was just the norm for them, but people that lived under the clouds didn't get to peek above them too often. She wasn't stunned for long though, they didn't call her the Pirate Empress for nothing. She recovered rather quickly and was about to start speaking in her usual haughty tone. Enel managed to open his mouth first though. What do you want, Pirate Empress? Enel asked with a bored tone, not taking his gaze away from the sunset in front of him. Humph, don't try to sound important, Rear Admiral. You are lucky that you get the privilege to transport me to Marinifo, Hancock was going to keep gloating, but Enel just heaved a frustrated sigh and interrupted her. Yeah, yeah. An honor to transport a pirate princess and her baggage to impel down, so that they may not try to do something shady. He just waved his hand dismissively, not really sure what Hancock was attempting to gain from that discussion. Boa Hancock was quick to take a stance though, as she took a step back and prepared to kick Enel out of his chair. Don't even bother. I don't understand who you were expecting to fool. I honestly couldn't care less about what you do, just let me do my job and don't get in my way. Enel's words seemed to calm her down, somehow. At the very least she was weirded out enough to drop her stance. Is this man really a marine? Good question, Hancock. If you were to ask other marines about Enel's temperament, then Sengoku would just say no, Garp would laugh in your face and Akainu would start mumbling curses. Hancock thought for a bit, about what to do. She had left Luffy in her room, and she had come upstairs for a good reason too. What do you want? Enel finally turned his head to her slightly. Making her raise an eyebrow. I see no other reason why you'd speak to me. What do you want? In the end, Hancock sighed. This man. Why is he so difficult to deal with? Most men she'd just be able to turn to stone easily. She could manipulate most of them to do her bidding, as they were usually too stricken with her beauty to ever go against her word. But Enel didn't even seem to care about her. Not only that, despite her beauty, it didn't seem that he could be bothered to pander to her, something that she had been used to seeing most men doing. For some reason, she actually found it profoundly annoying but decided to just get it over with and tell Enel what she needed. I want some food. A lot of food. Hancock said while crossing her arms and narrowing her eyes at Enel. Sure. Enel grabbed his backpack and threw it at her. There was enough food there for three people to last them a few days. Enel knew that Luffy was likely going to eat it in a sitting, so he was prepared to hunt sea kings again. Hancock caught the backpack with an annoyed look while mumbling some unsavory things under her breath. Tell your stomach that we'll get to impel down in a few days. Hancock just scoffed and turned around to leave, not wanting to be in Enel's presence for now. Enel chuckled a bit in his mind as he wondered about what to do next. I wonder if Luffy is gonna approach me during this journey. POV narration in truth, Luffy had wanted to speak to Enel ever since they had found themselves at the small port on Amazon Lily. Luffy had only stopped himself when seeing Enel's marine coat, which made him a bit perplexed. 
not that he could spell out that specific emotion. Didn't think he'd end up as a Marine. If it was any other time, it Luffy would have still approached Enel without any hesitation. But he was now heading to free his brother from the Marines, so that somewhat put a spin on the good old invite him in the pirate crew plan that Luffy had. Although misadvised, Luffy decided to still try and speak with the longer lobed fellow that was steering the golden ship he was on. After all, Luffy wasn't prone to making logical decisions. So he simply waited for Hancock to go to sleep, after which he decided to go out and greet the rear admiral. Enel was not sleeping, merely reading a random newspaper and staring at the clouds around him. Oi, Enel. Luffy shouted as he made his way to the lounging marine. Oh, Luffy. I thought you were trying to hide. Enel said as he raised an eyebrow at his passenger's appearance. Well, hiding is boring. Also, I wanted you to join my crew. Why did you have to go and become a marine? Luffy pointed at Enel as if accusing him of doing something wrong. Enel was rather flabbergasted by that. This kid. He's just as unreasonable as his grandfather. I became a marine cause I wanted to, how about that? Enel said as he slowly stood up, supporting himself on his walking stick, former staff. Well. I'm glad for you. If that's what you wanted to do. Luffy gave Enel an honest smile when speaking this time. Making the rear admiral fall back on his ass. I forgot how this kid handles conversations. I wanted to apologize, actually. You were really polite back on the Sky Islands, and we were kinda rude. Luffy scratched the back of his head, his honest smile not waning for a bit. Enel just smiled at that. Don't sweat it. You probably heard about me from the Shandians, right? The rear admiral asked as he crossed his legs and made another chair in front of him for Luffy to sit down on. Amicham. Your past is pretty cool. How did you become an archaeologist anyway? Luffy sat down and started asking Enel questions with a smile on his face. Well, that is a rather nice story in itself. I remember being a young boy at the time. I simply gained this fascination with a large piece of stone that I had found in my backyard. I ended up staring at it and chiseling it every day for a week, all until I uncovered a small skeleton inside it. It was at that time that I decided to study more about old stuff. Luffy and Enel ended up speaking for a few hours, the two of them shared stories as if around a campfire, all until the sun could be seen rising on the horizon. Luffy's eyes shined as he stared at the sunrise, Enel simply smiled when seeing his reaction, he was already used to the sight, but he would never stop appreciating a good sunrise from above the clouds. Luffy was entranced for a bit, and Enel just sighed as he remembered just how childish the teen in front of him could be. That wasn't an entirely bad thing though. If anything, the world could use a few more people like Luffy. In the end, Luffy ended up going back downstairs and trying to sleep a bit more. The rest of the journey to Impel Down was rather uneventful. Enel himself made no effort to speak much to either Luffy or Hancock in the rest of the journey, he just let the two of them do whatever they wanted. The pirate empress did sometimes walk towards the deck but stopped halfway usually. Enel was a bit confused by that, but he chose not to bother. In truth, Boa Hancock simply wanted to annoy Enel a bit more, as she found him especially strange. She also wanted to prove to herself that he was nothing more than just another lustful ape, like all men besides her Luffy were. She usually lost the spring in her step midway though, as she remembered that they were in Madeir, in the middle of the calm belt. Annoying Enel at that stage was likely not the best idea. She wasn't worried for herself, she was confident in her ability to turn Enel to stone if something happened. But she was worried for Luffy, so she decided to refrain from annoying the rear admiral for now. Enel ended up killing another sea king and getting meat from it, as Boa Hancock's appetite seemed to be extremely insatiable. He continued that way until impelled down, where he didn't even bother to enter and greet the jailer, and simply waited outside for Hancock to come back. He wanted to scout out the place at first but didn't really want to get in the way of the impelled down great prison escape that was about to happen. At least that was what he had planned to do, but the head warden seemed to have other ideas, as he came to the boat and greet him. Rear Admiral Enel. A pleasant surprise to see you here. Magellan seemed to be extremely friendly towards his fellow marine, with no trace of his usual cold and ruthless attitude that he had toward pirates. Chief Warden Magellan. I wasn't expecting to see you on my short visit here. 
Enel stepped down from his ship and started speaking with the man, he looked the exact same as in the original, so Enel started wondering if some of the people in that world even had a change of clothes. Well, it is my prison. Jajajajaha, Magellan started laughing out loud for a bit, Enel simply sighed as he wondered why people in One Piece had such odd laughter. I guess, but I wasn't planning on entering. Boa Hancock seemed adamant about visiting this place before going to Marineford. Enel said as he yawned a bit. He wasn't going to be selling out Luffy anytime soon. He wanted the straw hat wearing pirate to appear at Marineford. It's a shame that we have to listen to pirates to this extent. I wish the warlord system simply disappeared at times. Magellan simply shook his head for a bit. It is needed currently, they do help deter quite a few pirates from popping up. If it warms your heart in any way, I doubt they will be kept for long after the war. Enel twirled his earlobes a bit as he spoke with confidence. And why is that? I didn't hear any news from headquarters regarding that. Magellan just raised an eyebrow in confusion. Two warlords have already been outed as scum. Crocodile tried to enslave a kingdom, Doflamingo actually did it. The only reason the warlords are still on is due to this upcoming war. Magellan seemed to finally understand Enel's point, and his mood instantly seemed to turn for the better. That's amazing. I can't wait to see them rot in my prison. Anyway, do you want a tour of the place? I can take you down to the lower levels without any issue. It was clear that Magellan took pride in his jail, and he wanted to show Enel around to the lowest levels. Enel looked at his golden boat, sitting on the wooden deck, then looked at the prison entrance. Oh hell, who knows how long Hancock will take. I've always wanted to see this place from the inside. It's going to be so much better if I eventually need to break into it myself. Sure. Let's go. The two of them started heading for the first level almost instantly, with Magellan explaining the prison's defenses and alarm systems to Enel. Magellan hadn't really told Enel, assuming there was no need to. The rear admiral had become something akin to a legend among the marines. The recording of his fight was short-lived, but rumors still spread out among the marines. A rear admiral strong enough to take out a warlord effortlessly. Someone that had both a Kainu, the most ruthless admiral, and Garp, the legendary marine hero, vouch for him. It was pretty clear that Enel wasn't your usual marine recruit from his rank. But it was now also extremely clear that Enel wasn't exactly your usual rear admiral either. Among them, he was now called the unranked admiral. No one, not even a Kainu, did anything to stop these rumors from spreading or becoming as exaggerated as they had become. Magellan managed to make it a few steps into the third floor before his stomach started grumbling and he seemed to rush in a general direction at the greatest speed he could muster. Sorry. This is urgent. Enel just stared at Magellan's retreating back for a few seconds. In the end, Enel decided to follow Magellan all the way down to the fourth floor, where the chief warden's office could be found. Enel just saw Magellan rush into the bathroom and lock the door instantly. He stared at the door for a bit as he wondered whether or not to go look for Ivankov. I'm really sorry about this, Rear Admiral Enel. A blonde, well-dressed woman was the one to address Enel this time. It was none other than Domino, the blonde sunglass-wearing woman that had been responsible for Hancock's body search. Also, the one that had royally screwed it up. She was wearing a rather odd one-piece, hee-hee, uniform, the skirt looked to be barely long enough to cover her ass. Magellan appears preoccupied, no need to apologize. Enel said as he scratched the back of his head with his staff. The woman had likely seen Enel and Magellan rush towards Magellan's office, only for the chief warden to enter the toilet and leave Enel, his guest, unattended. Sorry. Enel heard from the toilet. Domino. Please show Enel around in my stead. Magellan's plea was only responded with a nod. Domino huffed once, some steam leaving her nose as she raised her sunglasses with one of her gloved hands. Of course head warden. I shall take on this task. Her determination was rather plain to see, but Enel was really not interested. I'll take what I can get. She should know just as much about the prison anyway. Sure, let's get going. Enel turned around and started walking off, Domino following him without any hesitation. POV narration Enel and Domino traveled all the way down to the lowest level rather quickly. Enel was already somewhat familiar with the levels thankfully. But he could only vaguely remember them at first. However, 
he wanted to have some understanding of Impel Down, as he wanted to keep it as a plan B. If he failed to befriend enough powerful pirates and the revolutionary army, then he'd just free the entirety of Impel Down and create a fleet powerful enough to stand on its own. Of course, Enel planned to keep Blackbeard's associates alive for that plan, as they were all rather useful for that plan B. He would make sure they were captured again and sent back to Impel Down. Enel remembered Buggy becoming an emperor, he couldn't quite remember the circumstances of how that had happened, but he knew that it was likely also thanks to the Impel Down prisoners that he had scammed into believing in him. Enel could do what Buggy did. But he'd actually have the strength to back up his words if a fight were to break out. Enel still wasn't sure how Buggy had managed to rule his crew so efficiently, but he decided not to think about it too much. If anything, Buggy could also become a powerful ally in the future, if the stars aligned. Domino was confident in herself as she showed the unranked admiral all over the prison, explaining everything from the soldiers defending each level to the way they handled any possible breakouts. Domino seemed extremely confident in the prison's defense systems. To the point where she even seemed prideful. Enel just whistled a bit, as he wondered how the world had aligned itself for Luffy to be able to escape with so many prisoners. It was a wonder, but Enel decided not to think about it too much, he'd leave Luffy to it. The last level, however, was where things got a bit more interesting. Enel could feel quite a few prisoners locked up inside it. It was rather normal compared to all of the contrived methods of punishment that the other levels had. There was no punishment in the last level, it was just a regular jail, made out of sea stone mostly. It was a prison that housed the most powerful pirates, unlike the last level, the Freezing Hell, which only housed pirates with bounties of over 100 million. In truth, the Eternal Hell housed the most dangerous pirates only. The type that could endanger entire kingdoms with their presence. Doflamingo would have ended up somewhere in there, had Enel not derailed the story the way he did. The jail was a lot larger than Enel had thought it would be though. Which made quite a bit of sense, there were hundreds of pirates in that last level, all of which powerful and devious in their own right. Enel could feel members of the Blackbeard Pirates with his observation hockey, still shackled and sitting down on the cold floor. Although there was no physical torture in the last level of Impel Down, it was made to look extremely bland. It was created to drive the residents crazy. In truth, it didn't do much, as the vast majority of people that reached that level were already insane. Enel could see Hancock walking in front of him, she was being led by Hannibal, the current vice warden. Enel chuckled a bit as he noticed that she had been cuffed. He forgot just how little the warlords were trusted. They were supposedly allies, but they were still being treated as pirates. That treatment might have been accurate though. Enel could remember Hancock turning many marines to stone a long time before the warlords were disbanded. If the warlords themselves didn't see the marines or world government as allies, then why would the other party bother? Hancock heard Enel chuckle, she turned around and narrowed her eyes at the rear admiral. She simply scoffed and turned around. And why exactly are you following me? She asked in her usual haughty tone, making Domino blush a bit. I was just sightseeing, I wouldn't be looking at you if I had any other choice. Unfortunately, there isn't anything else down here. Enel said as he studied the young pirate empress with a bored gaze. Humph. She once again scoffed and turned around. It seemed that not even seastone cuffs were able to suppress her arrogance, which made Enel smile a bit in amusement. Hurry up and do what you have to do. We need to get to Marineford sometime this week. Enel said as he ignored whatever the prisoners around him were sputtering out. He could hear literal howls as Hancock walked by the cells, making him feel a bit weirded out. Being beautiful sure is tough. Good thing I never have to worry about that. Enel pondered to himself as he walked up near Hancock, walking slightly behind her, his cape attracting quite a few laughs from the prisoners. A rear admiral. Wahaha. What's a shrimp like him doing here? The dogs barked pretty loudly, making Hannibal whip the loudest one to make an example out of him. Sorry about that, rear admiral Enel. Prisoners down here probably have no idea who you are, so things like these can happen. Hannibal said as he bowed his head slightly. Enel simply shook his head. Couldn't care less. Hancock was rather satisfied to hear that Enel was being ridiculed though, at least Enel could tell that much from her melodic laughter. Damn. What a bitch. 
Enel thought to himself, as he released a wave of conqueror's hockey, sweeping over all of the cells nearby and knocking out everyone that had been mocking him. A deadly silence descended upon the prison, as the stronger pirates weren't the types to badmouth someone with conqueror's hockey. Hancock also turned around again when the wave of hockey washed over her. It startled her slightly, as Enel didn't even seem remotely serious, yet he was able to knock out people on the sixth level of Impel Down. Such a feat would have been difficult for most, but Enel seemed completely fine. Enel raised an eyebrow though. For some reason, he felt a bit drained from using his conqueror's hockey. This was something he had also experienced during his training, but he assumed it was just due to the fact that he was overusing it. In truth, after testing it a few times, the more Enel used Conqueror's Hockey, the less he could use it. He thought it was going to be alright after resting a bit after his month-long training, he had been using it quite a bit when training. But it seemed that the resting time had changed nothing at all. The willpower itself was getting stronger the more he used it, but it was as if Enel's reserves were limited, and either replenishing really slowly or not at all. Enel simply clenched his fist and continued to walk forward, deciding to not use Conqueror's anymore until he looked further into the issue. Enel knew that it was time for Hancock to speak to Ace, so he beckoned Hannibal to whip a random prisoner, while Domino stayed there to cheer on him, those were the actual instructions Enel gave her. Hancock went ahead and spoke with Ace, Enel didn't greet Ace during that time, but Ace's cellmate managed to catch his attention. Hmm. A rear admiral that possesses the will of a conqueror. Something isn't right here. The fishman looked up at Enel with narrowed eyes. Enel simply tilted his head, his earlobes swaying a bit as he looked at the imprisoned warlord. Same could be said about someone of your strength letting themselves get captured. I get not agreeing to orders, but actually being imprisoned. Enel said as he also narrowed his eyes. A fishman pirate like Jimbei would always be difficult to catch. In water, he was simply impossible to catch. He'd be able to escape even if an admiral showed up as long as he dived deep enough underwater, and the marines wouldn't be able to do anything. Jinbei and Enel stared at one another for a bit, at least until they both heard steps going in another direction. Hancock had finished telling Ace that Luffy was coming to save him, which gained its own set of concerned hushed whispers from Ace. The pirate empress then left the prison, the vice warden following after her like a little dog. Welp. See you at the war folks. Enel told both Jimbei, who raised an eyebrow, and Ace, who didn't pay attention, and was still thinking about his brother putting himself in danger to rescue him. Domino. Please make sure that Hancock waits for me at the docks. I will be out soon. Enel said as he turned around and walked in the opposite direction of the exit. Domino had wanted to protest and follow Enel further in but was dissuaded by his cold gaze, so she turned around and ran after Hannibal. Enel sighed as he was finally left alone. He walked all the way over to Shiryu, who had been the head jailer until recently. He was imprisoned for repeatedly slaughtering prisoners, and he didn't seem to care too much. The man was simply smoking his cigar, sitting down cross-legged as he didn't even bother wearing prisoner garb, still wearing his jailer uniform. To what do I owe the honor? Unranked Admiral. Shiryu asked, his eyes hidden by his cap as Enel stared at him with cold eyes. Ho. Oh. Didn't think my reputation made it down here. I guess Magellan keeps you posted on those things. Enel said as he shook his head a bit. I'm not here for that though. You will soon be presented with a choice, Shiryu. I want you to know, that if you accept it, you are the only one I won't spare. Enel didn't bother to elaborate, only turning around and leaving behind a confused Shiryu. What the hell was that about? The former head jailer asked himself as he wiped some sweat from his brow. And with that, Enel's business at Impel Down had concluded. POV narration Enel didn't spend more time in the lower levels of Impel Down after giving Shiryu that warning. It was true that Enel planned to take a part of Blackbeard's crew if things didn't work out. But Shiryu and Blackbeard were the two people that Enel planned to kill. Blackbeard's death was needed for Enel's plan to work out, and Shiryu was a person with a track record of betraying authority, someone that Enel knew he wouldn't be able to lead. All of the pirates in Blackbeard's future crew were sadistic and vile, but Shiryu was especially so, as he also happened to be an actual psychopath. Enel had pondered his future options many times, and he found himself unable to relate to or associate with people like Shiryu. 
he didn't care if the people he hung around were villains, or if they were particularly immoral. As long as he could use them, then it was all equaled out in the end. However, Enel simply didn't know if he could reliably use someone like Shiryu. And since Shiryu was also not an enjoyable company, Enel had no reason to even attempt to keep him around. Inside, he hoped that the former head jailer would take his advice to heart and not join up with Blackbeard. Blackbeard was a tricky person, so Enel figured he'd probably find a way to escape impelled down even without Shiryu's help. But, in the end, it wouldn't matter either way. Both of them would simply become just two more corpses littering the grounds of Marineford during the upcoming Summit War. At least Enel was able to scout out the prison a bit. He thankfully also didn't need to care about having an escape plan after leaving the prison, as the gates of justice couldn't hold him back in any way. Enel could easily fly over them, or destroy them if it was truly needed. The rear admiral walked all the way back to his ship, not trying to look for Luffy and just letting the future play out as it was bound to. He didn't bother telling Magellan of his departure either, as he didn't want to speak to a toilet door. Hancock was already waiting for him at the docks, she looked at him with annoyance, as she had an angry scowl on her face when seeing him. You sure took your time, mister we need to get to Marineford this week, she said while tilting her head backwards again. Enel didn't bother gratifying her childish jab with a response. He simple clapped his hands and rebuilt his boat, including his usual beach chair slash throne. Hancock simply walked inside and entered her room below the deck, and Enel just did his own thing, grabbing a newspaper with his earlobes and randomly skimming through it while whistling. The rest of the journey should have gone rather quietly, or at least that was what Enel hoped. But Hancock seemed to have other things on her mind. Typical male. Lazing around all day and reading newspapers. Hancock stood by Enel's beach chair and started nagging him. What do you want me to do? Speak to you. Not horribly interested in that. Enel decided to answer, mostly out of boredom. They were currently a day away from Marineford, so he had some time left to waste with her. Humph, why would I care what you are doing? Hancock once again raised her chin up high as she seemed to think that she was somehow winning an argument. Then why the fuck are we having this conversation? Enel's cold and frustrated response was a bit different from what she was expecting though. The pirate empress was used to men always doing whatever they could to appeal to her, even marines were the same. But Enel seemed to disregard her for sport. There was no appreciation to be found in his gaze as he stared at her, just annoyance. This behavior was what made Hancock want to talk more to Enel. But she wasn't exactly prone to making conversations, so they were stuck on her nagging him and him telling her to fuck off repeatedly. This went on for a bit until Enel started outright ignoring her. This only further exasperated problems, as Hancock made it her hourly mission to make fun of something about Enel. What's with the earlobes? Are you some kind of religious freak? What a tacky suit, I hope you aren't expecting to impress anyone with that. What's with all of this gold? Showing off your wealth? Are you trying to compensate for something? Why is your stupid coat so stained? I guess there is no honor among marines after all. Most of her jabs were answered by Enel turning a page to his newspaper. By the time they reached Marineford, Enel had read over the same newspaper well over sixteen times, just so that he could efficiently ignore Hancock. Though he could still hear her. Maybe I should just throw her in the sea. He had had that thought quite a few times, but at least he had managed to control himself till the end. Enel landed in the middle of Marineford, and started heading directly to Sengoku's office. Hancock followed suit, doing her best to get a response out of Enel. It was an odd sight for outsiders, the woman considered the most beautiful in the world dragging behind a rear admiral and being obviously ignored at every step of the way. Many of the marines tried to approach her, only to be turned to stone as she didn't like men getting close to her. Although. Now that she also took a second to look at the situation a bit, she was technically the one pursuing Enel constantly. That thought made her stop in her tracks as if petrified by her own devil fruit. Enel also stopped, he turned around and waited for her to start walking again. He didn't know if she had any idea where Sengoku's office was, so he had to lead her there at least. Get moving, Sengoku called for you, Enel said as he started walking slowly, waiting for the woman behind him to snap out of her daydreams. After noticing that she was simply not budging, Enel simply walked over to her, grabbed her wrist and started dragging her off. This did manage to break the empress out of her stupor. 
She almost instantly tried to turn Enel to stone, only for her ability to fail. What? Why isn't my marrow marrow beam not working on him? Unfortunately for her, Enel was well past the age where he let his hormones control his thoughts. Although Hancock's appearance was beautiful, he had always been the type that would appreciate beauty, not lust after it. In the end, Hancock let herself be led by the wrist all the way to Sengoku's office, while her thoughts were all over the place and she tried to wrap her head around the man that was dragging her around. She had tried to use her marrow marrow beam on Enel a few times. Enel just ignored the pink hearts that sometimes passed by his head, although he was getting a bit frustrated with them. If anything, one wouldn't be able to tell that Enel was dragging the most beautiful woman if one looked only at his face. He looked more like he was dragging around a sack of potatoes. Hancock simply gulped, she looked up at Enel, who easily towered over her, and she finally took her arm back. Enel didn't bother to hold her tightly, she could have broken off at any point, she had just been too flabbergasted to do that though. Never touch me again. Hancock shouted, making Enel just shrug as he opened Sengoku's door, and proceeded to continue ignoring the Empress. Hancock simply narrowed her eyes as she thought to herself. Why is someone like him? Just as pure as my Luffy. A rather great misconception. Luffy was simply ignorant when it came to women, while Enel was simply uncaring. But the both of them did have something in common, both of them had greater concerns. Luffy was busy with his dream of becoming the Pirate King, and currently rescuing his brother. Enel was busy with his own problems, as well as his plan of uncovering the world's secrets. Both of them were driven, but only Luffy could be called somewhat pure. Enel was rather the opposite. His age brought him experience. Hancock had no way of knowing that though, she was simply torn in her own little world. In the end, she walked into Sengoku's office with a cold gaze, and choose to not think about Enel anymore. He's just a marine anyway. POV narration Sengoku and Garp had been expecting Enel's arrival for a while now. Sengoku especially had prepared quite a few questions to ask Enel. Things like, why do you have conqueror's hockey? That was by far the most passive-aggressive one of his questions. The rest were mostly about Enel's well-being and the way his mission had gone. Sengoku was rather concerned due to the fact that Enel really seemed to have something against directly contacting him. The ironic thing was that Enel had only contacted him once, and Sengoku hadn't even been there to respond to it. Sakazuki had answered it, and the mess that Sengoku was somehow still cleaning up ensued. In truth, all of the officials that saw the recording of Enel's battle with Doflamingo were shocked. All but two people. Akainu and Garp simply nodded, saying that was somewhat within their expectations. The only thing that surprised them was the clash of conquerors. Other than that, they expected Enel to just instantly kill Doflamingo. Akainu specifically complained that Enel had somewhat dragged that fight a bit, as he had a few chances to catch Doflamingo with his sea stone staff before the clash of conquerors even happened. In truth, Akainu was rather pleased with Enel's handiwork. So pleased that he basically told both the Cypher Pole and the Five Elders to fuck off their faces when they had stated their plans to recruit Enel. It was the first time Sengoku had seen Akainu actively disrespect government officials. Thankfully nothing came out of it, but that stunt made the world government forget about turning Enel into an agent. At least openly. The secret mission of the two CP0 agents that Enel had mushed into the ground was to extend an invitation to Enel. Which they were a bit too scared to complete. Not that they could have, Enel was well away from Dress Rosa by the time the agents woke up after Enel's beating. In the end, the mission has simply been titled a failure, but the CP0 agents were at least able to confiscate the recording of Enel's fight and subsequently silence the journalist that had filmed it. This even managed to somewhat sour the already shitty relationship they had with Big News Morgan though, as the man they silenced was apparently employed by Morgan. Overall, the mission was a complete failure. The world government still secretly started pestering Sengoku about making Enel a CP0 agent, as two spots had conveniently opened up very recently. This only added to Sengoku's already heavy workload. Sengoku didn't even have the time to worry about Big Mom starting a war, he was busy planning another war. It was an extremely stressful situation. And Garp didn't make it a whole lot better. The old man seemed to get more anxious and stressed the closer the day of the execution got. Sengoku wasn't exactly sure why, so he simply planned Garp to be a less involved party in the upcoming war. 
Sengoku was sorting through some files when Enel walked into his office, which he had been expecting, as he was informed of Enel's arrival on Marineford. Enel. Why do you never call me? That was the very first thing that Sengoku shouted as he slapped his desk with both of his hands. In doing that, he had managed to scare his pet pigeon and goat away. Jeez. Enel simply cleaned out one of his ears with his pinky, as he wondered how to speak his way out of that one. Surprisingly, Garp wasn't there to bail him out. The old man was likely off somewhere stressing himself about Ace's execution. Jeez. Is that all I get? You have a few reports to hand in, Enel. Sengoku said as he angrily slammed his fist on the table. He couldn't really intimidate Enel though. Fine, calm down, your hair will get white. This comment managed to completely deflate Sengoku, as he quickly took out a mirror and checked his afro for white hairs. I'll write up the reports as soon as I get to my room. Enel said as he took his usual place on the couch. At this point, Hancock also entered the room, she glared at Enel hatefully, making the rear admiral just raise an eyebrow in confusion. Fleet Admiral Sengoku. I came at your request, I assume this is related to recent news. In the end, Hancock decided to not look at Enel anymore. Sengoku's gaze turned cold at the sight of the pirate empress, the fleet admiral wasn't all that excited to meet up with the warlords after the recent mess they had been causing. Crocodile and Doflamingo enslaved kingdoms, one more successfully than the other, and Jimbei refused to answer to their calls, which led to him being apprehended and thrown in impelled down. Really, the past few months hadn't been great for public perception of the warlord program. Yes, Boa Hancock. As expected, a war is soon to break out, I want all of the remaining warlords present and participating in it. Sengoku got straight to the point, he had no reason to act friendly towards a pirate, much like Enel, he was also an older man, so he wasn't about to treat her differently due to her beauty. Humph, understood. I assume I'm at least getting a room until the war starts. Hancock didn't lose her arrogance even in front of Sengoku, which made Enel slightly impressed. Of course. I'll leave Enel to that since he was in charge of bringing you here in the first place, Sengoku said with a straight face, somewhat ignoring the pirate empress's haughty demeanor. The fleet admiral and Hancock both heard a loud groan coming from the couch, one that they both decided to ignore for now. Sengoku mentioned a few more things about the way the war was going to go, and then sent her outside the room for a bit, as he wanted to have a conversation with Enel for now. Dot. Enel stared at his superior for a bit, before finally sighing and saying, I think I understand what this is about. I'm sure you do. I know you aren't stupid enough to think I wouldn't point out the elephant in the room. Sengoku slowly got up from his chair and sat down on the couch beside Enel. Conqueror's hockey. Not exactly what you'd commonly find among the marines. The only person to have developed conquerors among them is me. Why did you keep your secret? Sengoku was one of the few people to have mastery over all three types of hockey. At least that was what he had believed until recently. A marine with conqueror's hockey was extremely uncommon, as that type of hockey was extremely rare in itself. Usually, people that had it were always ambitious, which led to them not becoming marines most of the time. I'll be frank with you, Sengoku. I had no clue I had conqueror's hockey until fighting Doflamingo. Sengoku just raised an eyebrow as he pondered that for a bit. I honestly just felt him use it, thought it wasn't that big of a deal, so I figured I should be able to use it too. Lo and behold, I was. Sengoku ended up sighing at that. I guess it does have an odd way of awakening most of the time. Fine, I believe you, for now, Sengoku said as he crossed his arms a bit. Still, that stunt you pulled could have been a lot more dangerous if a Kainu and Garp didn't have your back. Well, Garp became preoccupied with other things, so only a Kainu actually spoke to the five elders. Enel raised an eyebrow, he had somewhat expected Garp to be a bit out of whack, but he didn't expect the old man to forget about him like that. Makes sense. Ace is a lot more important to him than I am. Good old Akainu, huh? I'm guessing he lost some favor with the world government over that. Enel put his hand in between the couch cushions and took out one of Garp's emergency rice cracker packets. Sengoku just stared at him, before deciding to ignore that in order to spare his own sanity, and continued to talk. Not as much as we had expected apparently. The world government had already abandoned Doflamingo's family. 
still, celestial dragons will always be a sore spot for them, former or not. Akainu helped you dodge a bullet there. Enel just ended up shrugging as he started eating rice crackers, loudly munching on them. Anyways, I'm glad you are back. I expect your reports regarding your mission after the war. You have two days to prepare for it. The Whitebeard Pirates are powerful, and running away isn't an option here. Sengoku said as he started walking back to his desk. Yeah. No turning back now. See ya on the field, Sengoku. Enel also got up and started walking out of the room, leaving his superior to handle his paperwork. The second he exited the room his face fell, as he remembered something. Finally done. Good, lead me to my chambers. It better have a good view, oh, and I don't wish to be bothered until the war starts. Hancock was still there, waiting for him. Dot. Enel started at the ceiling for a bit. Contemplating his life as he really hoped to actually get some calm before the upcoming storm. POV narration The days passed rather quickly for Enel. Not as quickly as he had initially hoped, as the only room he could find for Hancock happened to be near his, so this led to the pirate emperor spending some time in Enel's room to try and annoy him, get a rise out of him, basically. This usually led to Enel kicking her out, rather forcefully. Either through the window or the door. Most of the marines nearby were rather weirded out by the fact that the most beautiful woman in the world was constantly getting kicked out of the room of a rear admiral. Even if that rear admiral was actually the unranked admiral. This was all fun and games, up until Hina also returned to base, and the Commodore was a bit less amused by the situation. Enel ended up assuring her that Hancock was just a general annoyance. This pleased Hina quite a bit, and annoyed Hancock even further. Sengoku passed by Enel's room one day, only to hear loud arguments between two women. Coming from his room. Ah, to be young again. The fleet admiral didn't have the time to stop and listen to what was being said though. If he did he'd be less proud of Enel's accomplishments. The argument was mainly Hancock calling Enel a lazy slob, Hina being unable to defend him, and ending up just calling the pirate empress an arrogant bitch. Eventually, Enel kicked both of them out and stopped using his room altogether. Deciding he'd much rather sleep on the top of Marineford, straight on the rooftop of the main building. And that was also how he ended up running into Garp, who was also sitting on the edge of the roof, looking at Marineford with a complex gaze. Enel sighed a bit, as he remembered the old man's tears from the show. Ace's execution was approaching, and he knew that it was weighing down on the old vice admiral. Enel sat down right beside the old man, looking at the large marine base with a complex gaze of his own. Enel. Garp. Their greeting was a lot less cheerful than it had usually been, the two of them were both being eaten by their own worries. Garp was worried about betraying the marines, as they were also his family. He was also worried of betraying his grandson, betraying the promise he had made to G.O.L.D. Roger, his old friend. There was simply no good choice for him to make. Enel was in a similar situation. He was stuck. He had made a mistake and had gotten too attached to the marines. He had befriended even the likes of Akainu. Garp and Sengoku had become people he couldn't help but care about too. Now, in a day, the time for him to carry out his plans and leave the marines was going to come into effect. Enel knew that he couldn't continue staying in the marines. Even if not all Marines were subservient to the world government, the Marines as an organization were still controlled by the Five Elders. He knew that if he did remain in the Marines, he'd be wasting his chance at befriending the remainder of the White Beard Pirates, and they were going to be a large part of his fighting force in the future. He was stuck, between a rock and a hard place. On one hand, he could strive to become stronger and stronger, to no longer need the support of others. But that thought was foolish. For all of his strength and speed, he knew that the world hid a lot more than was shown in the show. The world government most definitely held an ancient weapon at their disposal. The five elders themselves were most likely at the level of Yonko commanders themselves, otherwise, they wouldn't have been called the ruling authority of the world. There was also Shanks and his mysterious motives. The Yonko that, for some reason, planned to wait for Luffy to sound the drums of liberation, before preparing to head over to Raftel. Too many complete unknowns were at play. To add yet another complication to the pile, there was also Enel's conqueror's hockey, which was most likely somehow related to his soul. Enel simply had too much to bargain if he tried to go at it alone. 
The Marines were bound to help him too, but the second he started trying to achieve his goal of uncovering the truth, the Marines would turn on him. Even if he had made friends with some of them, he knew that they would all still answer to the world's government orders to hunt him down. What would you do? If you were stuck at a crossroads. Garp started speaking, the old man's voice sounded tired and weary. If on one side stood your family, people you cherished and love, people you would give your life to. And on the other stood your duty, your responsibility to the world, and to the friends you've made across decades. Enel smiled a bit when hearing that question. Such an oddly specific conundrum you've presented me with. Garp gave Enel a hollow laugh at that jab, but it didn't last long, as he let Enel continue. Sometimes, in life, there is simply no good choice. Sometimes, it feels better to not choose at all. But that isn't an option, if we stop moving, then we disappoint everyone. Enel said as he looked at his golden gauntlets with a smile. When you stop to think about it. Even if you don't do anything, life will force a choice onto you, you will go down either path regardless of your wishes. Garp looked down at his own hands, the fists that had given him the fame and reputation that he held right now. He brought his arm down on the roof, breaking off a tile and crushing it in his palm. I say. It's better to make that choice, while you have the time to. Enel's words seemed to resonate with Garp, but the old man was still undecided. You're wiser than you look. I guess calling you boy might not be that accurate. Heh, I am still thirty-seven currently, at least this body is. I may not be an old man, I am, but I didn't sleep through life until now. Enel clutched at the tiles underneath him, the roof creaked a bit, as both old men seemed to not care about injuring it. Is nothing. I guess you are still a brat after all. Garp's hollow smile turned genuine for a second, as he picked up another tile to crush in his hand. I will always be young for a fossil like you. Enel said as he crossed his legs. He was currently wearing his training clothes and no shoes, the ones that the old Enel used to wear, just with less lively colored pants. Watch your mouth brat. Otherwise, I'll show you what these old bones can still do. Garp flexed one of his arms, as he looked at Enel with renewed energy. Hee <laughs> hee. Glad to see you're back. Enel said as he kept staring at Marineford streets in the distance. Can't stay brooding all day. I'm heading to my room, gotta get some sleep before the big war. Enel had managed to somewhat cheer up Garp, but the old man was still not sure how to proceed. Still, Garp got up and prepared to leave. Garp. One last thing. The old man turned around, just as he was about to jump off. Whatever happens tomorrow. I will make sure to protect Ace and Luffy. Garp's eyes widened at that claim. What are you talking about? Enel could sense Garp clench his fists. Don't stress yourself too much. Luffy, your grandson, really has a knack for making friends. He will definitely appear tomorrow. And I won't let him die. Enel's cold gaze peered into the clouds, Garp gritted his teeth, not knowing how to respond to that. I don't, don't bother trying to dissuade me. I'll only interfere if it's truly needed. But I won't stand by as my friend dies. Enel's resolute words seemed to make Garp a bit conflicted. Fine. But be careful. If you do try something, you will become a target for everyone. I won't be able to help you. Heh, who needs your help? Go to sleep, you fossil. Garp grinned a bit at that. After that, the old man didn't hang around any longer, jumping off to his room, leaving only Enel to stare at the working marines in the distance. Many preparations were being made for the war. A lot of people are about to lose their lives. I hope all of this is worth it, Sengoku. Enel knew what he had to do, there was no need to keep brooding around either. He decided that it was time for him to get some shut-eye too. He didn't bother going back to his room though, too many visitors and too much sound for his liking. He simply used his staff as a cushion and dozed off. When I wake up, Ace will already be on that platform. Although it was only a night away, the war had already begun. Enel could feel it, the rumbling in the sky, the world itself was concerned for what was to come. But, despite that, Enel was calm. As he knew that he could take on whatever storm was approaching. POV narration by the time Enel woke up, it was about how he had expected. The platform was up, Ace was sitting on it, and the admirals were all present, all three of them sitting in their chairs and waiting for the upcoming show. 
Sengoku and Garp were both on the platform. Sengoku seemed confident in himself, while Garp still seemed uncertain, speaking to Ace. Enel could feel the fear in the Marines below. But the fear was overshadowed by the pride they were feeling as Marines. They were about to go against the strongest pirate crew that currently existed. Not just a pirate crew, but Whitebeard's pirate fleet. Everyone present knew that the war they were going to be part of was going to go down in history as a large event. The execution itself was being televised all over the world, wherever possible. Everyone was bound to witness it, the execution of G.O.L.D. Roger's last living blood relative. Enel simply stood up, went to his room and got changed into his usual attire, also putting on his coat for one last time. I really shouldn't have used this as a napkin whenever convenient. Enel stared at his coat for a bit, at least most of the stains were gone after a deep cleaning. Enel first visited the two old men standing on the platform, Sengoku was currently giving his speech, so Enel didn't interrupt him. Plenty of people noticed him just jump there, but no one said anything, as he was obviously a marine. Some considered his actions rude, but no one questioned his presence when they realized who he was. The unranked admiral had all the right to be up there. Enel stood beside Garp for a bit, looking at the gathered army of marines below. So. Have you managed to get any sleep? Enel asked as he turned his head to Garp, the old man just shrugged a bit. Barely. But I'll be fine. Garp clenched his fists, he kept his gaze forwards, seemingly afraid to glance at Ace who was right beside the two of them. Enel didn't seem to have that same fear. The rear admiral crouched down near Ace, still looking at the crowd as he sighed a bit. Such a mess. Ace was rather surprised to hear Enel speak to him. But they had met during his short stay at Impel Down, and Enel seemed to already know about Luffy trying to break him out. I didn't choose this. Ace still didn't really consider Enel an ally. If anything, he didn't like the fact that Enel assisted Luffy, who was putting himself in danger for him, as the older brother, he felt that the situation should have been reversed. Hey, we don't often get to choose, do we? Still, in your case, this war is going to get a lot of people killed. Enel twirled one of his earlobes as he wondered about his next actions. Ace just looked down, gritting his teeth as he cursed himself inwardly. No one would blame you for this though. The Marines are starting a war this time. As for who's going to finish it, that still remains up for debate. Enel slowly got up, deciding to look for some other people to talk to. The Whitebeard Pirates were going to make an appearance soon, so Enel knew that he didn't have much time left. He landed right underneath the execution platform, right behind the chairs that the admirals were sitting on. Akainu. Fancy seeing you here. From the side, he tapped Akainu on the shoulder, as he leaned on the chair with a grin on his face. The admiral simply gazed at Enel for a bit. You sure took your time. Akainu said as he rubbed the bridge of his nose a bit. Can't help it. I hadn't slept in a few days. Probably won't sleep for a few more after this. Akainu merely scowled at that statement. Oh. And who is this? A lazy voice could be heard from the side. It belonged to none other than Borsalino or Kazaru. The tall slash lanky, yellow costume wearing admiral. Enel smirked a bit as he remembered a bit more about each admiral. I think it's pretty obvious. Rear Admiral Enel, right? I heard a lot about you. Akiji, the white costume wearing, Ice Admiral, seemed to already know who Enel was. I guess we haven't been formally introduced though. A pleasure to meet you too, Admiral Kazaru and Admiral Akiji. Akiji just nodded, while Kazara let off another board yawn. The hell. Why are you never this polite with me? Akainu was quick to turn his head to Enel though, taking the matter rather seriously. Hey, nothing bad with trying to make a good first impression. Enel simply cleaned out his ear as he tapped Akainu on the shoulder with his earlobe. Anyway, I'm off, see you three on the flip side. With that, Enel simply used Soru and appeared in between the other marines below. He spotted Hina in the crowd rather easily with his observation hockey. So he walked all the way to her and wrapped one of his earlobes around her arm. Hina was startled at first, but she smiled when seeing that it was just Enel. Enel. You scared Hina. She said as she pouted a bit, still, her smile was hard to hide. That was the whole point. Anyway, didn't come here for that. 
Enel said as he gave her a lazy smile of his own. Hina raised an eyebrow, she hoped Enel would help lessen the tense atmosphere she found herself in, but the usually cheerful rear admiral was currently being rather serious with her. Whatever happens next. I want you to take care of yourself, okay? No stupid hero stuff, the world has enough of those types to go around. Enel tilted his head a bit, not breaking his gaze from Hina's for one second, just to make sure she got the message. In the end, Hina just nodded. Don't worry, Hina can take care of herself. Hina should be telling you that. You always jump from problem to problem. Hina crossed her arms as she didn't bother to hide the concern in her tone. Hee hee, don't worry about it. Enel simply walked away after that, leaving Hina to her own thoughts. He landed back near the platform, right beside Garp and Tsuru, just as Sengoku had finished half of his speech. Port Gas D, Ace. The death of this pirate holds great significance. Enel also looked at the stadium when hearing those words, he tried to remember where the speech was going, but the details of that scene were rather muddled. After all, he hadn't paid perfect attention to all aspects of the show. Ace. Tell me the name of your father. Sengoku said as he held his small transponder snail. Enel raised an eyebrow as he finally remembered where Sengoku was going with this. Enel could hear Ace, as he claimed that his only father was Whitebeard. That was when Sengoku called him a liar and proceeded to tell everyone the story of his birth. Of how Port Gas D, Rouge had kept her pregnancy going for twenty months through sheer will, all in order to deceive the world. Enel simply scowled as he liked what he was hearing less and less. A child was born, carrying the blood of the vilest man in the world. That child was you. Your father is. The Pirate King, Gold Roger. The entire navy was silent at that proclamation. No, the entire world was silent. The information was known to only a few important figures in the world. Sengoku had just pulled it out and revealed it to the entire world. Eno simply stared at the platform. He wasn't silent due to shock. He simply held the entire situation in disdain. Executing a child. For the sins of the father. So strange. Enel said as he spoke to nobody in particular. But Garp besides him could hear him clearly. A newborn child bears no sin. Garp. Take care of my child. Fragments of that memory rang in the old vice admiral's mind. He could only clench his fist as he looked at the figure of Ace on the platform. Maybe if he hadn't become a pirate. Maybe I could have convinced Sengoku. But now. The old man thought to himself after remembering the words of his old friend, G.O.L.D., Roger. Enel sighed, as he turned off the rest of the speech in his mind. He paid attention only to what was in front of him. He didn't need to act right away, after all. And, after a while, the pirate started appearing, Enel counted hundreds of ships in the distance, all wearing different Jolly Rogers. All of them were part of Whitebeard's grand fleet. Enel smiled as he saw a shadow in the bay, right in the middle of the docks, in the heart of Marineford. The sea started roaring, and three large, whale-shaped ships burst out of the water, followed by an entire fleet of pirate ships in the distance. The Moby Dick. They coated their ships and approached underwater. I can't believe this. Sengoku said as he narrowed his eyes a bit, some sweat rising on his brow. The Moby Dick was the main ship, the only one that had the figurehead of a white whale. And a tall man walked out brazenly on it, no trace of fear at all, as he stared down the entire combined might of the navy. His scalp was hidden by a black bandana, his scarred body was clothed in a white captain's coat, and a pair of loose pants tucked inside his large black boots. Enel could also see his signature mustache, forming a half circle going upwards from right underneath his nose. The man held on to his signature weapon, the Murakuma Jiri. A massive Najinata, one that fit the size of the gargantuan man that wielded it. Enel smiled a bit, as he finally caught sight of a pirate that held one of the highest bounties in the world. A man worth five billion berry. Father. Enel could hear Ace mutter, as he stared at the giant pirate. You better tell me that my son is all right. It's been a while, Sengoku. Whitebeard's words resonated across the battlefield. Enel could see many of the marines get discouraged just by seeing him. But Whitebeard wasn't alone, all fourteen of his commanders were present, including Marco, the only one that Enel had seen in the past. Father. 
Ace shouted in that instant, making the old pirate smile in the distance. Whitebeard then did the move that had jump-started the war, he brought his fist to his stomach, crossing his arms in the process, and then he stretched his fists on both sides of his body, punching the air with force. The marine seemed to fear this motion, as the air around Whitebeard started cracking, space itself became distorted, and tremors were sent across the seas. Water levels rose in that instant, creating larger and larger waves in the distance. Enel could see them. The approaching tsunamis threatened to swallow Marineford. So this is it, huh? The strongest man in the world. Enel's smile turned wider, as his excitement grew. I can befriend the Whitebeard pirates. But I want to clash with him at least once. Enel gave Garp and Suru a look. I'll leave you too. From this point on it's good luck. The rear admiral shouted as he jumped in and joined the crowd of marines below. Garp just sighed, his gaze turning grave. The tears in his eyes hadn't even dried up properly yet, now he had to fight. To fight in order for his grandson to die. Still, a part of him still held hope, a part of him tried to tell him that everything would work out in the end. Maybe Enel will really manage to save him. POV narration from the start, Enel knew that he couldn't just jump ship and start fighting marines. Especially not after befriending so many of them. Instead, he decided to do what he did best, take on Whitebeard with all of his strength. The old man had gone to war prepared to die, his sickness was catching up to him regardless, so he likely wanted to make sure that he at least saved his children. In truth, his death was one of the most tragic in Enel's opinion. The old man had come to this place with the sole purpose of saving his son, Port Gasti, Ace. And not only had that part failed, but many of his children had also lost their lives in the process. And, to add even more insult to injury. Whitebeard had actually lost his life to the traitor that had started the war in the first place. Blackbeard, the one that had captured Ace and turned him into the Marines in order to gain a warlord rank. Blackbeard had not only killed him, but he had also stolen his power, which he then proceeded to use on his other children. Thankfully, Enel's plans changed that future in its entirety. But first, Enel needed things to proceed as normal, at least to some extent. Enel could see Akiji get prepared to freeze over the tsunamis, which also meant that Luffy was on his way. Enel didn't want to waste time until then though. He appeared on one of the cannons of Marineford, looking directly at Whitebeard with a smile on his face. The old pirate was quick to notice him, raising an eyebrow for a second, as Enel's staff turned into a large naginata. Enel jumped, creating a sonic boom, pushing all of the marines around him backwards, in midair, the blade of his naginata turned black, as a wide smile reached Enel's lips. Newgate. Enel shouted as he prepared to swing his naginata in an obvious motion. Whitebeard smiled at that scene. Young people get more and more impressive each generation. Marco, as well as a few of the captains, wanted to quickly intercept the brazen rear admiral that was trying to attack their father. But all of them stopped when Whitebeard showed them the back of his palm, signaling them to stand down. Whitebeard then stepped heavily on his ship, making it shake in the water as his blade also seemed to turn black, with red lightning crackling around it. He quickly turned around slightly and swung his naginata upwards, meeting Enel's blade halfway. What followed was a clash that managed to shock the world. Their blades didn't get to touch, as their wills clashed first. The world around them slowed to a crawl, and the birds in the sky seemed to flee in fear. The skies were ripped wide open as the waves around Marineford stopped in their tracks. The air broke at Whitebeard's blade, as the veins on the old man's arms became more and more apparent. The shockwave pushed every marine back, the rest of the Whitebeard pirates on board were also forced to plunge their weapons into the ship in order to hold on. Pops. Marco plugged one of his talons into the ship, as his wings protected most of the crew members behind him. He hadn't expected Enel, a rear admiral of all people, to be the first on the marine side to attack. Reckless idiot. Hina and Akainu shouted in the distance, surprisingly at the exact same time. The two fighters that were clashing had completely closed off their perception of the world around them Thoga, their wills focused entirely on one another. Whitebeard didn't seem to be mad about it the attack, instead, all of the people could hear a burst of loud laughter. Gururara. Ha 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 ha. Both Enel and Edward Newgate were testing their willpower against each other. Each trying to push the other a bit more with each second that passed. Enel could feel it, 
his golden gauntlets bursting and being sent flying like shrapnel towards different buildings in the distance. He could feel his muscles bursting from the strain, as his hockey struggled to try to keep up with Whitebeard's strength. In the end, the strongest man alive obviously prevailed, his large arms flexing with his muscles straining a bit. Enel was blasted backwards, he ended up being plunged like a nail into one of Marineford's buildings in the distance, breaking it completely in the process as a dust cloud obscured everyone's view of Enel's state. But the clash itself had lasted for around a dozen seconds. Something that far exceeded everyone's expectations. Enel. Akainu shouted as he stood up, many turned to the admiral, to see him madly looking in between both the dust cloud and Whitebeard in the distance. Sengoku also released a frustrated sigh. He just had to go and do something like that. Akiji, the ice admiral, was rather shocked at what he had just witnessed, but he didn't let that shock last for long, as he proceeded to quickly freeze the tsunami surrounding Marineford. Kizaru simply muttered, impressive. As he patted some of the dust that had reached his costume. The clash had been large enough to affect everyone on Marineford. And so, the war started, with Akiji also quickly freezing all of the water in the bay, and the pirates being energized by witnessing their father-slash-captains. Strength. Enel simply looked at the holes in the collapsed ceiling above him. Yeah. That went a lot better than I expected. Enel didn't get up, laying in that rubble pile for a bit more, as he wondered why someone like Whitebeard would even need to struggle in that clash. I guess his sickness really has gotten to him. Still, Enel looked at his arms, both of them had burst muscles and ruptured skin. It was clear that the old man wasn't holding back to make things easier for Enel. If he was in his prime, he would have most likely turned my arms into a thin paste. Enel winced at the thought. Enel then glanced at the side, glancing at the bent Najinata that had landed a bit further away from him. Enel didn't let that complete loss discourage him though, the tiredness he felt was also not something he concerned himself with. The main thing that he felt right now, was excitement. I didn't instantly die when clashing with the strongest man in the world. All of the sleepless weeks he had spent training, all of the blood and sweat he had shed to grow his strength in such a short time. All of that was validated by that single clash. Sparring with Garp was not the same as this. The old man had always gone somewhat easy on Enel. After all, in a life and death battle, Garp could likely kill Enel in a few punches. Enel knew that facing these top powers with only his body and enhanced speed was simply impossible. But now he had forged his body in hockey enough to at least take a serious hit from someone of Garp's and Whitebeard's caliber. So, Enel could only laugh. Much like he had laughed during the clash with Whitebeard. That satisfying feeling, of seeing and feeling the results of his training. It was more than cathartic, it was almost addictive. Enel stood in that rubble for a bit longer. Then he slowly got up, walking over to his bent Najinata, picking it up and straightening it with his power, as he turned it back into a staff. He put the staff on his back, as his arms could use a break currently. Enel then proceeded to use his observation hockey and went to collect the gold from his gauntlets. Reforming them and using them to tightly bind his wounded arms. The tight fit seemed to somewhat quell the bleeding. As Enel was finally prepared to step back into the war. To Enel's surprise, Squad's betrayal hadn't happened anymore, as Enel's clash with Whitebeard had made all of the captains vigilant, and Marco was able to stop him before he stabbed his father in the back. Whitebeard still hugged Squad, despite the attempted betrayal. The old man could forgive people stabbing him in the back, that was just how much lenience he gave to his children. It was rather admirable, but Enel didn't have the time to ponder on that for too long. The war had already jump-started, and Luffy was already being assisted by his companions as he ran towards Ace's platform. Akainu was currently facing Whitebeard, Marco was fighting with Kizaru, holding him back, and Akiji was also fighting a few of the captains by himself. Hancock was doing a lot more damage to the marines than she was to the pirates, something that didn't quite shock Enel. Hina was doing her best, but she wasn't strong enough to make a large difference in a war of that scale. Enel started walking towards the platform, he looked at Garp, who was currently sitting near Ace. He jeppoed his way on top of the platform, shocking Sengoku a bit with his messy appearance. Enel. Why did you do that? Sengoku shouted in annoyance. He had hoped for his plans of turning Newgate's children against him would work to weaken the old man even further. But Enel's outburst had made things a lot worse for him. 
Why wouldn't I? This is a war, Sengoku. You can't micromanage every aspect of it. Enel said as he sat down on the platform, glancing at the situation with a weary gaze. Akainu was having a difficult time matching up with a less injured Whitebeard. But he was still holding his own. We will talk more after this. Don't get involved without my orders anymore. Enel just rolled his eyes at that. He was getting the same treatment as Garp, for some reason. Enel could see the pacifists being destroyed by Hancock, as she shielded Luffy from them. It was also at this point that Sengoku gave the executioners the word, and they raised their blades to pierce Ace. Luffy rushed through the crowd of trained marines, Enel whistled as he tried to understand how Luffy was even holding his own against that many marines. But that didn't last forever, as he was pushed to the ground eventually. The people helping him were all preoccupied with fighting strong opponents after all. That was when it happened. Just as Ace was about to die, Luffy released a burst of Conqueror's hockey powerful enough to knock out all of the marines near him, and the executioners on stage. Enel could feel that burst of energy. He could tell it was untrained, but he could also tell that it was strong. A lot stronger than he had expected it to be. He could see all of the admirals being shocked by it. Even Akainu turned his head around slightly, which made him receive a punch that sent him flying into the distance. Kizaru was quick to try and shoot a laser towards Luffy, which was blocked by Ivankov, as he positioned himself in front of it and released a hell wink. Enel struggled to understand just what that attack was while Luffy continued making his way to the platform, as one of his allies, and a revolutionary fighter created a bridge of stone for him. Enel couldn't help but wonder how the world aligned for Joy Boy to get his way. The way things were positioning themselves, it made Enel wonder how exactly Akainu had even managed to kill Ace. POV narration Enel didn't bother to stop Luffy at all, he simply yawned as he sat down on the edge of the execution platform. If Luffy had failed his Conqueror's Hockey reveal event, Enel would have interfered without a second thought. He was waiting for the last second, if the blades touched Ace's skin, then Enel would have pushed the executioners away without hesitation. But it wasn't needed apparently, Garp also did his thing and let Luffy knock him out as the young man rushed to save his brother. Luffy also noticed Enel, but he didn't try to attack the rear admiral, only shouting, hello, long ears. As he ran past him. Enel simply smiled a bit as he let out another yawn. Ace. I'm here to save you. Luffy quickly took out the key that Hancock had given him. That was when Enel noticed something strange. Kizaru, unlike he was supposed to do in the show, aimed his laser, not at the key, but directly at Luffy's head. Using future sight, Enel was able to just barely move the tip of his blackened staff in front of that yellow laser, parting it in many sides as it broke some of the buildings in the distance. Enel masked that as him simply stretching, but plenty of people had managed to catch that movement, including Whitebeard from below. The old pirate just smirked at that, that Luffy brat really has a talent for making friends. Enel. What is the meaning of this? Sengoku shouted as he quickly started growing larger, finally turning into a golden giant as Enel just stared with a wry smile. What do you mean boss? I'm just stretching here, did something happen? Enel simply said as he looked up at the fleet admiral without any shame in his gaze. Luffy had completely missed what had happened, but Ace was able to see it rather clearly. So he's on our side. No, I guess he's just Luffy's friend, otherwise, he wouldn't have attacked Pops. Ace thought to himself as Luffy was quick to try and turn the key to his sea stone cuffs. Do you really think I'd just let you do that? Sengoku said to the side as he completely turned into a giant golden human. Enel narrowed his eyes a bit, as he jumped a bit off the platform. Sengoku's palm released a shockwave, one that Luffy was miraculously able to block with a balloon. Well, he didn't really block it, he just resisted it for long enough for their footing to completely collapse. Enel hopped in the air on one leg, as he looked at the situation with crossed arms. Kizaru hadn't attempted any other similar attack on Luffy, but Enel could tell that the Admiral was rather displeased with Enel's involvement. Enel blinked a few times, as a flying blue bird rushed towards him. It was none other than Marco Enel simply scowled, both of his legs hopped on the air, as he blasted himself forwards and met the flying Phoenix Heaton, staff met claws as flames started spreading out around them. Thank you, Enelioi. Marco whispered a bit, as he then pushed Enel back a bit using his talons, and proceeded to fly away and save a few of his crewmates from Kizaru. Enel just let him off, 
as he realized that Marco most likely thought Enel was still trying to remain as a Marine. What an oddball! The rear admiral thought to himself as he looked back at Ace and Luffy. At this point, Ace had already been freed, he and Luffy were throwing around Marines as they were quickly retreating. Enel raised an eyebrow, as he finally noticed the odd looks Kizaru was giving him. Eventually, he started hopping toward the two retreating pirate brothers. Whitebeard also gave the following order next. Everyone. Protect Ace and Luffy. We are retreating. The old man hadn't received anywhere near as many injuries as he had in the original. Akainu hadn't been able to take him by surprise much, without the squad's betrayal which would have severely injured Whitebeard, the situation was really stacked against the magma-spitting admiral. Kizaru had tried aiding him as much as possible, but Marco had him covered on that front. Akiji was also assisting, but he wasn't a great team fighter for Akainu, as the other admiral's magma was constantly getting in the way of his ice. And his ice was also being crushed by Whitebeard's tremors. Whitebeard had still received quite a few injuries, including a magma-fueled punch to the chest. But it had been a trade-off, as Akainu was squashed into the ground in order to land that one. Akiji was quick to try and stop Ace and Luffy, but Ace's fire seemed to overwhelm his ice, which meant he was unable to do much to stop their retreat. So, he quickly switched roles with Akainu, Akiji quickly taking to fighting Whitebeard, as Akainu chased after the last remaining blood relative of G.O.L.D., Roger. The two of them clashed, which led to Ace being quickly overwhelmed. My magma can easily burn your fire. Enel could hear Akaina gloat a bit as he managed to slightly injure and push back the fire-creating pirate. Enel could hear all of the captains in Whitebeard's crew shouting in desperation for Ace to run. Marco had been trapped with sea stone cuffs, so he was unable to rush there and stop Akainu. And, unfortunately, the young and courageous Ace was being riled on by Akainu's insults. It wouldn't have mattered much if Akainu had just insulted Ace, but he had also insulted Whitebeard. Ace ignored his crewmates, he also ignored his father's words to retreat. He respected him far too much to allow him to be insulted by anyone. But how exactly was Ace supposed to be able to win against Akainu? He was once again pushed back, this time Luffy also got involved, trying to punch the admiral and make him back off a bit. At that point, Luffy also got slightly burnt which sent him tumbling towards the ground in pain, as he clutched as his burnt arm. Enel raised an eyebrow at that, as he wondered why Luffy's fire immunity wasn't coming into play. Akainu then towered over him, his fist cocked backwards, trying to kill the young fledgling pirate. That was when Ace got in front of him, Enel could basically hear the scared shouts of Ace's crewmates. Ace was determined, he wasn't about to let his young brother die right in front of him, not while he could still do something to stop it even if that something meant giving his life away. Just as Akainu's fist was about to pierce Ace, Ace gritted his teeth as he looked at Luffy in front of him. That was also when Enel appeared right in between Ace and Luffy, his staff instantly tuning into a blackened half-sphere that covered Ace. The young pirate was shocked, as Enel had technically just teleported in his face, but he didn't have the time to react much verbally, as he was quickly pulled by a metallic tendril and thrown back into Luffy, sending the two of them tumbling a bit. Enel's sphere was quickly melted through, as he pulled back his medals and reformed them in his gauntlet arms recreating his staff in an instant. Enel. What stunt are you trying to pull? Akainu was beyond pissed off when he realized what had happened. He had been a millimeter away from killing Ace, from completing his mission, before Enel had interfered. Akainu. I don't mean this in a bad way. But I hardly see any reason why either of these kids should die by your hand today. Enel's words weren't anywhere near as loud, still, all of the people that heard them could only recoil in shock. Some had already seen Enel protect Luffy, but that could have been interpreted as a mistake, no one knew that Kizaru was aiming for Luffy's head anyway. So it wasn't anywhere near as major as him jumping in front of Akainu. This time though, he had well and truly done it. Enel. Are you betraying the marines? In order to save two dirty criminals. Akainu's anger could clearly be felt, as his fist lunged forwards. His punch crashed into the ground with the force of a volcanic eruption, Enel had managed to jump away without much issue, but he could see the ground being split open and magma started to rise. Dirty criminals. I agree that most pirates deserve that moniker, but these two haven't done much to earn it. I'm sick and tired of this. Akainu raised an eyebrow at Enel's words. 
they gained their bounties rightfully. They slighted the world government time and time again. Akaina didn't want to give up on his fellow marine so easily, but Enel wasn't budging. Heh. We both know that bounties have nothing to do with crimes, Akainu. It's all about what the government feels. Akainu's anger manifested again, Inagami Gurin. With his fist cocked back, he shot a wave of magma shaped like a fanged dog head towards Enel, who had just landed on the ground. Enel simply pointed his arm towards the incoming attack. El Thor. His hand instantly turned into a huge laser that completely dwarfed the incoming attack. Akainu simply saw a flash of light, after which he was sent flying by the lightning blast as the ground around him was burnt to a crisp. The laser continued forwards, passing above the heads of many marines and hitting the marine headquarters, creating an explosion that sent tremors throughout the island. So cool. Luffy said to the side, which made Enel just stare at him for a bit. That display managed to somewhat halt the aggression, as everyone was currently staring at the unfolding disaster in front of them. Lightning. One of the marines said as he took a step back. Many of the marines had similar reactions. Many didn't know whether this was a good thing or not, but since Enel had just blasted a Kainu further inland, most surmised that this wasn't a good thing at all. Enel. Sengoku was the first to shout, as he dashed towards the traitorous marine. His palm extended towards him, releasing a large shockwave that pushed back most of the marines nearby. Enel simply turned into a bolt of lightning and traveled up Sengoku's arm, paralyzing it in the process. Rather stormy today, wouldn't you say so? Enel said as he crouched down on Sengoku's shoulder and looked at the clouds in wonder. Why are you doing this? Sengoku said as he tried to calm down a bit, he still didn't want to consider Enel as an enemy. I can't let you kill my friend, referring to Luffy, by the way. If we were executing some big shot pirate, then I wouldn't care, but this is just a bunch of kids. Enel said as he jumped a few times and headed for the clouds. That was when another admiral decided to intervene. Yasukani no Magatama. Kama jewel of eight Shaku, countless rays of light headed for Enel, as Kizaru finally decided to get involved in that mess. As a bolt of lightning, Enel managed to dance around the light rays, as he also started receiving more and more attacks. Ice block, partisan. Enel's body then twirled to the side, as dozens of ice spears were sent toward him. Kuzan also decided to try and contribute to the fight. At this point, the Whitebeard pirates were starting to retreat, so no one was holding back the admirals anymore. Enel simply swung his staff, creating a dome around him as all of the spears were blocked. Enel frowned a bit as he felt his shield freeze over, but that didn't last long, as he sent a current of electricity through it, heating it up and melting all of the accumulated ice. Ryusei Kazan. Meteor Volcano, Akainu had also managed to fly back from the other side of the island. His fists were pointed at the sky as he shot countless giant magma fists toward Enel. At this point, most of the lower-ranking marines were running away, same for the weaker pirates. Enel didn't falter at all in the face of the attacking admirals though. Sango. Lightning flash, Enel raised an arm to the skies, out of it parted countless lightning bolts, striking down on Marine Ford and intercepting all of the attacks that were coming his way. Countless explosions spread and left behind only scorched earth. Enel did his best to avoid hitting the Marines below, but it was difficult with all of the admirals attacking him. Enel was currently using the techniques that the old Enel had already trained, he wanted to see just how well they held up. Thankfully, they seemed to be rather effective, as most of the strikes that had been heading towards him were shot down. Pandemonium spread as more and more people realized that they were being attacked by yet another fruit that was capable of destroying islands. As if Whitebeard wasn't enough. One of the marines below said as he ran as far as he could. Fear and confusion were the most common thing among the marine ranks now, their morale was extremely low, and the only thing keeping the fight going was their pride. After that clash, the situation had calmed down a bit, as Enel floated in the skies and looked down at Marineford with narrowed eyes. Akaina was still recovering, as Enel's lightning had injured him a bit, Sangoku had been struck by a few stray bolts of lightning, but he was just paralyzed for a bit, not seriously injured by any stretch of the imagination. Kizaru and Kazan were forced to break their attention as some of the captains of Whitebeard's crew started attacking them in order to try and cover their crewmates' retreat. It was now that the situation took a strange turn. It seems we are a bit late to the party. 
a boisterous voice was heard from the side. POV narration, what the hell is this guy doing here? Enel pondered as he looked at the massive figure that had just pulled up to the scene. Enel could clearly see Blackbeard and his gathered crew waltz into the ongoing war. Even their giant had shown himself, as he had been hiding behind some tall buildings. The former rear admiral was utterly flabbergasted that the idiot had actually shown up at Marineford. In the original, he showed up only when Whitebeard was missing half of his head. Why is he here now? Enel thought he'd have to hunt down Blackbeard after the war, as that would have made the most sense with how things had been developing. Shuryu was also there, the psychopath looked a bit less calm than usual though, as his gaze met Enel's. Old man. Teach spoke out, with an arrogant grin on his face. The marines were all shocked when seeing so many criminals gathered around Blackbeard. He had truly gathered an all-star crew of criminals so feared that their names had been erased from history. Shiryu. What is the meaning of this? What happened to Magellan? Why are all of you here? Sengoku slowly got up in the distance, the anger in his voice was rather obvious. You'll find out what happened to him soon. Anyway. I've decided to team up with these guys. Shiryu said as he smoked his cigar and looked around the battlefield, his hand was already on his blade as he prepared for the worst. Sengoku kept questioning them about how they had passed through the gates of justice and whatnot, but Enel was no longer paying attention to that. He didn't care all that much for Blackbeard's crew currently. But that wasn't the case for Whitebeard. As he was the first one to walk up towards his former son. Teach. The older man said as he looked down at his disowned son. Blackbeard was speaking haughtily about the way he had overcome the gates of justice, about how magnificent his plan was. At least until he ate a shockwave from Whitebeard's Naginata. All of his crew members who were nearby were sent flying into rubble, but all of them got up rather quickly. Marco was quick to turn into a blue phoenix and was about to rush and assist his father. Marco. Stand back. Whitebeard stopped him instantly though. Whitebeard then continued to make his way toward the newcomers. You broke the one iron rule on my ship. Let's settle this, teach. Akainu also started flying towards Whitebeard. While he's distracted, we must at least kill Whitebeard. Akainu was still injured due to receiving attacks from both Enel and Whitebeard, but he didn't let that hinder him much. He dashed forwards, heading straight for the legendary pirate with malicious intent. Enel wasn't about to let him interfere with the father-son reunion though, he was genuinely curious as to how Blackbeard planned to defeat Whitebeard under these circumstances. The lightning man was quick to dash towards Akainu's back, what he hadn't expected was to be intercepted right when he got near the admiral. You brat. It was none other than the old garp. His blackened fist cocked backwards and struck at Enel's face. The old man had likely anticipated that he'd go after Akainu, so he had enough time to act. Although Garp sounded mad, he had a large smile on his face, it was clear that this was nothing more than keeping up appearances to him. In truth, the old man was currently feeling like crying tears of happiness. Both of his grandsons had survived. Who cared if they were pirates? To him, they were family. And Enel had made a sacrifice and protected that family when he was too conflicted to do so himself. Although he acted mad, deep inside, he felt that he owed Enel quite a lot on this occasion. Enel also knew that Garp was likely not mad at him. So he decided to not try and injure Garp in any way. With skillful movements and using his observation hockey to bend himself around Garp's body, paralyzing him in the process and still going straight for Akainu. Garp fell to the ground, unable to use Jeppo as his body refused to listen to him for half a second, the old man smiled as Akainu's claw was intercepted by Enel's staff. Akainu swore loudly as sparks arose from their armament hockey enhanced strikes. His claw seemed to be winning though, as it was starting to cut into the staff. This wasn't just a contest of strength though, it was a battle. So Enel was quick to bind the staff around the admiral's arm, Akaina struggled, as he was then hurled towards the ground, his body weakened by the ceased and laced staff that Enel wielded. Enel didn't stop there though, he managed to bind Akainu in thick chains, and then he sent the admiral flying with a strike of his staff. Sengoku acted quickly, catching Akainu and sending a volley of shockwaves toward Enel and Whitebeard. Enel simply winced, as his staff quickly turned into dozens of tendrils, aiming to intercept each shockwave before they reached him. The air blasted the tendrils apart, 
but the shockwaves were successfully stopped. At this point, Enel was pushed a bit more, and he was standing back to back with Whitebeard. The old man huffed a bit, observing the rear admiral from the corner of his eye. Doing such useless things. Still, thank you. For saving my son. Newgate gave Enel his gratitude in a short exchange, as he turned his attention back to teach. Don't mention it. Now, if we could both get the hell out of here after you deal with this bastard. Enel said as he continued to block whatever incoming attacks he could with bolts of lightning. Teach had also dashed towards Whitebeard at this point. He already had spread out his darkness underneath the two of them, it wasn't doing all that much, besides preventing the old man from moving. Unfortunately for Teach, Whitebeard had no intention of moving his legs. The large man instead swung his naginata, a white halo covering the blade of it as he intercepted Blackbeard's fist. Zayhaha. Teach laughed loudly as his fist seemed to hinder the quake powers that Whitebeard wielded. But that didn't do all that much in the end, as Whitebeard's naginata still cut through his arm. The old man's hockey being a few leagues above that of Teach. That slash sent Blackbeard tumbling towards the ground, as he screamed in pain and held his bleeding arm. Whitebeard simply huffed, a white halo covered his fist, as he seemed to crush Teach underneath it. The air started cracking rapidly, and Teach was being squashed into the ground, blood spilt out of his mouth as the bones in his body broke rapidly. The cracks spread all over the ground, and the shockwave that wave produced shook Marineford and pushed back most of Blackbeard's crew members. What? Are you trying to kill me? Teach shouted as he struggled underneath Whitebeard's fist. Edward Newgate simply huffed at that shameful display. Retrieving his fist and staring down at the pathetic form of his former son. Enel also raised an eyebrow at that display. This buffoon was supposed to be the main antagonist of the show. Enel thought to himself as his palm parted into lightning bolts and blocked off a few light rays and even more shock waves. This can't keep going forever. Enel thought to himself as he wondered if grabbing Whitebeard and escaping was an option. At this point, most of the important figures in the Marines were heading his way, trying to both take him down and kill Whitebeard. Ace and Luffy had already managed to jump onto a submarine, and Jimbei had helped them navigate through the water and break the ice in order for them to retreat successfully. At this point, the Marines had zero chance of actually killing Ace or Luffy. But Whitebeard hadn't left Marineford yet. He planned to be the last to leave, to make sure not one of his children was left behind. He was covering their retreat by catching the attention of the marines. And Enel was doing the expert job of blocking every single attack that was heading for his back, as he dealt with his former son that had just appeared on the battlefield. Enel knew that he would slowly start getting tired if the situation continued like that. Both of his injured hands were pointed forwards, lightning raining everywhere in front of him, blocking and pushing back all of the marines nearby. Shit. Why do we have to deal with both Rumble and Quake in the same war? A few marines couldn't help but express their grievances. One invincible fruit was more than difficult enough to fight, now they had two island-destroying beasts to deal with at the same time. Still Enel didn't aim directly for them, Enel wanted to avoid bloodshed as much as possible. But the lightning bolts sent currents through the ground, paralyzing more and more marines. Whitebeard's tremors also created great cracks, as the whole of Marineford trembled under the attacks of the two devil fruit users. Blackbeard was quick to call for the help of his newly assembled crew, and all of them started trying to attack Whitebeard. Whitebeard winced, as his body stopped momentarily due to his sickness. Blackbeard's crew quickly took that opportunity, many of them pointing their guns at the strongest man in the world with nasty smiles on their faces. Blackbeard also took out a gun hurriedly, and in sync with all of his subordinates, they all started shooting at the old man. Marco shouted in the distance, as he quickly turned into a phoenix and rushed towards his father, disregarding the previous orders. The other captain followed after him. But Whitebeard wasn't alone in this, metal tendrils extended from behind him, perfectly blocking all of the incoming bullets. Gather your wits, old man. I'll take care of the small fry, you punish your son. Enel jumped up and tapped Whitebeard on the shoulder as he turned towards the Blackbeard pirates. Whitebeard pirates. Hold back the marines for a few seconds. Enel's order reverberated throughout the battlefield, this kicked into gear the rest of the captains, as they all quickly started trying to fight against the marines in a desperate rush to save their father. The old man was going to complain about the insubordination, 
but he refrained when seeing the mad look in Enel's eyes. I get that you want to protect your kids. But this isn't the time for that. This is a winning battle, retreat only after everything is won. Whitebeard simply smiled at Enel's words. Fine. But I don't like you ordering my children around. Whitebeard said as he stared at Teach with a cold look. Enel also started twirling his staff, metal tendrils from his gauntlet still blocking all of the bullets coming toward the two of them. Enel looked at the bastards that made up Blackbeard's crew. Now. To deal with this trash. POV narration Garp didn't really know what to expect when Enel had said that he'd make sure Ace and Luffy survived. He sure as hell didn't expect Enel to start throwing lighting around like it was candy on Halloween. Garp had pretended to attack him in rage, but he didn't really care what happened in the war anymore, to him, the only thing that mattered was the fact that both his grandsons survived. Now, the fact that Enel was obviously protecting Whitebeard did strike him as odd, but he knew that Whitebeard was a respectable man, so he didn't let it get to his head. In his books, Enel was a great friend. One that made a sacrifice to protect his friends, which also happened to be Garp's. Grandsons. This was not the same for Sengoku, unfortunately. The old fleet admiral was shocked from the moment Enel had blocked one of Kazara's lasers in order to protect Luffy. He had hoped that event was just a fluke, but Enel then stopped Akainu and revealed the true nature of his devil fruit. That truly angered the old man, not as much as it confused him though. So. You're telling me that everything was fake. All of that. Was a lie. If Enel had just revealed his fruit in the war while fighting for the marines, Sengoku wouldn't have minded. He could somewhat understand Enel trying to hide it. The world government was always interested in powerful fruits, so they would have certainly tried to do something shady earlier than dress Rosa. But the fact that Enel had seemingly turned against them. It simply stung for the old fleet admiral, he had been somewhat cautious since the beginning with Enel, but he had still befriended him in the end. And Hina wasn't any better. She was mad, she felt like she had been deceived. But a part of her refused to believe that Enel had lied to her. A part of her kept saying that maybe Enel had a good reason for his actions, that maybe his friendship with her wasn't fake. Something, anything, to justify his actions. But Enel didn't reveal his true motives to anyone, so she had no way of knowing. Hina had decided to stand back during the war. The last thing she wanted was to actually fight Enel. She also didn't even feel prepared to face him right away. Hina could also see that the warlords were no longer getting involved, they were merely watching the situation unfold with interest. Enel. I hope that you know what you're doing. I hope it was worth it. Hina thought to herself as she took a few steps back and observed the situation with the lower-ranking marines. The commanders of the Whitebeard crew had no time to think about those things though. They all quickly started to hold back the marines that were attacking their father's back. Enel knew to take advantage of that. Blackbeard's crew seemed to realize that Enel's attention was now fully on them. Enel looked first at the giant that had been hiding behind Marineford's base. His eyes sparked with lightning as he tapped his staff onto the ground. Mama Reagan. Heavy thunder. The clouds that he had overcharged with lightning roared with anger. A rain of lightning fell onto the giant, his size only made him a larger target, each bolt left more and more burns on the giant's body, all until the giant was well and thoroughly cooked, collapsing from severe injuries. The ground shook as lighting kept falling everywhere, taking also impeding many marines and assisting the Whitebeard pirates further in their retreat. The giant's unconscious body hit the ground with a loud thud, breaking a few more walls in the process. Enel had avoided the giant's head, mainly in order to avoid killing him completely. He still wanted the remainders of Blackbeard's pirates to be captured after all, just in case he needed them in the future. The other pirates in the group seemed to be a bit shocked, seeing their largest and most resilient member fall in a few seconds of the fight starting. Enel then dashed towards the group, not giving them much time to register what had just happened. They all seemed to take a step back when seeing him rush like that, the next to fall was Jesus Burgess, his face caved in by Enel's heavy staff before he could even react properly. Enel then provided to turn his staff and strike towards one of the nearest pirates, Doc Q only had enough time to shriek, as he was sent flying into the crowd of marines in the distance. Katarina Devon was the next target, but she had enough time to prepare herself, managing to block Enel's staff with her spear. She wasn't known as the most dangerous woman pirate in Impel Down for nothing. 
Her blackened spear seemed to be able to hold up against Enel's staff perfectly. But Enel wasn't about to start playing around with her like he had jacked the drought. With a small twirl, his staff parted around her weapons and pierced her body in ten different places. Or at least they tried to, she had managed to cover herself in armament in time, which led to sparks rising where the tendrils tried to dig into her body. But Enel didn't let that dissuade him, the tendrils quickly entangled her, weakening her completely as she was also a devil fruit user. The sea stone impended her hockey as well, which led to her body being pierced in different places and thrown backwards. While this was happening, the other members weren't sleeping. Shiryu, Avalo Pizarro, and Lafitte all managed to react in time. With the latter two shooting at Enel in a panic, and Shiryu slicing towards him with his blade. Enel simply parted his body around the attacks, the fact that they were imbued with hockey couldn't matter less to him thanks to his observation hockey. Shiryu, being the closest, was obviously the next target. Enel kicked towards him, his blackened leg hitting Shiryu's hilt as the former warden skidded to the side. The former warden was quick to cover his body in armament hockey, preparing to tank more hits. Even if he's strong, he won't be able to kill me so quickly. He hoped that the others would be able to hit Enel while he was distracted, but fate had other plans. Enel simply stabbed his staff into the ground, tendrils rising out of the ground and forcing the other Blackbeard pirates to jump backwards. Enel then appeared in front of Shiryu, shocking the former warden and putting his palms on each side of the pirate's head. Arcs of lightning danced in between Enel's hand, as Shiryu screamed in pain, slashing with his blade around in a frenzy, as Enel calmly passed through said blade with ease. After a few seconds, the former jailer had dropped his sword, grasping and clawing at Enel's hands as his head was being cooked thoroughly. Enel simply gave the former warden a cold gaze. You should have taken my warning in good faith. Enel's words were only heard by Shiryu, in the former warden's last seconds. With that, Enel dropped the warden's body to the ground. Enel quickly retrieved his staff and looked around at the situation for a bit. The rest of the Blackbeard pirates were trying to flee at that point, with only Van Auger, the sniper, still taking shots at Enel from a distance. And he was rewarded for his efforts, not in a satisfying way for him though. Enel pointed his finger towards, a small lightning beam shot directly towards the sniper, who tried to move to the side, but was unable to dodge it in the end. The sniper was pierced in the gut, lightning spreading all over his body as he fell to the floor. Fucking monster! Avalo Pizarro, the fallen tyrant, shouted as he did his best to flee at his greatest speed. Most of the still-conscious Blackbeard pirates had the same thought as they were fleeing, unfortunately for them, they hadn't managed to make it far, as Enel's lightning moved a lot faster than they ever could. The clouds seemed to snipe them for sport, lightning striking both in their path and to the ground underneath them. The earth was blasted by the lightning strikes, and tremors spread through their surroundings, as Enel was now once again able to give his attention to the marines. The Whitebeard pirates were holding their own nicely against the marines, Myhawk was mainly just looking at Enel with interest, as he wasn't all that involved in the war. Marco was once again keeping Kizaru occupied, assisted by a few snipers from his crew. Sengoku was fighting Jozu and Vista, and many of the commanders were holding back vice admirals and admirals. Enel's lighting sometimes fell from the skies, impeding the marines they were fighting and keeping them on their toes. Oi! You brat, don't you ignore me! Enel heard a voice in the distance, it was none other than Garp, who was approaching him at breakneck speeds. Taking a hit won't be that bad, right? For old time's sake. Enel rationalized in his mind as he prepared to clash with a serious Garp for the first time. Enel's staff quickly met Garp's fist, only for the staff to bend in an odd way and for him to be pushed back, breaking another building with his back and being buried in another pile of rubble. Enel didn't bother using his body to leave, he simply turned into lightning and headed straight for the clouds. From the outside, one could see a large lightning beam rising to the skies. Garp tried to follow him using Jeppo but was quickly struck by a lightning bolt, paralyzing him again and sending him hurtling towards the ground with slight burn marks on his skin. At this point, Whitebeard also looked down at his former son, the one he had put his trust into, and the one that had betrayed him. Teach. I want you to know, that I won't ever forgive you. A loving father he was, but he only held one iron rule, and Teach had walked all over that. With one last slash of his Najinata, Whitebeard sent a powerful quake into the ground, crushing Teach in the process, as the former warlord screamed bloody murder. 
Whitebeard closed his eyes a bit, as he delivered the last hit to the one that had betrayed his trust. Blackbeard didn't get to say anything else, his last moment alive was spent screaming, as Whitebeard's tremors broke all of the bones in his body and crushed his skull to smithereens. And, just like that. A future emperor of the seas was killed. Finally. It's about time I end this war now, isn't it? Enel thought to himself as his staff started rotating by itself in the air. POV narration Whitebeard heaved a tired sigh as he looked at the body of Teach. The one betrayer of his group, the child that turned against his family. The killer of Tatch, the one that had almost gotten Ace killed as well. Edward Newgate felt strange, although he had avenged his other son, his hands were now dirty with the blood of the one that he had once also considered family. Still, the old man felt that it was better that way. It was better for him to be the one to punish Teach. After all, the one thing he hated to see, was his sons harming each other. And, as much as Teach had disappointed him, as much as he had broken the only rule he had made. He was still a son to the old man. Now that he had finally punished Teach, Whitebeard only felt tired. He felt no satisfaction in what he had done, after all, how could he? He cared just that much about his children. Which was why he knew that it was time to escape. My children. All of you. Get back to the ships. Edward said as he shouted with ferocious willpower emanating from him. The Whitebeard pirates listened, and all of them swiftly started fighting their way back to the ship. They all started quickly trying to create a retreating path. The marines quickly turned more desperate, trying their best to take down any pirate that they could. Sengoku was also getting more and more desperate, as the war was looking more and more like a complete loss for the navy. Each time a high-ranking marine was close to taking down a pirate, or severely injuring one, a lightning strike always stopped that. It was the same when the pirates got too close to killing a marine. Although the battle was still ongoing, and attacks were being thrown around everywhere, the battle was well and truly caught in a stalemate. And that was all because of Enel, who was currently sitting on a cloud, raining lightning down wherever he could in order to keep that stalemate going. Sengoku was quick to realize that Enel was the one preventing them from winning that battle. He grit his teeth as hate started to well up inside of him. All of the lives lost today. All of that preparation. You're telling me it was for nothing. Sengoku simply couldn't bring himself to cope with that. With an angry roar, he directed his palms at the sky. With inhuman strength, he started releasing shockwave after shockwave towards the skies. Each shockwave parted the clouds more and more, Enel scowled, as he tried his best to keep the clouds together, but he had failed in the end. As the sky turned clear, the marines were starting to regain some morale. This war isn't over yet. We can still win this. As long as Whitebeard falls here. Sengoku was quick to try and motivate his marines further. However, Enel was getting a bit annoyed at this point. I've rested enough. It's time to end this war. With a simple gesture, he flew towards the water in the middle of the bay. He pointed his arms downwards. Attacks came from all directions, but he simply ignored them, letting them pass through him without any issue. Whether it was magma, light or ice, none of them could injure him as long as he was concentrated enough. With a roar, he started discharging as much electricity as possible into the water. Slowly but surely, the ice around Marineford all melted, and the water started rising, pooling to the skies as it sparked with electricity. What is this? Many ships were being pushed away, as the pirates that had already retreated were all doing their best to move away from whatever Enel was creating. Stop him. Don't let him charge up an attack. Sengoku shouted as he quickly sent a shockwave towards Enel. He now knew that Enel had a fruit capable of destroying Marineford completely, the last thing he needed was for him to actually do so. Die Funka. Major eruption. Akainu had also jumped towards Enel, his fist erupting forwards as he shot as much magma as he could towards the former rear admiral. Enel managed to notice those attacks, as his concentration broke from the move that he was preparing. With a slight scowl, a massive wave of energized water rose from the sea underneath him. The water managed to both cool off Akainu's magma and paralyze him slightly, causing his body to be taken up by the wave and pushed backwards, right into Sengoku's shockwave. The shockwave dispersed the wave, but also injured Akainu. The admiral could only spit out some blood as he fell to the ground. 
Enno then continued to overcharge the water around him. The energized water was quick to start boiling, as he quickly started to manipulate the seas around Marineford completely. If I can control clouds, then I can control the seas too. With a monstrous amount of concentration and will, Enel quickly started forming a figure using the water that he had energized. Jorman Gandra. Enel raised his hands upwards as he said that as if summoning something from the depths of the sea. Right on Enel's call, a gigantic snake formed out of the waters he controlled. Its head seemed to be larger than half of Marineford, and its body seemed to have no end, as it seemed to be directly connected to the sea. Enel smiled when seeing that his creation had succeeded, he quickly turned into a lightning bolt and tried to enter the snake's body. Kizaru was fast to intercept him, turning into light and appearing in his path. Light and lightning seemed to be flashing around in the sky for a bit, as the two of them met in midair and crashed. Both of them kicked at the other. Their kicks connected, and Kizaru's strength was shown, as he was able to overwhelm Enel after a short few seconds. Enel winced as he felt the bones in his leg crack. He was quickly sent flying backwards, directly into the snake, exactly as he had planned. The second his body hit the snake, it turned into lightning and vanished within the snake. Its eyes seemed to gain a spark, looking like a thunderstorm was happening in each eye at the same time. What the hell is that? One flabbergasted vice admiral muttered as he stared at the impossibly large water construct. Another vice admiral was quick to send a flying slash towards the snake, only for the snake to completely part around the slash. H. How are we supposed to fight something like that? The vice admiral shouted as he tried more and more to send Rankayakus towards the gigantic snake. Many joined him, and countless flying slashes from both legs and blades were sent toward the snake. The Whitebeard pirates were now having to retreat through a different point, Squared had turned his boat and actually circled around Marineford in order to pick up Whitebeard. The captains were quick to retreat to it as the attention of the marines was completely captured by Enel's show. Hancock had also decided to retreat with the Whitebeard pirates, her interest in the war vanished the second that Luffy managed to escape it. Now, she was only slightly interested in whatever move Enel was cooking up. The snake seemed to deform for a second, as the countless slashes pushed away some of the water that formed its body. You are listening to this audiobook on web novel audiobooks Tkthigud. But the very next second it was completely reformed. How scary. For once, Kizaru's voice didn't have a bored undertone to it. How could it? They were staring the equivalent of an ancient weapon in the eye. Myhawk had yet to leave the battlefield, he quickly swung his sword, a massive flying slash heading directly for the snake's head. The strongest swordsman in the world was intrigued, he wanted to see exactly how the beast in front of him worked. His flying slash was marginally larger than every other before, managing to cut the snake's head off, shocking all of the marines at the scene. But the shock didn't last long, as their fear came back in the next second, the snake's head reconnected itself in that same second, making Myhawk raise an eyebrow. I guess it can't be taken down easily. The swordsman thought to himself as he sent a few more slashes at the snake, each as big as the first one, all of them brushed off in the same manner. The assault continued, as everyone seemed to want to stop that snake from slamming itself into Marineford. Akiji was quick to run towards the water snake, the sweat on his brow freezing as he pointed his hands towards the large snake. Without any hesitation, the admiral jumped directly at the snake. The second they came into contact, Akiji's eyes widened, as the water in front of him seemed to be turning into steam as soon as he came near it. Boiling water. That realization didn't stop him, he forged on, hoping to be able to freeze the snake inside out quickly. But, all of the water that he was close to touching seemed to evaporate just as he came close to it. Before he knew it, he was already in the middle of the snake's body, as the steam around him momentarily blinded him. Before he could react, boiling water pushed into him from all sides, the more he froze, the more Enel seemed to be able to melt. The water seemed to form odd currents around him, he tried to lower its temperature endlessly, but each time he froze the water around him even slightly, Enel melted it instantly. The energized water also paralyzed his muscles constantly, making it harder and harder for him to move. In the end, the Ice Admiral was quickly trapped in Enel's water prison, as the snake seemed to form a bubble of still water inside its constantly flowing body. The second the water around Akiji stilled was also the second his devil fruit powers vanished. He was stuck, just like that. Admiral Akiji. 
many marines shouted in fear when seeing that development. Akaina was quick to try and blast the snake away, but he didn't get to try many things. The magma that touched the water seemed to only evaporate some of it before quickly being cooled off, it wasn't doing any damage, as there was enough water in the ocean to go around. We need to find Enel's true body. Sengoku shouted as he also threw shockwave after shockwave at the snake. But the snake seemed to be a lot tougher than a bunch of clouds, each time it even slightly deformed, it regenerated instantly. The marines desperately attacked the snake, as the pirate ships were getting pushed further and further by the constantly revolving sea. Whitebeard was already on Squared's ship at that point, staring at the gigantic snake as the sea itself seemed to push their ship further away from Marineford. Not one member of the crew could say anything as they stared at the odd scene in front of them. In a sense, it was a beautiful scene. But the fact that the entire thing was the doing of one man, seemed to creep out some of them. That brat. He really is a monster. Whitebeard said with a wide smile, no trace of fear on his face. Although Enel's technique was impressive, Whitebeard was not the type to fear anything at all. And he knew that he could likely break it with his quakes if need be. Marco, prepare to fly in and pick up that brat. I doubt he'll have much stamina after pulling a stunt like this. Whitebeard waved his hand, giving his son a direct order without any hesitation. Marco nodded, looking at the gigantic snake with a bit of sweat on his brow. Good thing I didn't try to fight him while on the sea. The commander could still remember his first meeting with Enel. At least Marco had the option to fly away, but he knew that if such an attack was to be directed at his crew in the middle of the sea, many of them would drown. That didn't matter now though, Enel was obviously their ally Marco couldn't help but feel a bit of pity for the marines though. Without any warning, the gigantic snake reared back, its head pointed upwards as its throat seemed to be getting larger and larger. Sengoku's eyes widened as he realized what was coming next. Flood incoming. Brace yourselves. That was all the warning that the marines got, as the snake quickly pointed its head towards Marineford. The snake seemed to start spitting out the contents of its stomach, creating a massive wave of boiling water that swallowed half of Marineford. The water seemed to break down the walls of Marineford rather quickly, the powerful stream swept away everything in its path. Sengoku used his massive body to create a shield for the marines behind him, blasting shockwave after shockwave into that tidal wave, but the tide didn't stop for anything. Kizaru tried to send explosive blasts toward the tide and the snake's head, only managing to halt it for a few milliseconds, as the jet stream of water blasted throughout the entire island. Akiji also got spat out in that attack, landing somewhere off to the side as the tides pushed against his body. But the second he was no longer in still water he started freezing the waters around him. This time, he did so successfully, managing to freeze most of the wave, and the snake that had created it. Akiji was a bit shocked at having succeeded, as he had expected Enel to melt his ice instantly again. But nothing had happened. The marines looked around as the tides around them seemed to die down, Sengoku broke some of the ice stuck to his body as he looked around in a rage. Where did he go? The fleet admiral asked as he looked at Kizaru. The light admiral simply shook his head, signaling that he had no clue either. And, just like that. All that the marines had gained in that war, was the giant ice sculpture of a snake, much larger than Marineford itself. POV narration Enel abandoned the snake's body as soon as the Whitebeard pirates got far enough from Marineford. It took everything from him to sometimes check on them, as controlling the large snake he had created was already taking up most of his concentration. Still, he had managed to do it in the end. Jormungandr was the name he had given to that move. It was extremely useful against a large number of enemies, but it didn't really have much of an effect on stronger people. Sengoku didn't have any issues with taking on the tides with his body, and most of the vice admirals and rear admirals could also easily withstand it as long as they had armament hockey. There was the issue of being washed into the sea and drowning, but this wasn't a problem for non-devil fruit users. Enel was now resting on a cloud, a bit further away from Marineford, that was about as far as he could make it. He had been injured that entire time, ever since the clash with Whitebeard, his hands had taken the worst beating in that war, he had used his staff to block attacks from many powerful marines. His leg was also most likely broken from Kizaru's kick, which Enel had honestly expected, so he couldn't complain. Getting Kizaru to kick him towards the snake was honestly the only way for him to enter it. 
the Light Admiral would have otherwise been able to stop him from entering it by constantly intercepting him. Not that he knew that Enel would just disappear in it. Still, Enel didn't even feel like he had enough energy to keep his eyes open, but he knew he couldn't fall asleep on a cloud. The only reason he could rest on one was that he had overcharged it and compressed it enough for him to sit on. Enel could feel his consciousness slipping, but he also knew that he couldn't exactly pass out that close to Marineford and above the sea. The sea would likely swallow him, and if the marines did find him he'd just be imprisoned. Still, he couldn't help it. The crippling exhaustion that filled his body. In a moment of carelessness, Enel's control on the cloud underneath him actually slipped, Enel scowled a bit as he was free-falling towards the sea. I didn't want to do this, but I guess I've no choice now. Just as he was about to turn into lightning, and use his greatest speed to fly off with his last sparks of stamina, he saw a blue figure quickly approaching him. It didn't even take a few seconds for him to be caught in a pair of talons, Enel looked up to see the face of a familiar blue phoenix with bored-looking round eyes. Are you alright, Enelioi? Marco said as he instantly turned back around and flew back towards their ships at the greatest speed he could muster, this time with Enel within his grasp. Been better. Enel said with a wry smile, he was a bit shocked to hear just how weak his voice sounded. The last thing Enel could remember was Marco's cheeky smile as he passed out. At least they won't be executing me. Enel thought to himself as his consciousness slipped. While the Whitebeard pirates were still fleeing, the marines were recovering from Enel's attack. Most of Marineford had been flooded, and they also had a lot of people to fish out of the waters and break out of Akiji's ice. Sengoku could feel a headache coming to him as he realized that their pathetic loss had all been televised to the world. Although he had asked for the broadcast to be stopped at some point, it still continued that some pirates had found the recording device pointing at the stage. Sengoku ripped some of his hair out in frustration as he tried to reason with himself, he could only find it in himself to blame one person for his failure. Enel. Whatever your reason was. I won't forgive you for this Sengoku's anger could hardly be quelled, Garp could only sigh as he took off his coat and started drying it off. That brat really went and did it, huh? The old man thought to himself, suppressing a smile as he realized that both of his grandsons had survived the ordeal. Akaina was surprisingly not as angry as Sengoku. The most prevalent emotion inside him was currently confusion. He simply refused to believe that Enel was a dirty criminal. He knew that the rear admiral had been temperamental and that he had always been a bit prone to insubordination. But Akainu also knew that Enel had a strong sense of justice, unwavering even, that thing one simply couldn't fake. Enel went out of his way to hunt pirates and even got into trouble with the world government in order to dispense justice. Akaina knew that Enel didn't gain anything from those situations, yet he still chose to put himself in them. Akainu had respected that part of Enel. Now he wasn't sure what to feel anymore. I will definitely be the one to catch him. He better have a good reason for this when I do. That was all he could think about as he huffed to himself. His thoughts were somewhat similar to that of Hina actually, who was just as confused and angry as him. She internally vowed to capture him and force his reasons out of him. She needed to find out. If all of it had been a lie, and if their friendship was also a lie. To her, it hadn't been one, but she couldn't be sure if it was the same for Enel anymore. Although the Marines had lost the war in its entirety, the world government had lost just as much. Not even a day passed since the war ended, and Sengoku was already replaced by Akainu, being forced to resign as the brunt of the mistakes was blamed on him. The Marines were also forced to start moving their main base the Holy Land Mary Geos, as Marine Ford needed to be completely rebuilt, and the world government decided to just move the Marine base closer to the Celestial Dragons. This had everything to do with the fact that Enel was still at large, and the five elders wanted to assure that the Celestial Dragons were well protected. Akainu was rather mad about that major change, but he couldn't exactly argue with the reasoning. The problem was, that now the brunt of the navy as an organization was delegated to protecting the world government in its entirety. Basically, everything above a rear admiral needed to protect the celestial dragons at all times and were ordered to be stationed inside the holy land at all times. This was done extremely quickly after the war, and the marines were still recovering, so no one had any time to dispute these orders. Still, Akaina wasn't stupid enough to not realize that many marines would likely be forced to resign. He had already been around plenty of celestial dragons, so he knew that they weren't going to be accommodating to others. 
but that problem would be addressed at another time. Right now, Akaina needed to handle the logistics of both moving their main base and recovering from the war at the same time. Surprisingly, Akiji decided not to put more salt on the wound and try to dispute Akainu's position. Instead, the Ice Admiral started helping Akainu with the paperwork. The world itself was shaken by the war. No one had expected things to go the way they had. Not only that, the entire world now knew that Portogast D. Ace was the last living blood relative of G.O.L.D., Roger. And, unlike his father, the Marines had completely failed to execute Ace, and his whereabouts were now completely unknown. Then there was Enel. The unranked admiral, as some had called him after the Dressrosa incident, was formally stripped of all of his achievements and rank. He was shunned by the world government for his efforts to save a pirate as vile as Roger's spawn. With this event, Enel had proven his strength to the world, striking fear in the hearts of many with the rise of yet another extremely dangerous pirate. With this, he also gained the full attention of the world government, becoming yet another enemy they had to worry about and take countermeasures against. POV narration The first thing Enel saw when he opened his eyes, was light. Then the light became stars, as more and more of them seemed to pop out around him. It didn't take long for Enel to realize that he hadn't actually woken up yet. Looking around, he could see many planets in the distance, many stars flowing in the rivers of the universe. But why was he dreaming about that? I never understood this. Why do humans feel the need to dream? Enel was shocked, instantly turning his head to the voice, he could see it, a pair of red eyes staring at him. Familiar, yet completely alien. Enel controlled his body, coming closer and closer to that voice until he could finally make it out. The form of a middle-aged man with black hair, a small stubble and deep red eyes. The man was also wearing a formal suit, looking like he was preparing to leave for a fancy party. Enel's eyes widened a bit as he recognized that form, how couldn't he? He had looked like that for most of his life. Why are you here? And why do you look like me? Enel asked as his face turned a bit grave. He didn't know what to expect for an answer, but he certainly hoped for something, anything. Like you. No no, you no longer look like this. You abandoned your old life, taking on a different form. The voice of the older man seemed to echo in the universe around them, as Enel narrowed his eyes at the strange god's proclamation. Enel looked at the god with a blank gaze, not knowing exactly what to say to that. I have always been curious about your species. I've failed to understand it even after so many years. What is, ambition? The god tilted his head once more, as its red eyes peered into Enel. Rather basic, that one. Ambition refers to one's strong desire to achieve something meaningful, to accomplish something great. Enel crossed his arms, deciding to humor the god in front of him. Not that he had many choices at hand. It was either that or try to run away, which didn't even seem like an option, honestly. Basic indeed. Simple-minded and strange to hear from someone like you. The god seemed unimpressed with the answer, which made Enel scowl a bit. What do you want me to say? That's the literal definition of it. What do I want you to say? Hmm. My bad, I guess I should have worded that better. What is, ambition, to you? The god's eyes sparked a bit, Enel stared at his former body's emotionless face for a bit. I forgot this thing can read my thoughts. Ambition is what drives me forward, Enel's words were stopped instantly, as he instinctively felt something grip his heart. It was as if his heart was placed in a vice, and Enel could feel himself squirming. Don't. Lie. To. Me. The god said without any change in expression. Ambition doesn't mean anything. Nothing more than a way to trick yourself that you are doing something meaningful with your time. Enel ended up saying as he clutched his chest a bit. Saying exactly what the god wanted to hear, regardless of what he felt. Indeed. You know that. You are smart. Nothing that you do will ever have any effect on the world, all humans always end up as nothing more than buried bones. So why bother with all this? Images started flashing around Enel when the god said that, memories of his time in the world of One Piece. From helping the sky people indirectly to joining the marines, freeing Dressrosa and eventually betraying the marines. All of those scenes passed by as Enel looked on with a raised eyebrow. That I wanted to do it either due to curiosity or to achieve something. 
or due to rage and other emotions. Enel said as he looked over the strips of memories that surrounded him. So strange. I don't remember you being so. Impulsive? The god said as a smile cracked on its face. You never knew me that well, I guess. Most of what I used to do was on impulse. It's the same for most humans. Enel said as looked at the memories vanishing around him, revealing the stars once more. Humans are so weird. The god said before shaking its head. Enel just scowled again, he opened his mouth, hoping to get to ask some questions of his own. The main one on his mind was, what did you do to my soul? The god could clearly hear his thoughts, but it also certainly didn't care to answer. I guess I should get to the real question. Why are you here? The god tilted its head, Enel could see its humanoid neck crack. Its eyes seemed to retract inside its head, revealing two black holes emptily staring at Enel. A strange black sludge seemed to start spilling out of its mouth, eye holes and quickly cracking skin. Enel tried to move, but he simply couldn't control his body. The sludge quickly filled all of the space around him, as his vision became more and more blurry with each second that passed. The next second, he forced his eyes open, shooting up from his bed in a panic as he took in deep breaths. He managed to calm down rather quickly, as the air filling his lungs managed to cool down his head as well. And just like that, I'm back, huh? Enel looked around the room, he could see that he was in a small room, most likely on Whitebeard's ship. Why was I even there in the first place? Still, Enel knew that he wouldn't gain anything by simply pondering on that forever. He had other things to do currently. The good sign was that he wasn't wearing any cuffs slash wasn't restrained in any way. I guess I managed to befriend them in the end. Still, I can't make it seem like this was my goal originally. It would certainly make things worse. Enel looked to the side, his white staff and golden gauntlets seemed to be leaning on a wall nearby. The doctor probably took them off him at some point. His clothes were also folded and placed near his bed. Both of his arms had been broken in the war, but Enel knew he'd survive. His leg was also bandaged, thankfully it wasn't anywhere near as battered as his arms were. The first thing Enel did was to get up and put his shirt back on, rolling up its sleeves in the process. He no longer had a jacket, as that had been ripped to pieces at some point during the scuffle. His marine coat was still there, a bit tattered, but Enel decided to wear it for now, as it had somewhat become part of his style. The next thing he did was to put the gauntlets on his damaged hands, tightening them as much as possible to keep his bones arranged at all times. Then he ended up putting the staff on his back. Enel walked out of the room, and onto the deck. Opening the door with one of his earlobes as his arms hung limply to his sides. They were currently on the high seas. Enel could hear shouts and music all around him, pirates dancing and drinking. They had successfully escaped. That much was obvious. The pirates seemed to notice him leaving his room, they seemed to still be a bit weary of him, but not to the point where they'd stop partying. Enelioi. Good to see you're up. Pops was calling for you. Marco walked over to Enel while drinking from a sake bottle directly. Sure thing. The former rear admiral said as he started walking towards the figurehead of the ship, where he could feel the large man resting. Whitebeard was bandaged up all over, as he had also sustained plenty of injuries, he was also hooked up to various tubes due to his illness, but that didn't seem to stop him from drinking sake directly from a barrel. Whitebeard smiled a bit when seeing Enel approaching him, most of his crew members made way for Enel, looking at him with a bit of fear. The captains didn't seem scared though, they were mostly just looking at Enel with some wariness. But, at this point, none of them would even attempt to stop him from approaching their father. Everyone had seen Enel protecting Whitebeard during the war. Both from the Marines and from Blackbeard's crew. At this point, thinking that Enel wanted to harm Whitebeard would be rather strange. Enel. Glad to see you moving around already. Whitebeard said with a wide smile. It was clear that the old man didn't mind being able to still party with his children, as opposed to being killed in the war. Yeah, my arms are still broken thanks to you. But I'll be fine. Enel said as he waved one of his earlobes around. They would act as his limbs until his actual hands healed. Good thing they were long enough to go to his waist. Gururara. Whitebeard laughed loudly, slapping his knee as his laugh then turned into a coughing fit. Might want to take it slowly on the drinking, old man. 
you're already injured and sickly enough. Enel said as he made a chair with his staff and sat down with his legs crossed in front of the large pirate. Don't tell me what to do now, this is a joyous occasion. Newgate said as he smiled and took another sip from his barrel. I guess a bit of celebration never hurt anybody, Enel said as he arched his earlobes, making it look like he was shrugging with them. Ace is safe, I am still alive enough to enjoy the company of my children. Things couldn't have been better, honestly. The legendary pirate spoke while looking at his crew with a tired gaze. This, this entire celebration, it's only happening thanks to you. Whitebeard put down his barrel for a second, looking Enel in the eye as his face turned a bit serious. I had stepped on that field prepared to lose my life. Actually, returning was never a possibility in my mind. The old man rubbed one of his knees while sighing a bit. Enel let him speak, also a bit curious about what his thoughts were but also knowing that it would be rude to interrupt the old man. I was convinced that I would die either to the marines or to teach when he appeared. But it seems that fate had other plans. Whitebeard picked his barrel back up, taking another sip. I don't know what your purpose was, or why you helped us the way you did. But, I have you to thank for the smiles that my children are currently displaying. Whitebeard continued to speak, as Enel heaved a sigh. I guess I should try to make my true intentions a bit more transparent, POV narration and so, Enel looked at the old pirate for a few seconds. Then he opened his mouth and started speaking. Honestly, at first I only wanted to protect Luffy. Enel said as he stretched his earlobe and grabbed a bottle of sake for himself. I could tell. That kid certainly has a way with people, huh? Whitebeard said with a smile of his own. Heh, yeah, that much is obvious, isn't it? Enel said as he raised his bottle with his earlobe and took another sip. But I was also doing good old Garp a favor. You could probably tell from the way he let Luffy pass him by, but he really wanted Ace to survive that. Enel said as he looked a bit at the sea, catching a glimpse of the sunset in the distance. Whitebeard nodded a bit, he knew just how tough the marine hero was. Luffy had no hope of actually downing him as he was now. I can understand that. But how'd you end up betraying the marines completely and even helping me? Whitebeard raised an eyebrow while asking that question. He wasn't about to start accusing his benefactor, but Enel's actions did deserve to be at least somewhat questioned. Meh, in for a penny, in for a pound, I figured, Enel said as he shrugged his earlobes again, spilling a few drops of sake on the deck for Whitebeard just looked confused, not really understanding the idiom that Enel was trying to use. Basically, if I'm already doing it, might as well go all out. I betrayed the marines the second I got in front of a kainu. At that point, making an enemy out of you and your crew wouldn't have really helped me in any way. That I can understand that, Whitebeard said as he took another sip of his barrel. But, at the same time. You could have easily let me die, and give the marines some semblance of victory in this war, my children wouldn't have any right to accuse you, as you had saved Ace. Whitebeard said as his eyes narrowed a bit. Maybe. But letting you die simply no longer made any sense at that point. You should be well aware that I've not been a marine for long. Not exactly accustomed to all of their rules yet. Enel just had a wry smile on his face, as he wondered if Whitebeard would believe him in the end. Whitebeard looked at Enel for a bit, his narrowed eyes studying the former rear admiral for a few seconds. In the end, the old pirate simply started laughing out loud. Guerrero Rara, ending in yet another coughing fit, that had the party momentarily stop, as all of the crew members looked at Newgate with a worried gaze. Maybe you shouldn't be fighting this much at your age. You sound like you're close to coughing your lungs out. Enel said as he intertwined his earlobes in a similar manner in which he would usually cross his arms. Shut it brat. I'm still healthy enough to punch you to the bottom of the sea. Whitebeard said with renowned energy, making Enel sweat a bit. Ha. Huh. What's with this silence? Bring me more sake. The party restarted in that instant, with Whitebeard's children quickly bringing him another barrel and returning to dancing around on the deck. Where the hell do these pirates get this much energy? Enel could remember the celebration they had in Dress Rosa, that was so much tamer compared to the party the pirates were throwing among each other. By the way, Whitebeard. Where are Ace and Luffy? Figured they'd be traveling with you. Enel said as he also fetched himself yet another drink. Ace and his brother are probably still with the doctor. He came at the perfect moment, 
it's also difficult for the Marines to catch a submarine, Enelioi, Marco came along this time, giving an answer rather swiftly. It doesn't matter where Ace is. As long as he is safe, I am content. Whitebeard said his lips turned upwards, forming a wide smile. Indeed. As long as they are safe I also don't particularly care. I'm sure Garp feels the same. Enel took another sip of his drink, looking at Marco for a few seconds. By the way, are you going to keep wearing the coat? Whitebeard asked with a wry smile while staring at Enel's back. I guess not. I'll have to get another one, not marine sanctioned. Enel looked at the epaulets that adorned each of his shoulders. He blinked for a few seconds, before reaching out to them and ripping them off his coat. Better than throwing it away, I guess. Enel said as he simply threw the epaulets overboard, not giving them even a second glance. No, it's really tattered. You might want to go shopping for some new clothes, honestly Yoai. Marco said with a small laugh. Enel just stared at him with narrowed eyes, before simply shrugging his earlobes and going back to drinking. Partying for a few days and recovering with the Whitebeard Pirates doesn't sound so bad. And, just like that, Enel had a set course for the following days. He proceeded to get completely shit-faced and dance around with the crew. Not one person looked at him with weariness after he spoke with Whitebeard. Now he was just like a regular friend. After all, he had saved Whitebeard and Ace, he was as good as family to them now. Eventually, a bird came around and delivered the newspaper. It was a huge hit piece on Enel basically. The world government had certainly tried their best to paint Enel worse and worse with each article. A page in the newspaper was rather interesting though, and Enel had apparently gained an epithet to go with it. Much like Kaido was called the King of the Beasts, and Charlotte Lin Lin was called Big Mom or Queen of Tato Land. Enel became known as the Sky King Enel. The photo captured of him was also rather fitting. With him just sitting on a cloud, cross legged with his staff over one of his shoulders, with a sparking gauntlet palm pointing towards the ground, a lazy gaze and a slight smile on his face. His bounty was not low, not by any stretch of the imagination. Befitting his epithet, he received the bounty of three billion berry, wanted dead, not alive. Becoming the first man to receive such a major bounty on his first evaluation. To preserve their reputation, the world government would have done everything possible to hide Enel's betrayal and hunt him down covertly. But since everything was televised, they weren't able to do anything about it. Now, instead of being called the unranked admiral, the newspaper started calling him the unranked emperor. Many large figures and powerful pirates wanted to mock the decision of the press, to call Enel a Yonko. But when seeing the footage of Enel holding back the entirety of the navy, as well as footage of Jormungand, those critics were silenced rather quickly. The betrayal of Enel was quickly dramatized beyond imagination, as the world government worked overnight to vilify Enel as much as possible. Although he was called both the unranked emperor and the rookie emperor, it didn't seem that the government had given him the title officially though. Everyone seemed rather shocked about it, but Enel didn't seem to care that much. The Whitebeard pirates could only laugh when seeing the half-drunk Enel wipe his nose with the newspaper and throw it overboard. The rest of the world was still shaking though. When the news reached Big Mom's territory, plenty of people had different reactions. Big Mom didn't seem all that surprised, she also didn't seem to care much about fighting Enel. The reveal of his Goro Goro Nomi did surprise her a bit and rouse her curiosity, but not to the point where she would want to meet him again. Katakuri was shocked though, realizing that it was likely a good thing Enel didn't fight them that day, as many of his siblings would have certainly died. Oven wasn't exactly shocked per se, he just felt that the world government was being really scummy about the way they portrayed Enel. He already knew the former rear admiral personally, so he knew what type of person Enel was. Still, Enel's jacked bounty only made him want to grow even stronger. He didn't let that dissuade him one bit. He was already a wanted criminal, so he had no qualms about befriending Enel. But the Rico royal family was a bit different. All of them were shocked by that turn of events. They all knew Enel, and they didn't buy the story about him being some cold-blooded animal. But the fact that he had become such a high-profile criminal was concerning. Viola wasn't exactly shocked by him being able to become an emperor in the public eye, as she already knew he was strong. But she also knew he wasn't a criminal, which confused her quite a bit. In the end, she, as well as the rest of her family, could only hope that Enel would visit them and explain things at some point. 
the Straw Hats also had various reactions to that news. Most of them were rather focused on the fact that their captain's brother was to be executed. Many of them remembered Enel, even Frankie, and Brooke had heard about him at some point. Either from Luffy, talking about his long years, or from Sanji, talking about his speed. All of them had received the message from their captain though, that they'd have to meet again in two years. And, seeing the recording and photos of the Marineford War managed to light a fire underneath them. Zoro especially. If I want to be of assistance to Luffy in the future. I can't afford to be this weak. Zoro was affected quite a bit by the way Kuma had managed to dispatch them on the Sabaity Archipelago. Now he had also caught a glimpse of just how overwhelming fights at the top level were. If I truly want to be the right hand of the king, then I need to grow stronger. Much stronger. Sanji also had similar thoughts, he was one of the crew's main fighters, despite being the cook. He had already been humbled once by Enel during their visit to the Sky Islands, but actually seeing how strong the top powers of the world were, made him feel strangely inadequate. Therefore, he knew that he would need to become a lot stronger if he wanted to be able to protect his friends. His sentiments were mirrored by the majority of the Straw Hats. All of them wanting to become better in order to be able to help Luffy achieve his goals. POV Enel After a few days of celebration, I also started getting tired. The Whitebeard Pirates seem to still be going strong, but I do need to take a break and think about my next steps. I have plenty of things I wish to accomplish. But I also have a lot of time from now on. Nothing is rushing me as gaining allies was the most important part of my plan at first. Getting a bounty on my head was somewhat expected. I didn't think it would be that high, but I guess it does make sense. It's not really just about betraying the marines and fighting the navy forces, not even me saving Whitebeard is that important to them. The old guy would just die of his sickness in a year or two. The gravest thing I've done was save Ace during this war. The world government had set up that huge spectacle with Sengoku revealing Ace's identity with the sole purpose to execute him and make a statement that the age of pirates was over. I remember Whitebeard ruining that by shouting that the One Piece was true in the original, but that is no longer needed. The navy, and by extension the world government, suffered massive losses and both reputation and influence from this event. If anything, the navy's grip somewhat weakening due to this war will only create more pirates. I'm sure Sengoku did envision the possibility of losing the war, so the world government surely has some tricks up their sleeve and some countermeasures to combat the rise in piracy. Now that I think about it, I think they are trying to turn me into a detrimental factor for pirates. A new possible Yonko Rising, one that loathes both pirates and marines equally. That's how they titled me and what type of propaganda they're spreading. They think that another possible Yonko that hates pirates might dissuade idiots from throwing themselves at the sea in hopes of riches and fame. That's just a stupid assumption to make. In truth, most Yonkos couldn't care less about other pirates, as long as they don't interfere with whatever business they happen to run. If anything, making me an emperor will just inspire more people to become pirates and challenge me. As is the case for all of the other's emperors. Weaklings will either challenge me or beg to join my crew. So, this might be the government shooting themselves in the foot. Or not really. It's easy for a CP0 agent to slip into my crew if I get a surplus of new recruits. That's likely what they're hoping would happen. Honestly, I might not even get that many challenges, I'm not even an official, Yonko. They'd have to change the name if they were to also give me a similar title. After all, Yonko refers to the, Four Emperors. Newgate might not have a lot of time left, but he's still around, so there are already four of them. So, although the world government are spreading propaganda about me being a Yonko, they haven't actually given me that title officially, and probably won't, ever. To be fair, acknowledging the existence of yet another threat to their influence and power to the world publicly after such a huge failure in the war is likely not something that they can afford to do. Right now, I'm just considered a powerful and vile criminal. Being called a possible emperor only refers to my strength. Still, I could likely force their hand to change the Yanko into the Godii, five emperors. I'd have to swallow up some territory in the new world, and I'd basically have a foothold to call myself one. Problem is that I also don't really have any crew. Without a crew, I may be strong, but I won't be able to stretch my influence endlessly if I only have my own strength to rely on. Regardless, I don't really care about becoming an emperor or recruiting a pirate crew for now. 
getting a bounty of 3 billion is already enough for me. Now, after the war, my original plan was to try and see how I'd get into contact with the Revolutionary Army. I think I can remember their base being at Baltigo, they also don't exactly recruit people as freely as the Marines do. If they did, then they'd honestly just be filled with CP agents. The actual kicker is that the location of Baltigo is not known to anyone outside the Revolutionary Army. So if I want to find it, I'd have to first try to contact them covertly. Regardless, I could have thought of ways to get in touch with them. Tracking down Ivankov after the war wouldn't have been impossible. But, right now I also feel the need to look into souls a bit more. I can't exactly pretend that my conqueror's hockey situation doesn't bother me. That god seemed awfully interested in me, so I need to find out more about it. The god seemed able to visit me in my dreams. But I am starting to think that it doesn't have as much influence over the world physically. Can't be too sure, but I think it would have gotten in the way of a few of my plans if it could. It seems to have a path that it wants me to take. For some reason, that god also has something against humans. I even needed to play by its rules and say whatever it wanted to hear while in that dream, but lying to a god is difficult, especially when said god can read your thoughts. Maybe this world holds some knowledge regarding that. Where do I even start though? There are plenty of religions in this world. I'd need to have access to a huge library if I wanted to look into more of them. Even then, there is no guarantee that I'd find anything. I think the best course of action for me would still be to touch up with the Revolutionary Army. I think I have the perfect ticket to get them too. But I also have another small nuisance to deal with first. Well, good thing I have the time to deal with everything. POV narration with his next steps thought up, Enel finally went to sleep for a bit more. This time everything was normal, he didn't dream. He simply rested his eyes and woke up in the morning. At this point, the Whitebeard pirates were also sleeping by the hundreds. Enel tiptoed around the pirates laying and sleeping on the deck of his ship, heading for Whitebeard. After all, it was rude for a guest to leave without letting the host know. Edward Newgate was awake, an early bird by the looks of it. The old man also looked at Enel as if he had been expecting the former rear admiral to show up. Figured you'd show up. You seemed the type to leave the party early in the morning. Whitebeard said with a wide smile. Heh, I don't want to hear that. You people have way too much energy. Seriously, for an old guy on his deathbed, you sure have a lot more stamina than me. Enel simply shook his head, which made the old man chuckle a bit. Deathbed or not, I am still Whitebeard. Though. I probably don't have much time left. Whitebeard looked at his crewmates, his children, all sprawled on the ground, likely all suffering from alcohol poisoning of varying severity. Enel, I'll be honest with you. I don't even know if I'll get to see you again in this life of mine. Newgate's voice was resolute, no trace of fear for his imminent doom was to be found. I want you to know. That you can rely on my children in the future, for anything. Here, a piece of Marco's Viva card. If you need help, get in touch with him. Whitebeard handed Enel a small piece of paper, the former rear admiral looked at it for a bit and stuffed it in his pocket. Enel raised an eyebrow at that. It was his goal to have the Whitebeard pirates as allies. But he didn't expect to hear those words directly from the captain's mouth. Don't you dare take advantage of them though. I'll rise out of my grave and beat you to death if you do. Enel just sweated a bit at that. The old guy still has some spunk in him. He isn't called the strongest for no reason, I guess. Don't worry. I hopefully won't ever need help with anything. But I'll remember your words in the future. Enel simply shook his head in the end, as his body slowly started floating. It was nice meeting you, old man. I hope our paths cross again in the future, if not then it was an honor to get drunk alongside you these past few days. Enel said with a smile. Gururara. Who got drunk? I only remember you passing out. Whitebeard slapped his knee as he started laughing, waking up some of his children in the process, all of which seemed to have a hangover. I don't appreciate the slander. I only fell asleep momentarily. Underneath the table. Enel said as he crossed his arms in indignation. Heh, buzz off, you brat. Whitebeard said as he waved his hand a bit. Enel simply smiled, turning into a bolt of lightning and rushing into the clouds. Whitebeard looked at the sky with a smile. 
Pops, did Enno leave? He didn't even say goodbye to Mayoi. Marco woke up and said while blinking a few times in tiredness. Go back to sleep you brats. We all know you don't like mornings. Whitebeard said as he stared at his children with a smile on his lips. Enel. It doesn't matter if you are to face the world, I'll make sure you are not alone. Just like you made sure I'd be able to spend my last days with my children. POV narration Enel traveled from cloud to cloud, looking for his destination. The first thing he quickly needed to do, was to look for a certain pirate. Jeweler Ibani was technically not supposed to be kidnapped anymore, but Enel wanted to make sure nothing bad would happen. Blackbeard was dead, but Enel also knew that Bonnie was far from being prepared to venture into the new world, much like the rest of the worst generation. He knew that, as long as she was allowed to roam around the world freely, then the world government had the possibility to get their hands on her. He simply couldn't allow something like that to happen, so he simply started jumping from cloud to cloud, heading directly towards the beginning of the new world. Enel spent a few hours traveling like that, he sunk a few pirate ships out of boredom, sniping them with lightning from the clouds. In the end, he finally caught sight of Jewelry Bonnie, surprisingly though, she was not on her own ship. Bonnie had set sail with her crew right after watching the war from Sabaeti Archipelago. She had thankfully managed to hide from the marines that had stormed the island after Luffy's attack on a celestial dragon. She also got to experience the war in all of its glory, finding out more about how strong people could get in the world. Despite her age and fruit, she was still not that accustomed to the world's powers. She knew about them, but she had rarely gotten to see them in action. Still, she felt that she was prepared to go further into the new world, to grow stronger in her journey. Unfortunately for her, the timing she chose couldn't have been worse, as the marines were currently moving base to Mary Geos, which just so happened to be extremely close to Sabaeti. The moment she set sail, she was quickly followed by four different marine warships kicked to sail on the comm belt at speeds far greater than her own ship. She also had just gotten her ship coated, and a stray cannonball from a marine ship had both ruined her coating and made her completely unable to go to Fishman Island by extension. She could only curse loudly as she was forced to sail further and further into the new world, going in blind as the marine ships seemed to trail closely behind her. And, suddenly, just when she thought they had a chance to escape, another ship came along, right in front of her. Being disoriented by the odd weather of the Grand Line, and not having a set direction she could go towards, she had ended up going somewhat towards the former marine base, Marine Ford. And, just as she was shouting orders to turn the ship around, the entire sea froze solid, completely trapping her ship as a tall figure started making its way towards her ship. Fuck me this isn't happening. Bonnie could instantly recognize the person. It was none other than Akiji, the admiral that had played a huge role during Marineford, also considered the one to have managed to stop the Sky King's devastating attack on the marine base. Akiji was credited as the one to have routed Enel during the war, but the ice admiral knew better, as he had been completely unable to freeze the snake and had even gotten trapped within it. However, the rest of the world didn't need to know that. The world government did their best to rationalize that the marines had done fought the hardest during the war and that the pirates had escaped through sheer luck. Making Akiji the hero of said war was a way to take some attention away from the fact that it was a complete loss for the marines. Still, now Bonnie had to somehow face off against the supposed hero of the summit war, who also happened to be an admiral and someone that could freeze the sea instantly. The situation developed about as most people would have expected it to. Akiji froze most of her crew alive and captured her, as she was a special prisoner that was only wanted alive by the world government. Bonnie was brought on the ship, guarded by Akiji as they started making their way for the holy land of the celestial dragons once more. That was about the time Enel flew into the frame, zipping around in the clouds as he observed the situation below him. He could tell that Akiji was present, but beside him, there were also a few rear admirals and even two vice admirals. There were also four other warships nearby, which were turning away to continue heading for Mary Geos. Enel decided on a course of action rather quickly. I can't let the world government get their hands on her. He quickly turned into a bolt of lightning and hit their bowsprit directly, breaking it off completely as Enel stepped onto the deck with a calm smile. The marines were immediately alarmed, as there were not even any storm clouds around when the lightning hit their ship. The actual panic set in when seeing who had attacked them. Its former Rear Admiral Enel. 
many of the marines had yet to start calling Enel by his epithet of Sky King. The betrayal was still fresh, and many had considered him a true marine in the short time he had been with them. Seeing him freely attack a marine warship right after Marineford was not something they had expected. It also wasn't something anyone on board wanted. The marines quickly formed a circle around Enel, grasping at their weapons in desperation, as Enel simply smiled at them. Even the rear admirals panicked in the same way as the regular soldiers, only the vice admirals and Akiji himself were keeping their cool. He must want something. Akiji stepped forward, raising his arm and signaling his men to back off for now. Sky King Enel. To what do we owe the pleasure? At this point, Akiji knew that fighting Enel while at sea was simply impossible. A stray lighting beam from Enel would likely sink their ship instantly. They were in the middle of the sea, Akiji was rather confident in fighting Enel, as he was an admiral. But he knew his crewmates would almost likely die in the process. Wanting to save his crew, Akiji decided to take a diplomatic approach for now. Akiji, great to see you again, actually. Enel said as he patted the dust off of his clothes and tattered cape. As you might have guessed, I am here because I need something from this ship, Enel said as he crossed his arms and looked at the marines with a smile. Akiji could tell that Enel's words were rousing anger in the marines around them, many of them felt that Enel shouldn't even have the guts to show up near the marines anymore, seeing him come to them and ask for something felt insulting to them. Akiji didn't seem bothered by it, he just hoped that the rest of the marines wouldn't act in anger and get themselves killed. Although the world government didn't like to admit it, Enel was currently an emperor. So Akiji knew he needed to handle the situation delicately. They simply couldn't afford a war with Enel so soon after Marineford. And what might that be? We aren't carrying any special cargo to speak of. Akiji said as he realized that Enel was most likely referring to Jewel Ribani, the woman that the world government wanted for undisclosed reasons. Oh, no need to be coy about it, Akiji. Bonnie comes with me, and I'll leave you all alone. That's it, I don't need anything more and I don't want to kill anyone to prove a point. Enel said as he sighed a bit. He hoped that his request would be fulfilled, but he knew that it was unlikely judging by the reactions of the marines around Akiji. Fine, surprisingly, the ice admiral agreed instantly, shocking his subordinates instantly. A Admiral Akiji. We can't accept the demands of this criminal. A rear admiral said as he looked at Enel with pure anger in his gaze. Yais. He has no right to ask us for anything. More and more marines joined in, voicing their distaste for Akiji's decision. Honestly, if any other of the admirals were here, they would have fought Enel without caring about the rest of the crew. But Akiji also didn't happen to put a lot of value on the request of the five elders to bring Bonnie in. To him, giving a pirate with a low bounty away for the life of his crewmates was a great trade-off. But still, with so many people voicing out their distaste, they were at an impasse. Akiji sweated a bit as he wondered what to do next. POV narration The marines around Enel were getting rowdier and rowdier by the second. Enel himself was starting to wonder if a fight was truly unavoidable at that point. Well, a fight wouldn't be a good term for it. Akiji himself was preparing to freeze the sea around them once more, to prevent any of his men from drowning after Enel sunk their ship. In the end, Enel decided to remind the marines that he wasn't exactly a pirate they could afford to fight with so little preparation. He simply clapped his gauntlet hands together with a smile, as the clouds released a large lighting laser towards the sea extremely close to the ship. The lightning seemed to strike the sea with anger, the sea themselves roared, as if in pain. Great waves rose and pushed the marine warship to the side, shaking every marine on board as they all struggled to hold on to something. The lightning beam was large, and it was visible from far in the distance, which also made the other warships turn around, Enel paid them no mind though, as they were too far away to reach him in time. Enel stood straight as the entire ship shook, the seas weren't calming down at all, a large hole was left in the sea, and water quickly started filling it in, the sea was healing fast, but that healing created a huge whirlpool. Enel didn't react much, but Akiji simply crouched down a bit, ice seemed to extend from the spot he touched and over the railing, rather quickly, the entire whirlpool was frozen, and their ship was completely stuck. The marines aboard could finally take a breather and relax a bit, at least for a few microseconds, until they realized that the one that caused such a phenomenon was still on their ship. Don't make this more difficult than it has to be. 
Enel said as he stared at the flabbergasted marines, as his bored expression didn't change one bit. After all, Enel originally could throw around lightning beams like that effortlessly, now he also had a lot more stamina thanks to his consistent training. This much wasn't even close to a warm-up for Enel, but at sea it was enough to take out just about anyone. Still, although he was now considered a criminal, Enel was not quite keen on injuring the marines. Most of them didn't exactly deserve to die, at least in his eyes. The ones that indiscriminately killed and enslaved civilians on the world government's orders were a different breed, but Enel knew that it wasn't fair to all marines if he put them all in the same basket. The marines were mostly silent now, many of them pondering whether or not they would be able to survive that type of attack. They had all remembered Enel being powerful from the war, as the events were still fresh on their mind. Still, all of them were confident in facing Enel, they had quite a few high-ranking marines with them, but that wasn't the biggest reason. The biggest reason why the marines had been confident enough to speak up was that Akiji was also there with them. The Ice Admiral was considered the hero of the summit war, having been the one that routed Enel in the end and forced him to retreat. The problem with that logic was that they were assuming Enel was truly trying his best during that war. After all, Enel had many tricks up his sleeve, many of them were deadlier than what the marines had seen at Marineford. A good example of that would have been if Enel used the attack he had used on Jack the Draft. If he had used that in Marineford, most of the marines there would have died, if not all of them. Even the strong ones were unlikely to survive. A ball of plasma of that size was a rather good replacement for the sun, the heat contained within that sphere would have burnt most of the people unable to escape it alive, but the radiation it would have released might have made Marine Ford unlivable afterwards too. But Enel hadn't exactly used any deadly attacks in the war, at least not against the Marines. Enel still considered some of the people there his friends, so he wasn't about to start killing people all willy-nilly. But, if he needed to kill a few Marines to get his hands on Bonnie, then he was forced to do so. Her devil fruit was simply too strong for him to allow her to be captured by the world government for even a short while. Akiji was the only person that was able to keep his cool, once more. He already knew that fighting Enel at sea was suicide. The Ice Admiral was a bit glad that Enel hadn't just directly sunk them to the bottom of the sea and retrieved that special prisoner. Very well. Now that the Marines were silent, Akiji simply accepted the former Rear Admiral's demands. Not like he had any other choice. Glad we could come to an agreement. Bring the pirate here, and I'll just take my leave with her. Enel then simply sat down on the railing of the deck and crossed his legs. Akiji didn't take his gaze away from Enel for one second, only signaling a marine with his hand to bring the prisoner to them. The atmosphere was tense, no one spoke a word, and the marines no longer tried to protest the situation either, even after calming down a bit. Enel's earlobes swayed from side to side as he hummed a bit, breaking the atmosphere for a second as he looked at the frozen sea around them. I guess you guys will be stuck here for a few minutes. Enel said as he laughed a bit at how strained the atmosphere was and how most of the marines were looking at him like he was a weirdo. We'll manage. Akiji said as he narrowed his eyes a bit. He had heard that Enel had an odd sense of humor, so he at least knew that Enel hadn't really been acting when in the marines. I'm sure you will. How are Sengoku and Garp? I've not really been able to contact them since the war, I was rather tired after all. Enel said as a smile stretched on his face. Akiji was becoming more and more confused with the conversation, not really understanding what Enel was after. I don't Akiji opened his mouth, only to stop himself and sigh a bit as he remembered that Enel was supposedly their friend. They are fine. The two of them are fine. He ended up saying while looking away from Enel for a bit. You're lying, aren't you? Enel tilted his head a bit, his eyes sparkling a bit as he started thinking about what the world government was doing. Akiji simply sighed. Maybe he can actually be of help. The Ice Admiral thought to himself as he turned around for a bit. All of you. Get to your jobs. I'll speak to Enel in private for a bit. Akiji shouted as the marines around quickly scrambled, giving Enel one last suspicious look before they ran in different directions. The higher-ranking marines also walked off, giving both Akiji and Enel an odd look as they departed. Akiji then turned back to Enel, looking the former rear admiral in the eye as he took off his sunglasses and started speaking in a serious tone. Bad news, and bad news only. I won't waste your time too much. 
Akiji said as he took off his round sunglasses and stared at Enel with a serious gaze. Sengoku is fine, for the most part. He just lost his position and the five elders no longer trust him. Akiji said as he walked a bit closer to Enel, checking his surroundings for a bit before he finally spoke again. Garp, however, received the short end of the stick. Enel started paying attention at about that point, looking at Akiji with a raised eyebrow. I'm not going to like this. Am I? POV Enel, Garp got the short end of the stick, metaphorically speaking. Akiji said as he looked around for a bit. I don't think I like where this is going. I said as I crossed my still injured arms. You're not going to, especially if your relationship with Garp is truly as good as rumored. Akiji seemed quite angry himself, as he seemed to grit his teeth a bit before continuing. As soon as the war ended, the world government looked for someone to pin the blame on. At this point, my smile has turned upside down completely. I think I get where this is going. It's come out now, that Garp had been the one to shelter Ace after he was born. This is only known internally by a few people at the top. It seems this has been known for a while now, but everyone thought this execution would wash away those sins, as the world government didn't want to ruin the image of the marine hero. I can feel my eyes widening involuntarily from the bullshit that I am hearing. Now, as we are speaking, Garp should be heading for Impel Down in a special ship, being transported by the strongest CP0 agents that the world government has. How the no, I guess it would make sense for them to keep a close eye on Garp. They must have found out about Ace at some point, but couldn't get rid of him without going against Garp. The second Ace became a pirate, Garp could no longer protect him. Guess it was just written in the stars at that point. Now that I think about it. The title of Marine Hero is a really big one, we're talking about the person credited with catching most of the highest ranking pirates of his era, including the Pirate King himself. But Garp had never been awfully loyal to the world government and its ideals. He only cared about propagating his own justice, and he abhorred the celestial dragons at the same time. The government must have been at a loss regarding what to do with Garp. Now this situation gave them the leeway to get rid of a nuisance. Not only that, the war gave them the opportunity to create another hero. Akiji. I think I get the picture. I said as Akiji also nodded. He didn't resist arrest, he probably hopes that Sengoku will be able to bail him out. But Sengoku has lost all of his influence with the government after the war. Akiji seemed to clench his fists, I have never actually seen this guy so angry in the show, it is actually somewhat refreshing. Akainu has been trying his best to convince the elders to reconsider. But it seems that the influence of the marines, in general, fell a lot in the eyes of the world government. Our hands are simply tied. I think I get why this situation is so frustrating for him. After all, I can barely contain myself from just storming the holy land and frying alive everything with a pulse. I can't just do that though. Who knows what aces they have hidden up their sleeves. If it was that simple I'm sure the revolutionary army and dragon would have stormed it by now. Hell, even Kaido would have taken them down by now if it was that easy. I need to think of something to bail Garp out to now. He will certainly not be made a slave in the Holy Land. The old guy would likely rage and kill everything in sight if that were to happen. Merely going to prison for a bit won't affect him much. I doubt the world government can afford to announce Garp's imprisonment publicly though. First, I'll have to finish the task at hand. POV narration, I understand. I wasn't expecting to hear this type of news today. But I guess I should have expected something like this to happen. Enel said as his earlobe swayed in the wind. The former rear admiral calmed down the rage inside of him. There was no use in blaming himself and there was no point in blaming the situation. What he needed to do was to prove to the world government that making a move on Garp was a huge mistake. In truth, the situation was rather desperate for the marines now. Even the usually callous Akainu was stressed by how things were developing. He may not have placed all that much value on the lives of his fellow marines, but Garp was a symbol of unwavering justice whose mere presence on the battlefield could skyrocket the morale of all troops present. Akainu could also tell that the world government was trying to make Akiji the replacement, but he also knew that a replacement for Garp was simply impossible. The second the rest of the navy found out, it would spark a revolt. A huge one. It would likely raise an internal conflict large enough to collapse the navy completely. 
The fanatics of the world government would always stick to it, there may have been quite a few in the marines, but even they would likely question that decision. Akainu instantly realized that Garp's imprisonment was simply never going to be announced to the world. Officially he was simply retiring, making way for the new generation. The world government was simply trying to fade him out. That realization made Akainu break his desk in anger, and Sengoku was far worse. The old fleet admiral was prepared to completely resign and storm impel down himself. Akainu managed to calm him down, hoping to still solve the situation diplomatically. But they both knew the chances of that happening were infinitesimal. Akainu did have an idea eventually though. How about we just ask Enel to do it? They knew Enel was friends with Garp still, Garp hadn't been all that serious fighting him in the war and Enel also hadn't really injured any marines too severely. Fortunately, Akiji was already one step ahead. While Sengoku and Akainu were contemplating how to contact the newbie emperor, he was already in front of Enel, giving him the details of the situation. Enel, I know that you are no longer a marine. But I believe I am not wrong to think that Garp is still your friend. Akiji said as he rubbed the bridge of his nose in frustration. You are not. Enel said as he started making a small boat with his gauntlets. I'm not going to ask you to save him, but I feel that, no, it's fine, I'll do it. I'll make sure Garp gets transported out of Impel Down safely. Not like they'd ever be able to publicly admit that Garp is being held there. Thank you. I'm sure Akainu and Sengoku will be relieved to hear that. At this point, the two of them had been talking for a few minutes, finally, the marine Akiji had sent after the prisoner had returned. Bonnie was both cuffed and blindfolded, she seemed utterly confused and somewhat unaware of the surroundings. I see she's getting the royal treatment, Enel said jokingly as he looked at Akiji for a bit. The admiral simply shrugged a bit. Transporting a prisoner with a bounty as high as hers to the holy land isn't all that common. Not blaming you. Probably their instructions anyway. Enel signaled the marine to simply place the confused pirate on the boat he had made earlier. The marine did so, reluctantly if one might add. Anyway, here we part ways, Akiji. Enel said as he looked back at the new, marine hero. Yes. The next time we meet might not be this friendly. Akiji said as he narrowed his eyes a bit. Eh, who knows. I certainly have no idea what the future holds in store for us, at least not at this point, Enel then jumped on his ship and took off. Leaving behind the marine warship and sailing in a straight direction for the Sky Islands. POV narration Enel flew above the clouds, his ship breaking through the wind as his mind ran several calculations around the logistics of breaking Garp out of Impel Down and how that was going to affect the world. Enel knew that the world government wouldn't have the guts to announce Garp breaking out, just like they didn't have the guts to announce his imprisonment. So, technically, all Enel needed to do was to break him out once. After that, Garp would just be able to return to his home and retire. The world government would likely refrain from sending any agents after him, as they would all most likely die. Garp wasn't called the Fist for no reason. Enel had felt his punch during the war, and it had done almost as much damage to him as his clash with Whitebeard had. Garp, Whitebeard and Akainu were the main reason why the bones in Enel's hands were cracked all over. Garp was still taking it easy on him though, so Enel knew that Garp was certainly capable of more. The only reason Garp was being captured was that he had let himself get captured. That much was obvious. But, since diplomacy didn't work once, Garp was unlikely to let them capture him twice. Enel already had plans on how to break him out of prison, it was also rather well thought through, through. But that would have to wait. I don't care where you are taking me, you trashy government agent. I won't be using my devil fruits for you little shits. Jewelry Bonnie was currently still on his ship. She was still blindfolded, her pin locks tied together with her eyes. Her clothes were rather tattered, but she was still wearing her usual white, low-cut tank top as well as her orange and black striped buckled shorts with long, thin suspenders. She was currently not wearing any shoes, they probably remained stuck in some ice, and she had likely lost her jacket along the way. She also had sea stone cuffs on her hands and a sea stone collar tied to them by a thick steel chain. Dot. Enel hadn't really said anything to her, she had become more of an afterthought after he had heard the news about Garp. Still, he couldn't exactly bring her along in his stroll to impel down, Magellan would likely kill her in seconds, probably by mistake too. 
She was struggling against her chains, Enel wondered how he would go about convincing her to sit still on the Sky Island, where no one would be able to do anything to her. The world government had absolutely no influence in the sky, that was why Enel was returning there. Besides, now that he was called the Sky King, actually living in the sky was more than fitting. Oi. Enel said as he cut off her blindfold, Bonnie squirmed away, trying to kick Enel who dodged by simply sitting back in his chair. She was kicking toward Enel, but she was also blinded by the sun, as she wasn't expecting her blindfold to be taken off. In the process, she lost her balance and was about to fall tumbling out of the ship, Enel simply sighed in frustration, as a part of the ship extended and quickly pushed her back on the boat. Bonnie rubbed her eyes, still weakened by the sea stone as she quickly started looking around, studying her surroundings as her eyes widened when she finally realized that she was above the clouds. Where the foo, she then turned around, and she went completely mute when looking towards the person transporting her. Why are his earlobes so long? She thought to herself as she then got to study his face. At that point, she turned completely white, as confusion also started stirring within her. S. Sky King Enel. She said as she reeled back once more. Enel also raised an eyebrow at this point, he had hoped for a different reaction. In the flesh. Did you think you were being taken to the Holy Land? Enel decided to not dwell too much on it, speaking up in an attempt to somewhat ease her worries. I guess. Why am I being personally transported by the Fifth Emperor? She seemed to recover quickly, probably hoping that Enel was just trying to harass the Marines and didn't know about her devil fruit. I saw the situation and didn't think it fair for a new bee to be hunted down by an admiral, Enel said with a bit of a fake smile as he remembered himself hunting down new bee pirates sometime in the past. I see. Well, thank you, I guess. She was obviously still confused and distrustful of Enel. Which was to be expected given the circumstances. What are the chances of you taking off my cuffs? Bonnie asked as she looked at the clouds around her and whistled a bit. I don't know. What are the chances of you trying to attack me if I do take them off? Enel said as he twirled one of his earlobes around his wrist. Look. I may be a newbie, worst generation and all that, but I am not suicidal. She raised both of her arms as she tried to wipe some sweat from her forehead. Figures. A tendril then extended from the ship, entering the keyhole for both her cuffs and her collar. A mechanical click was heard as the restraints parted and fell to the floor of the ship then they disappeared, seemingly swallowed by the gold as if by quicksand. Bonnie looked at the tendrils with weariness as she started rubbing her wrists and her neck, her powers also slowly returning to her. Thanks. Now, where exactly are we headed? Bonnie asked as her confusion was far from sated. With her restraints off, she was somewhat certain that she was no longer a prisoner. She knew from the fact that Enel had saved Ace and Whitebeard, two people that she respected quite a bit, that he wasn't exactly a bad person. Well. I'll be frank with you. We are basically heading to my home. Bonnie looked at Enel weirdly as some fear crept in her gaze. Crap. He's a pervert. 2C. I'll just be getting comfortable for a bit. Bonnie said as she started turning into a younger version of herself. Now she was looking around ten, and her clothes were a bit too large for her, but they still fit her, thanks to the fact that she always wore skimpy clothes, they seemed just regular size for a child's body. That's an odd way of getting comfortable. Enel said as he tilted his head for a bit. That is just how I like it. I'll probably remain like this for a while. At least until I manage to run away from you. Bonnie was already trying to create escape plans in her mind. But she knew that escaping while in the middle of the sea was impossible. The ship was also small, so Enel basically had his eyes on her at all times, simply jumping was both suicidal, and unlikely to work. Well, do whatever you want. I guess you do look a bit cuter now. Enel said with a smile, his grandfatherly instincts kicking in a bit when seeing her as such a small child. This didn't get to happen with Sugar, since she was a demented individual, but Bonnie also did have a demeanor that fit her child form, so Enel didn't mind. Bonnie certainly minded though. Her eyes widened a bit as her face turned a shade wider than usual. Her back trembled a bit as she did her best to look away from Enel. Holy shit I need to escape this guy. He's a complete pervert. POV narration The journey towards the Sky Islands only took a week or two. Enel spent those days rather calmly, 
sometimes going below the clouds to retrieve a newspaper and to hunt down another sea king. Bonnie was known for her gluttony, and the fact that she looked younger now certainly didn't change that, although Enel felt it should have. Enel was able to see more and more of the government's public movements thanks to the newspaper. They were still parading Akiji as the new marine hero, and Akainu seemed to be praised quite a bit too. Sengoku was publicly blamed for the failure in the war, but it was unlikely that the government were punishing him, at least going by what Akiji had already told him. Although, Garp's imprisonment could be said to also be a punishment for Sengoku or a threat at the very least. If we are willing to arrest the marine hero, then you are not any more special. It was a power move of sorts, that much was obvious. And Akiji's fame was rising by the hour, while Garp was slowly but surely being replaced. It would take a really long time for the world government to get rid of Garp's influence in the navy though. The old man's retirement was not even announced publicly yet, but the rest of the marines should have known about it by now. Basically, every single marine that knew Garp would realize that something shady was going on. Enel could tell that his rescue of Garp was going to mess with a lot of the world government's plans, which only made him more pleased. Bonnie was currently still in her child from, still thinking of ways to escape from the longer-lobed pervert that had captured her. She had tried to change herself into an old form, but Enel simply smiled at her and said, whatever suits your fancy, I don't mind either way. Which creeped her out even more, so she switched back to a younger form, as being old sucked and she didn't exactly like it. To her, Enel's innocent comments throughout the journey made him seem like some type of sexual deviant. The fact that weirded her out the most was that Enel was actually not yet taking advantage of her. It made her think that Enel was like a cat, playing around with his prey as he prepared to eat it whole when at least expected. The first few nights she only pretended to sleep, before tiredness took over her body and she eventually passed out during the day while eating. She was rather shocked to wake up unmolested. But when she woke up the view was a lot more shocking. In the distance, she was able to see two large islands standing above the clouds. The sun shining from behind her was also starting to set, placing a rather beautiful glow on the distant islands. Enel smiled a bit and yawned when he noticed that she woke up. He was a bit tired as he hadn't slept at all the entire time, constantly using his devil fruit to steer his ship while remaining vigilant at all times. Since she was now awake, he also started whistling to calm his nerves for a bit. There wasn't much else he could do, constantly reading was tiring to the eye, after all. His whistling managed to break Bonnie out of her spell, as she came to the realization that Enel actually lived in the sky. Who would have thought that the man called the Sky King would actually have his residence on an island above the clouds? She obviously had heard legends about the Sky Islands, but that was all that she knew about them, that they were legends, much like the City of Gold. Now, she was able to see it rather clearly, the island was quickly getting larger and larger in her eyes, as their ship was getting closer to it with each passing second. Enel felt it in the distance, he was rather pleased to see how little had changed and he started wondering how Gone Fall and the others had been doing in his brief absence. Throughout the journey, Enel noticed the odd behavior from Bonnie. She had also not really spoken to him all that much since their initial exchange. Only a few words exchanged here and there. It was extremely odd, as Enel remembered her being rather opinionated in the show. But he decided not to think all that much about it. She's probably just stressed and tired, she also has no specific reason to trust me either. He could tell that she had hardly slept, as he was awake the entire time. Which only helped creep Bonnie out even further. He's just staring at me while I'm sleeping. Was usually the thought flowing through her mind. His whistling reminded Bonnie of her situation as she wondered if getting down from the Sky Islands would be easier than just jumping off the ship in the middle of the ocean. We'll be there in a few minutes. Enel said as he slowly sat up from his throne, randomly throwing the newspaper he was holding overboard into the sea of clouds as he didn't break his gaze away from the sky island in front of him. Thanks for letting me know. Why are you taking me there, by the way? She finally had the courage to ask. After a few days of Enel not making any advances to her, she had somewhat managed to calm herself down. It was good that he was playing around with her, especially if this gave her a chance to actually escape later on. Honestly, I'm quite shocked you only asked about this now. Enel turned to her with a wry smile on his face as he wondered how to go about telling her that she was still technically imprisoned. I'll be honest. I don't want your devil fruit to ever get in the hands of the world government. 
Bonnie instantly straightened up when hearing that, looking at Enel with even more weariness than before. Enel was a bit confused at that, not that she had hidden her power in any way from him or the public, as she had used her abilities rather openly in the past. Was she expecting him to not know how such powers could be abused? He who also had one of the strongest fruits in existence. Calm down. I am merely taking some. Precautionary measures. The second you stepped into the new world you got captured, so I likely can't trust you to go on by yourself. At this point, Bonnie realized that the situation was a bit more serious than Enel simply wanting to take her to his house and take advantage of her. I, Bonnie wanted to retort, but she ended up clenching her teeth in anger a bit under Enel's cold gaze. She couldn't exactly deny the fact that she was caught instantly. It was a stroke of bad luck, but she had almost ended up in the possession of some greasy celestial dragons due to that bad luck, so it couldn't be ignored. I know you don't like this. I wasn't exactly expecting you to be enthusiastic about this either. But I'll need you to stay put at least for a while until things cool down, then you can go your own way. In truth, Enel said the arrangement was temporary only to calm her down. He planned to befriend her properly during the time she spent there, to make her join him in his quest basically. Which would justify her spending more time on the Sky Islands and being out of danger. Enel knew that it was a problematic idea that could go wrong, but he couldn't exactly do much else. Well, chaining her up with Seastone and telling Wiper to feed her from time to time would also work. But Enel wanted to keep that as a last resort for now. Bonnie could be an extremely useful ally with her ability. Enel had quite a few plans for the future, and if a few certain people could return to their prime, then these plans would go a lot smoother. Enel had no way of knowing how difficult befriending her would be though. Although she now knew more about his reasons, she still thought that he was a pervert and that it was only a matter of time before he did something shady. Enel decided to park his boat right outside his cabin, at the edge of Upper Yard, the island made out of the earth. Enel could see that his cabin was mostly intact, and he could tell that there was no one really nearby. This is where we, mostly you, will be living for the following months. It's likely going to be a bit dusty so we'll have to start cleaning it up a bit. Enel got off his boat and tapped it with his palm. The boat proceeded to morph around Enel's hand and turn into a golden pair of gauntlets, the young Bonnie fell on her ass, as she wasn't exactly expecting that to happen. She found it a bit odd, feeling earth at her feet while so high up. She also swore a bit as she rubbed her behind. A warning could have been nice. She said with an angry tone. Sorry about that. Enel sweated a bit as he realized that they were probably starting off on the wrong foot. I was so used to Oven landing on his feet that I forgot other people might not be used to this type of thing. He then simply sighed and opened the door to his house, preparing for an hour or two of cleaning. POV narration the cleanup didn't really take that long, as the cabin itself wasn't all that large. Bonnie didn't do a lot to help, she was a bit concerned about there being only one bed though. Enel left her in the cabin for a while, to be alone with her thoughts. He wanted to go visit a few old friends for now. In lightning form, he blitzed across the island and reached the middle of the largest city instantly. Gone Fall had made his office in the middle of the city so the people would have the option of communicating with him by just going there. Enel didn't bother much to hide his appearance or presence. He received plenty of odd and scared gazes. He didn't really care though, only walking into the mayor's building and asking for Gone Fall at the receptionist. The woman was petrified to see Enel drop by there. To be exact, Enel actually had to cough a few times before she finally reacted and informed Gone Fall of his arrival. The thought at the forefront of everyone's mind was that Enel was back, and he was going to try to take over leadership again. No one wanted that type of thing to happen. Not only was Enel a bad leader in general, but he was also a murderous psychopath with an actual god complex. So, Enel could somewhat sympathize with the reactions he was getting. But that didn't mean he liked being treated as a ticking time bomb. He knew that salvaging his public image on Sky Island would be difficult, but he still planned to do it at some point. Bit by bit, of course. For now, the first step would be to let them all know that he was still there and that he wasn't exactly a threat to anyone. But that wasn't his main focus on this outing, merely a side objective. Enel just felt like seeing how Gone Fall was faring and how much Wiper had improved. He could feel that the two of them were together in the mayor's office, so he simply started walking there, stopping in front of the door for a second and knocking a bit. 
Upon entering, he was instantly able to recognize Gon Fall and Wiper, although they had changed quite a bit. Well, mostly Wiper had changed his clothing style entirely. Gon Fall was mostly the same, only looking a bit more tired than usual. Wiper was now wearing a black formal suit, much like what Enel used to wear before his clothes got ruined. He still had a large cannon on his back, and his hairstyle hadn't changed all that much. Still, his new look gained a smile from Enel. Hello there. I see you've taken after me, Wiper. Enel covered his mouth with one of his gauntlet palms, covering the shite-eating grin that was spreading on his face. Enel. Wiper shouted with a bit of anger in his voice, something that made Enel a bit confused. Why'd you go off on your own without even saying goodbye? Wiper instantly walked over to Enel, pointing at the taller former Marine's chest with a throbbing vein visible on his forehead. No need to get so angry about it. Not like I was away for a very long time. Enel said as he waved one of his earlobes around dismissively. I can be as angry as I want. Bit of a warning would be nice next time you plan to fuck off for a few months. Wiper huffed as he crossed his arms and went back to his place, standing behind Gon Fall while the old man was at his office. He was officially made the god Gon Fall's personal guard, and he had been training non-stop in order to catch up to Enel. The two of them had been sparring quite a bit before Enel left Sky Island to join the Marines. Wiper hadn't really won any match, he had a slight advantage in skill at first, but that vanished quickly as Enel was a fast learner. So, Wiper really wanted to have a rematch with his longer-lobed sparring partner. It's good to see you've come back, Enel. Gon Fall said as he rubbed the bridge of his nose. He was a lot calmer than Wiper regarding the entire situation. It's great to be back, what can I say? A smile spread on Enel's lips as he looked around the room for a bit. It was rather plainly decorated, it was pretty apparent that Gon Fall didn't hire any interior designer for his office. Has anything of note happened while I was away? Enel's gaze turned serious as he started asking some more pertinent questions. He knew that he wasn't gone for a long time, so there was no need for some long reunion. Some people from below managed to find their way here. We are still unsure how, but they seem to be oddly interested in the Shandya clan's ruins from the upper yard. Gon Fall said as he put down a few pieces of paper on the table. Probably pirates, did you guys deal with them? Enel asked as he crossed his legs and grabbed a cup of tea from the table. Another vein rose on Wiper's forehead when seeing that. That's my cup, you dick. But he didn't want to interrupt the conversation, so he held back. Wiper managed to subdue them. They are currently still captured, but they didn't disclose the means they used to reach us. Enel nodded when hearing that. It's a good thing they were captured. I had forgotten that people from below could still travel up here. I think Bellamy had managed to do that and steal some gold in the original story. But he should have been imprisoned, so it likely wasn't him this time around. Enel rubbed his chin with one hand as he pondered a bit more about what methods people could use to reach Sky Island. He knew that it was technically possible if one was able to fly. But the Sea of Clouds would turn any Devil Fruit user into a sinking rock if they attempted to jump to the Sky Islands. Enel wasn't exactly worried though. As he had plenty of plans on how to proceed if people actually found the Sky Islands. It wasn't as if that was never a possibility in his mind, but having his main base of operations discovered so quickly was rather annoying. I'll visit the prisoners at some point. Do make sure to keep an eye on them. Enel eventually said as he wondered how he'd go about interrogating the visitors. Good. Besides that, I've been doing my best to prepare our islands for outsiders attacking us at any point since you left. I don't really know what you've been doing, but I wanted to be safe. Gon Fall said as Enel raised an eyebrow. I guess he didn't want to just leave things up to me. Well, a bit of preparedness is never bad for you. It's a good thing that you've decided to take precautions. Here, this will certainly be helpful to you. Enel handed Gon Fall six small booklets, the same books that Sengoku had given him upon joining the Marines. Gon Fall grabbed one of them and pursued it for a few seconds, smiling a bit as he said, Interesting. If all techniques you've provided are this useful, then it is sure to bolster our strength. Gon Fall had only picked up the book for Tekai, and had only gotten to read a brief explanation of the technique's effects, and he was already impressed. Yes, but it will certainly take a few years for people to learn them. Enel said as he shook his head a bit. 
Still, I expect us to have a trained squad with enough mastery in at least three of those skills within the next two years. Enel continued as he shrugged a bit and hoped for the best. That should be possible. The training regime will certainly be a harsh one though. Gon Fall said as he started looking through a few more books. Well, this will be a special squad, so only the best will qualify for it anyway, Enel said as he took another sip of his, wipers, tea. It will be a special squad until all of our soldiers manage to learn it, I guess. Gon Fall said as he smiled a bit. Indeed. Enel's smile didn't diminish either, becoming larger as he thought about his main base having more and more strong fighters to defend it. Wiper also picked up one of the books with a skeptical face, only to also get a sadistic smile when reading more about it. Still, he didn't really know if Enel had mastered any of those techniques yet, so he was still eager to fight him. Special techniques from the people below, huh? Enel, it's been a while already. Let's see if you've been lazing around the past few months. Wiper said as he cracked his knuckles, Enel simply chuckled a bit as he looked at his first sparring partner. Don't be too disappointed when you lose. The former Marine said as he remembered the sparring partners he had had since then, mainly Garp, and how much stronger he had become. The two of them got up and proceeded to leave, leaving only Gon Fall, who sighed a bit in frustration at the fact that his personal guard had just left him alone. POV narration While Enel and Wiper were heading for a clearing in Upper Yard, on the other side of the Grand Line, the news of the war's events had finally reached a secluded and closed-off country. More specifically, a gargantuan man was currently staring at the wanted poster of a rookie emperor. The man was standing at a whopping seven meters tall, his upper body muscles were large and bulky. He wore a blue-purple feathered overcoat draped on his shoulders. The man was currently shirtless, sitting on a large and comfortable chair. He also wore a pair of baggy black pants and black boots. A large cross-shaped scar was on the right side of his abdomen. His most eye-catching feature was his pair of horns, which made the man look even more intimidating than usual. It was none other than Kaido, the King of Beasts and the captain of the massive pirate crew, the Beast Pirates. A man worth exactly four. Billion Barry, and an extremely dangerous tyrant. He hadn't taken the news of one of his strongest subordinates being killed nicely. He had killed both the messenger and had prohibited any tombstone of Jack the Drought from ever being built. He was a man that only valued strength above all else, his dream was to form a pirate crew strong enough to take down the world government itself. Losing Jack was a rather large setback in Kaido's eyes. He didn't truly care about Jack as an individual though, what he cared more about was making sure that such a thing wouldn't happen again. He couldn't afford to lose too many cadres in his crew, Jack was one of the three strongest in his crew. So Kaido raged quite a bit when hearing about his death, even killing the poor subordinate that had to report it to him. Kaido then proceeded to drink himself into a stupor shortly after learning that Doflamingo got taken down by the marines and his smile factory was destroyed. The Beast King had swore loudly and cursed the marines, his curses reverberated throughout the castle and his outbursts affected quite a few members of his crew. Kaido's dream was to create a pirate crew strong enough to take down the world nobles. He believed in all-out war and felt that only the strong deserved to rule. The destruction of the Smile Factory had managed to throw a wrench in his plans as well. The factory was supposed to have been built with seastone, but it had been erased entirely in what was believed to be a freak storm. At least until recently. Kaido's associates could be seen trembling, especially the henchmen that had brought him the newspaper. Kaido's cold gaze stared at the newly titled Sky King with a hateful gaze. The former rear admiral he hadn't paid any attention to, the one that Jack had been hunting before dying. The one that had killed Doflamingo ruthlessly and destroyed the factory that was supposed to produce the artificial fruits that would help him achieve his dream. It was him. All along. Kaido's rage could barely be contained at that point, as he crumbled up the wanted poster and threw it away angrily. I want his head. Kaido shouted, as his subordinates trembled in fear. Yes, Kaido. King and Queen both bowed to him at that point. But not one of the beast pirates was actually confident in fighting Enel at this point. King and Queen thought that maybe they'd be able to hold him back, but Enel was known to have fought against the entire navy by himself. His fruit was also titled, Invincible, and for a good reason, as it was capable of enough destruction to make the majority of the beast pirates reluctant to even get involved with him. King was confident in himself, and he was confident in his captain, 
who was fated to become the pirate king, but he didn't feel confident enough to face Enel by himself. But Kaido's orders couldn't be ignored. Bring me sake. The day continued from then on for the beast pirates, all of the cadres now having a target. The newbie emperor, Sky King Enel. And said newbie didn't really care about them at all, he had just reached a clearing in the forest, with Wiper walking alongside him, and the two of them were preparing for a decent fight. Both of them were stretching a bit, and Enel was obviously going to go easy and not even enhance his speed at all. At this point, Enel had mastery over all of the six powers and over all types of hockey. People in the first half of the Grand Line were not even strong enough to make him use the metal manipulation part of his devil fruit at that point. Wiper was a lot stronger now than he had been in the series. Having Enel as a sparring partner and rival had helped the tribal warrior get stronger at a monumental pace, but he was still left far behind by Enel's own progress. They were near Enel's cottage at this point, since Enel also wanted to show Wiper where his new home was. Just so you know. This won't be the same as before. Enel said as he cracked his neck a bit, taking off his gauntlets to reveal his bandaged arms. Heh, you can use whatever fancy technique you think you've got up your sleeve. I'll take you on regardless. Wiper said as he took off his jacket and threw his cannon to the side. Enel did the same and threw his staff away, raising a small dust cloud and cracking the earth a bit where it landed. Wiper looked at the staff with a raised eyebrow. Good. So he hasn't been slacking. Oh boy, he didn't know half of it. The fight started in earnest, with Wiper dashing toward Enel at breakneck speeds. Enel simply smiled when seeing that, studying his opponent's speed before deciding how much he should hold back. Wiper cocked his fist back and punched at Enel like an enraged gorilla when he reached him, Enel raised his leg, stopping the punch with the sole of his shoe as he stood there unmoved with a smile on his face. Wiper grunted as the ground underneath Enel started cracking rapidly. He's grown so much. Enel thought to himself, the smile on his face widening a bit as he remembered how they were relatively close in body strength when he had arrived in that world. Blows were being exchanged at rather high speeds, Enel's arms were mostly hanging limply by his sides, but his leg moved like an enraged snake, kicking and blocking all of Wiper's strikes perfectly. The trees around them shook as leaves flew off in all directions because of their bout. The ground cracked more and more with each strike thrown, blocked or missed. The small booms that could be heard eventually disturbed Bonnie too, who walked out of the house with a confused expression on her face. Her eyes widened when she saw the madman that was exchanging blows with an actual emperor. Still, she could tell that the two of them knew each other. It was rather obvious from the large smiles they had plastered on their faces. You can take so many hits now. Wiper shouted as he punched at Enel's torso, at this point, Enel simply used Tekai and took it with a smile on his face. What can I say? I've had a good teacher. Enel said as he remembered Garp pounding him into the ground on a daily basis. That ain't fair. I was stuck here with no one interesting to fight. Wiper said as he retrieved his fist and delivered the heaviest kick he could towards Enel's temple. Enel simply crouched down as much as he could, ducking under the kick as one of his earlobes extended upward and slapping Wiper in the face heavily, making him take a few steps back with a confused look in his eyes. Seriously? Wiper said as he immediately jumped for his cannon with an angry look on his face. Now, Wiper realized that Enel was holding back the entire time. It was hard not to. But he didn't take kindly to Enel using his earlobes to slap him around, so he decided to simply go for his weapon to gain an advantage. Immediately, Wiper turned his cannon towards Enel, who was still staring at him with a smile. First, he fired a normal cannonball at him, smiling a bit as he didn't expect it to do much damage. Enel simply kicked towards it, unleashing a small Rankyaku and cutting it in half, the cannonball parted down the middle and both pieces flew by Enel's sides. Wiper was forced to jump and roll to the side as the flying slash continued onwards, splitting the ground and a few trees in the process. Damn! The hell is that technique? Wiper said as he aimed his cannon towards Enel once more. This time, he fired a ball of white flames toward Enel. The cannon he was using was a special burn bazooka, that could shoot fireballs when used in tandem with a fire dial. Enel didn't get to study dials all that much, and he wasn't highly interested in them, but he still knew how they worked both from Enel's memories and his own. Enel chose not to take that attack hidden, as he'd need to use armament to keep his clothes intact. Instead, he used Jeppo, 
and with two jumps, he was already well over the flames and above Wiper. Brace yourself. Enel shouted as he twirled a bit in the air, doing a somersault and sending a large Rankyaku towards Wiper. The tribal chief was shocked this time, quickly rolling to the side as the blade hit the earth. The ground shattered, and he was sent flying further into the forest. The hell. Wiper's burn bazooka had been blown away, had it not been for Enel's warning, he would have been split in half most likely. Wiper sweated a bit when seeing the deep gorge that Enel's attack had left into the earth. What the fuck was that? Wiper was frustrated at that point. He hadn't realized that Enel had improved that much. Yeah. You really have to learn those techniques. Enel said as he landed on the ground near Wiper, a wry smile was present on his face as he tried to lessen some of Wiper's disappointment. Wiper stared at Enel for a bit, his frustrated gaze eventually turning to the ground. Before he cracked his neck a bit and said. I'll learn those fucking techniques. You better be ready for a rematch, I'll make sure to beat you handily. The tribal warrior said as he went and collected his weapon. Enel did the same, putting his gauntlets back on and placing his staff on his back. Bonnie that had been watching the entire fight was also rather impressed. But she already knew Enel was strong, so the one that impressed her more was Wiper, by holding his own for as long as he did. Even when holding back, Enel was still an untouchable existence to many at this point. And Bonnie also thought that too. Bonnie ended up going to look at the place Enel had attacked last after the two of them left. She sweated a bit when seeing the deep 10-meter gorge that had been created, it was also spanning well over 100 meters at the very least. What the hell are these top powers made out of? POV narration Enel and Wiper walked through the woods again, the two of them were still speaking about their spars mostly, with Wiper asking what Enel had done to grow that strong. Enel couldn't really give him much of a response besides, I had a great teacher and I trained a lot. Honestly, that was most of what he had done for the months before Marineford, training. The only leisure time he had was in the few hours he had slept, or when he was traveling with Hancock and Luffy. And, at this point, Enel no longer felt the need to be so obsessed with his training. He had already grown strong enough to hold his own. He would still train from time to time, but the body that he had wanted to polish was already rather powerful. Strong enough to take hits from both Garp and Whitebeard. Enel could now trust himself to fight even the likes of Kaido without worrying about injuries too much. His devil fruit provided him with superior firepower, his powerful body now provided him with a lot of stamina. If the original Enel had tried to pull a stunt like the one he had pulled at Marineford, he would have been killed almost instantly, or would have passed out from exhaustion. He was now leagues above what he had been when arriving in that world. Still, seeing Wiper's frustrated expression made him a bit unhappy. He could become a rather powerful ally with some proper training and with that thought in mind, Enel started speaking to his old sparring partner. Wiper. First off, you will have to learn all six of the techniques I gave to Gonfall. Enel instantly caught Wiper's attention with that phrase. Obviously. But that might take a while. The tribal warrior said as he scratched the back of his head for a bit. It will, but I will give you the training methods that my teacher used for each technique. It should shorten the time required to gain mastery over each technique by quite a bit. Wiper immediately perked up when Enel said that. Hee <laughs> hee. So you're helping me beat you up, huh? The smile on the tribal warrior's face seemed to turn a bit sadistic. Enel simply laughed at that and proceeded to tell Wiper broadly about the training methods of each technique and which could be learned together. Some of the six techniques simply complemented each other, and learning some first would make learning the others faster. Similar to how learning either one of Jeppo, Soro would make learning the other two much faster. How training Rankyaku after those two would make it much easier to grasp. Of course, he also told Wiper about learning Tekai and Kami together. Shurgan needed to be trained separately, as it was a purely offensive technique that only strengthened your arm and fingers. But Garp also had a method for that. Simply banging your finger into a rock repeatedly until you got stronger. It was just as painful as his other training methods, Enel simply advised Wiper to learn Tekai first before jumping into that, to prevent him from breaking his fingers too often. By the end, Wiper was sweating a bit, Enel's, Garp's, training methods were simply masochistic. Still, he couldn't allow himself to fall so far behind Enel, he needed to catch up. So he simply memorized what he needed and nodded. 
Enel decided to give him a bit of a teaser. On what would come after the six power two. After you are done learning the six techniques, I will also teach you how to use mantra. As well as another version of mantra that allows you to damage devil fruit users like me. Wiper seemed to get excited a bit when hearing that. It only lasted for a few seconds though, after which he just seemed to deflate. I don't really have much talent for mantra. I don't know how much I'll be able to learn. He looked rather discouraged for a second. Wiper, mantra is merely a projection of one's spiritual power that manifests thanks to one's willpower. Some people have a talent for it, some don't. But all are able to use it as long as they are strong enough. Wiper looked at Enel for a bit when hearing that explanation. He eventually smiled, deciding to trust Enel's words in that instance. I get it. It might take me longer, but I'll try to get some mastery over it. The tribal warrior said as he started walking again, heading back towards the city. Honestly, the other type of mantra that I was talking about might be a lot more fitting for you. You have a lot of endurance and strength, so you might learn it relatively quickly. It may take you a year, let's say. That's still a long time though. Wiper crossed his arms and made a long face when hearing that. Bah! Most people take decades to learn it. You should be happy right now you actual dumbass. Enel got a bit frustrated at that point, as Wiper was genuinely complaining while being a lot more talented than others. Don't call me that you longeered freak. Wiper immediately started biting back, the two of them weren't exactly against a bit of friendly banter. Enel also enjoyed this type of lively conversation from time to time, it helped his mind relax quite a bit. Well then, I'll be heading back to my cabin for now. I'll probably be away for a week or two again, Enel said as he sighed and claimed down for now. Ha! Huh. You just came back. Why are you leaving already? Wiper asked as he gave Enel a long look. My old teacher's having some issues, I do have to go and help him out, Enel said as he twirled one of his earlobes around. Fair enough. What about the prisoners? The tribal warrior asked as he continued walking through the forest. I'll visit them when I come back. Not like they are that big of a threat if they were unable to escape until now. Wiper merely nodded when hearing that, not pressing the issue any further. By the way, would you be kind enough to deliver food and water to my cabin every day or so? I have a guest there, and I don't want her starving to death. Enel said as he sighed a bit. Oh, her. Did you bring home a girl? Wiper smiled when hearing that, instantly deciding to tease Enel. No, shut up, Enel said with a poker face. Sorry, I'm getting emotional, to think our Enel has grown up so much. Wiper wiped a fake tear from his cheek, while Enel looked at him with empty eyes. I'm at least twice as old as you are. Enel said as he crossed his arms, and looked at Wiper with a bored expression Wiper noticed that, so he stopped playing around. Fine. I'll get going now. Thanks for dropping by, now I have a lot of training to do. Wiper then proceeded to fly off on his shooters, which were technically flying roller blades. Enel looked at him fly off for a bit, before returning to his cabin to tell Bonnie of his departure as well. When he arrived inside, he was a bit surprised to see Bonnie in her usual form, not the child one. While he was away, Bonnie had pondered how to get away from Enel. Seeing how strong he was while he was holding back made her tremble a bit. She had somewhat forgotten the strength that Enel had displayed during Marineford after spending so much time near him. He was rather unassuming most of the time, so that was a quick reminder to her that he could kill her at any second. She realized that, as long as Enel was there, she would simply be unable to escape. Even worse, Enel seemed to be aware of her location, she had seen him turn around and smile at her while he was walking away with his sparring partner. So running into the forest was likely not a good option either. In the end, she turned into her usual form of a twenty-something-year-old. It should at least hurt a lot less this way. Enel had basically told her they'd be living in that small cabin, which only had a small bed. So she instantly assumed that Enel would likely do something to her since he was a disgusting pervert and it was clear enough that he didn't mind her being a child either. What's up? Enel walked in, and Bonnie just sighed when seeing him act in such a relaxed and friendly manner. Stop acting and let's just get this over with. She then started undressing, slipping the suspenders that extended from her shorts off her shoulders. She then proceeded to try and take off her shorts, at which point Enel's eyes widened a bit and he shouted. 
what the fuck are you doing? His expression was certainly a startled one, as his gaze also instantly turned into a confused one, as Bonnie also looked at him with a confused gaze. Um. She was also honestly incredibly confused. At that point, she was basically offering herself to him, he had no need to keep up pretenses and could just act like the pervert he was. So why did he reel back when she started undressing? Anyway. I'm going away for a while. Enel proceeded to instantly leave the house and started floating, someone will drop by T.O. give you food. Good beat Enel didn't even get to finish as he turned into a lightning bolt and vanished into the distance, leaving Bonnie extremely confused and quite flabbergasted. Don't tell me. Was he? Flustered. I guess he wasn't that much of a pervert after all. Now I feel like shit. Bonnie looked at the ground for a bit, as her previous interactions with Enel suddenly started looking different in her mind. He was just being fucking friendly. Why'd he have to run off though? With that thought in mind, Bonnie eventually gained a wide smile on her face. If he is that shy and easily flustered, I may be able to make use of him. He's a fucking emperor for God's sake. Bonnie started rubbing her chin as her red lips turned more and more upwards with a wide smile. Yes, I can't wait for him to come back. If I can get him wrapped around my finger then the marines and the world government will no longer be an issue. Bonnie instantly started strategizing how to make use of the shy guy that had just run off. But unbeknownst to her. Enel had already branded her as a sexual deviant in his mind. It wasn't that he had been flustered, he just didn't feel like dealing with an awkward situation. He wasn't about to have sex with someone he barely knew anything about. So he simply ran off like lightning to avoid rejecting her directly. If only he had the ability to do that in his past life, so many embarrassing moments would have disappeared. Oh well, the Sky King was off to Impel Down now. POV narration Enel's journey to Impel Down didn't take long, he didn't bother traveling with a slow golden boat as he just zapped across the world towards where he knew the island would be. It took a few hours, with different stops for Enel to check up on his map, sleep a bit and make sure he was going in the right direction by using other islands as landmarks. Navigation was relatively easy when one didn't need to worry about the weather of the Grand Line too. Using an actual compass was still impossible as they were relatively useless, but the map Enel was using had a drawn compass on it, and that was really all that he needed. Enel had managed to forget about the awkward situation from earlier and didn't give it much thought anymore. Still, he wondered if he could make sure Bonnie would never be captured and just let her go, somehow. In the end, he reached the conclusion that he'd likely have to train her a bit, or at least plan out some training regime for her. She could technically end most fights with one touch if the opponent wasn't using armament, so she had the potential to be an extremely strong fighter. She would never be able to survive if another admiral went after her though. All of them had powerful armament hockey, even though they specialized in using their fruits mostly. Hell, at this point Enel was well aware that most vice admirals would be able to apprehend her easily, especially if they had some sea stone at hand. By the time Enel reached the skies above Impel Down, he had already planned out an entire training program for Bonnie, which also included a diet of sea king meat. Enel was well aware of how important nutrition was in growing stronger, the fact that his diet only consisted of the most powerful sea kings he could find certainly helped him grow stronger faster. In retrospect, more people could use that type of diet. So Enel decided he would hunt down more sea kings on his way back home, to feed the soldiers of the Sky Island in order to have stronger fighters stationed at his main base of operations. As he finished noting down the last of his ideas, he started thinking of how to approach the Impel Down breakout. Why was there so much movement in Impel Down anyway? As Enel was making his way to Impel Down, the figure of a heavily muscled old man with grey hair and a short beard could be seen in the furthest cage in the lowest part of the prison. The man still wore a white costume, the same one he had been wearing on the day of his capture, as no one dared to tell him to change. The wardens and prison guards were not told the identity of Garp, the CP agents made sure to escort him to his cell personally and they prevented anyone from even seeing him. All personnel was prohibited from going too deeply into the lowest level of the prison. And the one Garp was placed into was not even the sixth level that Enel had seen, instead, it was one even more hidden. It was called, Level Zero, the Forgotten Hell. The security personnel there was non-existent, but it was completely covered in sea stone, from top to bottom it was built out of that devil fruit weakening material. 
It hampered willpower as well, so most people would simply not ever be able to sense it unless looking specifically for it. Since sea stone gave off the same energy as the sea, most people trying to look into it with observation hockey would only feel the sea underneath the sixth floor of Impel Down. The usual piece of bread and water that was to be given as food was simply delivered through a tube coming down from an upper level. That was where the world government held all of their highest risk prisoners, although level 6 had plenty of powerful prisoners, level 0 was quite different. It was a level for people that the government really could not afford to ever release in the world. And, it was mostly empty. That place was where people were sent to be forgotten completely. Even by the world government itself. Monkey D. Garp knew that. But he also knew that the world government wouldn't get its way. Sengoku was likely fighting to get him out, even Akainu was likely trying to get him out. The Magma Admiral had changed a lot in the short time he had spent with Enel, he was a lot more agreeable. Still, Garp felt that diplomacy might simply not work now that he saw where he was taken and the conditions in which he was kept. Thick sea stone chains were wrapped tightly all around him, cuffs that covered his arms completely and a collar that made it difficult to move his neck. Garp still had his physical strength, but he could no longer use hockey properly because of the sea stone, so he was stuck there now. But his hope was far from being squashed. He knew that Sengoku would even break into Impel Down for him if it was needed. Besides Sengoku, there was also Dragon, his son. Although they were not on the best terms, Dragon wouldn't abandon his father in a prison. Especially not under these circumstances, when he could easily convince Garp to turn on the world government. There was also Luffy and Ace, and by extension the Whitebeard Pirates. Garp didn't have high hopes for them showing up, he especially hoped Luffy and Ace would stay out of it, but he did think of the possibility. Then there was another person. Enel, the Sky King. He was certainly capable enough to break into Impel Down. But Garp already owed him one for saving his grandsons, so he hoped it wouldn't get to that. As the days passed, Garp's hope that things could be solved diplomatically was slowly diminishing. And breaking out was starting to look more and more like his only option. Garp then heard a voice from one of the other cells. Heh. Didn't think I'd ever sense your presence again, Garp, the fist, dot. It was a weakened voice, speaking slowly. Who are you exactly? Garp asked as he blinked a few times, he couldn't recognize who's the voice that was. Garp had always been blunt with people, he was also not in a great mood currently, so he didn't bother to mince words with a criminal. He also had no idea there were any prisoners alive on level zero. He hadn't seen any movement when coming in, and the agent transporting him didn't seem to look around either. Well. I'm shocked you forgot about me, it was a rather bloody affa, the words were interrupted by a series of coughs, signifying that the man's health had seen better days. Dot. Garp didn't say anything, but he started to remember a few things when hearing that voice. He found it oddly familiar. Remember God Valley, Dot. At that point, Garp's eyes widened as he turned his head to look towards the wall from where he had heard that voice. No way. You're telling me they kept you alive. Garp spoke slowly as his eyes widened. He could remember his name clearly. A name that had once shook the seas and made the entire navy tremble with fear. His sword could split islands in half, his hockey was strong enough to cut through anything. A man that Garp had fought in the past, alongside G.O.L.D. Rogers crew and Whitebeard. Garp narrowed his eyes as he looked at his own body. Some of the scars that covered his skin were made by that man, it was rather ironic that they met again under these circumstances. The first mate of the Rock's pirates. Also one of the strongest pirates of his generation. It was none other than Francisco de Guzman. His name was scribbled out of every history book, and unlike his captain, he had survived the scuffle at God Valley. But he had been too injured to flee unlike other associates of Zebek and members of the Rock's pirates that went on to become legendary figures. Instead, he was found by the Navy and imprisoned. The world government was going to execute him silently, but they instead left him to rot in the deepest part of Impel Down, seemingly forgetting about him as soon as the world did. Heh. If even people like you were kept out of the loop. There is little hope for the rest of the world to know of me, is there? Garp could hear Francesco's aged voice clearly now, he clearly remembered the way that God Valley had played out. The only reason they were able to win, was because they had managed to separate Zebek from his first mate. Had that not happened, Garp and Roger would have died that day. 
The fact that Whitebeard and Roger's crew were helping them was also a huge reason why they were able to win. Whitebeard had betrayed the Rock's pirates on that fateful night, deciding to side with Roger, who had become his friend. Rayleigh and Whitebeard had fought Francisco and drove him away, while Garp and Roger dealt with Zebek by themselves for a while. Garp winched a bit as he remembered that day. Many lives were lost and no one remembered it either. It was as if their sacrifices were in vain. I thought you were executed. Garp said as he looked at the ground. He wasn't exactly a friend of Francisco, it would be closer to say they were enemies. But they were both old men at this point and both prisoners. So Garp saw no issue with talking to him. Heh. I wish. No, they left me here to meet my end slowly. Garp didn't have much of a reaction when hearing that. It was something that the world government was prone to doing. After all, why else would they keep so many prisoners alive on the sixth floor of Impel Down? When all of them were atrocious criminals that deserved death. Garp simply sighed, remembering more and more about the God Valley incident and Francisco himself. It's all because of Zebek. That piece of shit just had to go and make an enemy out of everyone. Garp chuckled a bit when hearing the vitriol from Francisco's aged voice, Zebek had not been liked by any of his crewmates, he was a cruel individual that only appreciated strength. Francisco was considered his second, but even he was treated like shit from time to time because he was weaker than Zebek himself. Garp. Would you mind telling me a bit more about the outside? Francisco's aged voice was heard once more, breaking Garp out of his melancholic stupor and making him sigh a bit. Under normal circumstances, he wouldn't have associated himself with a pirate like Francisco, but the circumstances he was in weren't exactly all that great. Who knew how long he'd be down there, right? Besides, Francisco was bound to be a different man from the one he was forty years ago. So, the two old men started speaking, recounting stories while leaning on the walls of their prison cells, unsupervised. Garp also learned that his food was basically thrown at him weekly from the tube. He couldn't use his hands, but he was actually expected to eat the bread by crawling on the ground. The water also didn't come in any container, it was just sprayed in a small puddle in the middle of the room, licking it from the ground was one's only choice. Garp was beyond infuriated by that, his constant shouts and complaining managed to make Francisco laugh quite a bit. In the end, after a few days, Garp finally understood that there was simply no chance for diplomacy to work. He had also told his worries to Francisco. After all, if a breakout was to happen, the old pirate would also be involved, most likely killed too. Francisco simply laughed a bit when hearing about how many people were likely to rescue Garp. You always knew how to make friends. Garp had no way to see Francisco's face, but he could clearly hear the old man smile. Say. Why wait for them? Do you want to break out now? Hmm. He's got an idea. POV narration Garp looked a bit confused at first when hearing Francisco's suggestion. Are you saying you can break out of here, somehow? Garp wasn't exactly wrong to question that. Francisco had been held captive there for around forty years, give or take. If he was able to leave, why didn't he do so already? Of course, you should know already. There is nothing in this world that I can't cut. Francisco's aged voice sounded confident beyond anything else. Heh. That might have been true back in the days. But you'd be surprised how much the world has developed. Garp said as he looked around him with a wary gaze. An entire building of sea stone must have been built after Francisco was captured and the old man has likely moved there afterwards. I know. I've seen the way they manage to bend and manipulate sea stone to their advantage. But. When has that ever stopped me? Garp could hear a few clangs, then a few loud metallic thuds. At that point, the old man raised an eyebrow. Are you telling me he already freed himself? If you are able to. I wouldn't mind getting out of here myself. Garp said as he smiled a bit wondering how the wardens of Impel Down would react when seeing him walking around their lower levels. Then, a large sound reverberated throughout the Seastone prison, as Francisco cut through his own cell bars and stepped out. Garp didn't react much when seeing his appearance. At least at first, as his view was shrouded by the dark. Then he noticed it. Overgrown grey hair and beard, both unkept and dirty, the old man in front of him was missing both of his eyes, and the scars on his wrists and calves told Garp that his tendons had been severed. 
The world government truly wanted him to never be able to pick up a sword or to ever fight on the same level as he had used to in the past. Garp winced a bit, as he realized that Francisco had likely undergone extensive torture in his time as a prisoner. How come you're only doing this now? Garp asked as he studied the old man a bit more. The rags he was wearing were filled with holes, he had slightly larger than normal nails, and he had probably been biting them to keep them to his preferred length. They were also likely what he used to cut through the jail bars and his own restraints. At first. I was just like you. Able to use my strength, but unable to use hockey at all. Over decades of constant exposure, I've acclimated. Francisco got closer and closer to Garp Seastone cell. His hockey turned his nails completely red, with an odd aura surrounding them, as he swiped at the bars. Sparks rose up as his nails seemed to cleave through the sea stone bars like hot knives through butter. It was at this point that Garp noticed something else about Francisco's state. The old man was panting. My strength and stamina were no longer the same by the time I managed to use hockey in this hellhole. I don't have the confidence to escape by myself. But with you here. At this point, Garp understood Francisco's meaning completely. Eventually, he chuckled. To think I'd end up helping a pirate escape. Garp said as he slowly stood up, his binding still bound closely to his body. Francisco then proceeded to use his nails to tear apart the sea stone that bound Garp. The vice admiral could tell that the old pirate was already exhausted by the end. It was rather obvious why he hadn't escaped by himself already. He simply could not. Francisco had lived on a diet of a few drops of water and a stale piece of bread every week for a few decades his tendons were cut and his eyes ruined, he simply didn't have the strength to escape. Garp finally felt free as soon as the bindings came off. His fists turned black as he looked at the ground and ceiling a bit more. Everything around him was made out of sea stone, but he was still wearing his shoes, so his feet weren't directly touching the ground, which now enabled him to use hockey. At this point, Garp contemplated killing Francisco then and there, as he remembered the terror he and Zebek had brought to the world. But Francisco's next words made him stop. Hee <laughs> hee. Finally, freedom is within grasp. At least I'll be able to feel the sunlight on my skin for one last time. At this point, Garp simply winced a bit. He was no longer looking at a legendary pirate. Instead, he was looking at a pitiful and sickly old man on the brink of death. At that point, Garp shook his head internally, deciding to not take away the old man's last chance at tasting freedom. What harm can he even bring at this point? He looks like he barely has a few months left. Let's get going, old man. We have some doors to break down. Garp said as the two of them started walking towards the entrance area. Of course. Francisco was walking a bit slower, trailing behind as he was having a bit of an issue with walking and moving around in general due to his tendons being severed and muscles being atrophied. Garp noticed that, but there wasn't much he could do in order to help. The door that led to the upper levels was an extremely thick one, fully made out of sea stone, even down to the hinges. So we even have to break this? Garp asked while cracking his knuckles a bit. Well. No point in holding back now. He then shouted as he punched the door with great strength. The door shook, cracks appearing on it as Garp simply winced a bit. Sea stone sure is tough. Garp said as he looked back at the old man behind him. Can't help much with this one. It's too thick for me to cut without a proper weapon. Francisco said as he shrugged his shoulders. Heh. Guess I'll have to bring it down myself. And just like that, for around two minutes, Garp continued to punch away at the sea stone doors, as Francisco grabbed a sea stone bar from nearby to support himself. How fucking thick is this? I'm telling you, it was easier breaking down mountains. Garp shouted as he delivered one last punch to the door, he had basically dug a tunnel with his fists alone, he had already gone three meters deep into the sea stone door. With that last punch, the older side of the door was finally opened. Garp simply wiped the sweat from his brow, as he looked at his blackened fists proudly. Francisco simply shook his head a bit when sensing that. I guess we all grow old. Garp in his prime would have demolished that door almost instantly. Still, Francisco chose to not say anything about it Garp's age, instead, he spread his senses further. It's been a long time since I've been able to sense outside this room. Let's get going, shall we? Francisco also stepped through the hole Garp had punched out. 
Yep, we probably don't have to fight that many people. I doubt the world government had the guts to announce my imprisonment. Garp said as he also started walking up the stairs. The door leading to the sixth floor was a hidden one. But Garp didn't bother to look for an opening, he simply pushed it away once more. This one was a lot less thick, so he was able to break it almost instantly. Francisco didn't say anything, merely sheepishly following Garp as the two of them traversed through the sixth floor. The floor was deathly silent when seeing Garp. The other old man with him was also rather shocking to them, as he looked a lot like a prisoner. Then, an older resident of the sixth floor caught a glimpse of the old man's face. No way. Guzman. His eyes widened, as the prisoners around him mostly looked confused. Francisco merely laughed when hearing that. I guess old timers still remember me, huh? Guy he he he. Francisco laughed a bit as he covered his mouth with his hand. Francisco then noticed just how overgrown his hair was. He hadn't paid much attention to it. Can't possibly go outside looking like this. His nails quickly cut out the excess hair, leaving him to only have medium-length hair and a goatee. His eyes were both scarred over, it looked like an acidic substance had been poured onto them, there were many scars across his face too, either from torture or from old battles. Garp and Francisco didn't stop at the sixth floor, simply continuing to walk forward until seeing the stairs leading up to the next level. Garp had to punch out a few more doors, but those were blown away in one punch, as his hockey was no longer hampered in any way. Francisco also threw away the sea stone bar he had been using as a cane, as he didn't like the feeling of sea stone anyway. Instead, he grabbed a piece of wood from one of the doors that Garp had destroyed. It made for a much better crutch. The two old men were eventually stopped by soldiers. What is this? A breakout? Again. The soldiers had different reactions to this, thankfully, a higher ranking figure was also present. Magellan walked forward, in front of his men with an angry look in his eyes. I have a bad feeling about this. Francisco said as he rubbed his long and unkept beard. Shut your trap. It's gonna be fine. Garp said as he continued walking forwards, Francisco simply sighed and followed him. Magellan was not in a good mood though. He had already been demoted to vice warden after the breakout that had happened not that long ago, having another one would likely mean he was getting fired. And he couldn't have that. Impel Down was a place he took great pride in. And it also had the best toilets. Who or why, he stopped himself as the two old men in front of him started to come more and more into the light of their torches. Vice Admiral Garp. Magellan was instantly relieved. He didn't recognize the other old man, but since he was with Garp, there was no need for him to worry. Although, something did weigh on his mind. Why did you just come out of the sixth floor of our prison? Magellan said as some thick venom started appearing on his hand. He was quick to consider the possibility of a prisoner taking on Garp's appearance. The world government agents had already informed him of a prisoner proficient in taking others' appearances being transported into the deepest level of Impel Down, he was warned to not trust anyone that came out of the lower levels. It was more of a precautionary measure that the world government took, as they weren't really expecting Garp to break out. The possibility was still there, though, so the five elders wanted to make sure. This was why now Magellan was having issues believing what he was seeing. I was sent here by Sengoku on a small mission. Garp said as he raised his hands up a bit. He didn't want to admit that the world government had imprisoned him, as that would likely raise even more questions. There's no way that's true. Garp was said to have retired to a nice tropical island after the war. There is no way he would be here, taking out an old pirate from the lowest level of Impel Down and breaking down our doors. Magellan said as his body started exuding more and more venom. I knew this wasn't gonna go smoothly. Francisco said from the back while shaking his head a bit. POV narration Francisco, the old man stood still as he felt the world around him shift. Garp. I don't think escaping without a fight is possible at this point. The old pirate said as he tapped his wooden stick on the ground. Whatever. Don't you dare kill any of them. Garp then dashed at the prison guards and vice warden. Magellan was quick to cover himself in venom, dashing towards the fake Garp in front of him. Garp covered his fists in hockey as he punched at the vice warden's stomach. 
Magellan flared up his venom and blocked the punch as he slid backwards, the rest of the prison guards quickly turned and started to circle around the prisoners while staying out of Magellan's way. This led to them only circling around Francisco, as Garp was being dealt with by Magellan, and they didn't want to get in the way of his venom. Garp squinted a bit as the amount of venom around him increased, Magellan seemed to be exuding more and more of it by the second, making him annoying to approach. After all, Garp knew that touching the venom was ill-advised, but he couldn't exactly do much else besides coat his body in hockey and hope for the best. He was strongest when fighting his opponents face to face. I don't think your way of approaching this is all that optimal. Francisco, the old pirate, said as he tapped his walking stick onto the ground. Shut it. Garp punched Magellan's stomach once more in a quick motion, sending the vice warden flying backwards and then quickly shaking his fist to throw off the thick venom that covered it. I'd recommend throwing rocks at him, Francisco said as he smiled a bit as he seemed to start reminiscing about some things. Remember how you used to slug around that huge chain cannonball? I remember you sinking a few of our ships with it. Good times. Francisco said with an amused tone. It was clear that he wasn't exactly all that fearful of the situation around him. A few correctional officers had made their way to him, Garp didn't bother to stop them, he knew Francisco could take care of himself. The prison guards quickly tried to entrap the old pirate with their sea stone man catchers. The old man simply smiled a bit when feeling so many people around him. In the blink of an eye, the old pirate's walking stick struck at the napes of all of the prison guards around him. The old man was panting, but he didn't seem all that bothered besides that. His grip on his wooden cane was rather weak, but he was still strong enough to deal with regular soldiers. I can at least deal with this much. The old man said through heavy breaths as he turned his head towards the vice warden in the distance. I'm guessing you won't be trying to finish him off or anything. Francisco said as he felt the vice warden get up rather quickly after Garp's punch. I won't just go around killing marines. Garp said as he clenched his fist and looked at the staff of Impel down with a frustrated gaze. To him, they were as much part of the marines as everyone that had participated in the war. And he didn't like the fact that he was fighting them now one bit. Well, there's a reason why they call you a hero, I guess. Francisco said with a cheeky smile. Garp had caught him up to speed on recent events, at least to some extent. Then, the old man seemed to sense something, so the corners of his mouth lowered and he turned his head to the ceiling. While this was happening, Garp wasn't exactly standing still, he was constantly ripping out pieces of the floor and throwing them toward the recently demoted vice warden. The acidic venom seemed to melt right through the projectiles Garp was throwing. The venom was getting blown away more and more, but Magellan seemed to be able to create more and more venom to replace it. The entire situation managed to annoy Garp quite a bit. If this keeps going for much longer I might actually just punch him seriously. Garp was growing more and more frustrated by every second that the fight seemed to stretch out. But not as frustrated as Magellan, as he simply could no longer get close to the prisoners. His venom could also not reach them as Garp kept blowing it away. How is a random prisoner this strong? No, I should have expected this much from someone being escorted by the CP0. Magellan stared at the fake Garp with a frustrated gaze. At this rate, I might have to retreat and clog the entrance with venom. But the other guards have yet to flee. Magellan was quite conflicted, as he didn't want to risk killing his own men or getting them stuck with the two criminals. He had already alerted the current warden of the situation, they had instructions in case the shape-shifting pirate escaped containment. The new warden had likely already contacted the world government agents by now and informed them of the situation, so they would likely be storming the prison soon. So at this point, Magellan knew that he simply needed to hold on as long as possible. Garp. Francisco asked with a careful tone as he knocked out a few more prison guards with his makeshift cane. Yeah. The old marine asked as he ripped off a large stone tile from the ground and chucked it towards Magellan. You told me about this guy. Enel remember? He said as he shook his head for a few seconds. Yeah, what about him? Garp asked as he continued to throw whatever he could towards the venom-spitting vice warden. Well. Does he happen to be able to fly and sit on clouds, by chance? Francisco asked as he took a few deep breaths and sat down on a few of the piled-up prison guards that he had knocked out. What? Is he here already? Garp asked as he blew away the venom that was coming toward him with a punch. 
Yep. Francisco simply nodded, observing the situation with his observation hockey while resting a bit. Great. I guess we'll be meeting him halfway. Garp's words were interrupted by a large explosion and a huge tremor, it was as if the entirety of Impel Down was experiencing a large earthquake. Looking to the side, Garp and Magellan could both see a huge lightning pillar had simply passed through the side of the room, likely continuing to the bottom of the seafloor. Didn't expect you to start breaking out by yourself, Garp. Enel appeared at the scene just like that, stepping out of the lightning pillar just as it vanished. Magellan could clearly see the huge hole in both the floor and ceiling of the level they were in. Garp simply sweated a bit as he looked at Enel with a weirded out gaze. Couldn't you have been a bit less destructive? His question must have been clear from his gaze, as Enel responded with an amused smile. Don't worry, I made sure to not hit anyone when building the elevator. Elevator? Feels more like a hole to me. Francisco said as he also turned his head to the newcomer. Enel was rather surprised to see another person breaking out with Garp. Who's the old guy? Enel asked, not really paying mind to any of the other people on the scene besides Garp and his fellow escapee. Oh. He's an old friend. I'll explain more when we get out of here, okay? Garp said as he sweated a bit. He hadn't wanted to cause that much destruction to impel down. He could have easily punched through the floors himself, but he was still reluctant to damage Navy property. Especially since this was a prison holding dangerous criminals that had harmed many innocent people. Enel didn't seem to have the same reservations though, either that or he had really good aim. Garp leaned more on the second option, as he knew Enel wasn't a bad person. Enel had also contributed to catching quite a few criminals in the Marines, him working to free them wouldn't have made much sense to Garp. Magellan studied the situation with some sweat on his brow. He was already having a hard time dealing with the prisoners that had escaped, now the Enel, an actual emperor had to go and poke a hole into his prison. But the familiar way Enel was speaking to the prisoner was also concerning. Enel had also called him, Garp. Everyone in the marines knew about Garp's friendship with the Sky King. So was Enel also being fooled by the shape-shifting prisoner as well. But. Enel was an actual emperor. How exactly would he mistake his friend for someone else so easily? Something doesn't add up. Magellan said as the venom around him started retracting into his body. The world government was lying to us. I mean, it's nothing new. But this isn't a good sign. Enel turned his head to the vice warden with an odd half-smile on his face. Magellan. It's great to see you again. Our last meeting was rather short-lived, I'm afraid. Enel didn't bother attacking Magellan either, seeing as the venomous warden didn't seem to be aggressive anymore. I am a bit confused here. Are you actually Vice Admiral Garp? Magellan turned his head to Garp, as he approached slowly with his hands raised, signifying he meant no harm. Of course I am. Garp shouted with anger as he threw a rock at the ground, cracking it a bit more as he huffed a bit and started mumbling to himself. 2C. Sorry about this. Magellan instantly bowed when hearing that confirmation. He was also feeling a bit glad that Garp wasn't out for blood. Seriously, what the hell was going on here? Enel asked as he crossed his arms and tilted his head. The world government playing their usual games. Nothing really new. Seems like they wanted to phase out Garp this time around. Francisco said as he shrugged a bit. Magellan simply clenched his fists tightly when hearing that. If they can try this with Garp. Then what about the rest of us? The vice warden felt genuinely insulted by the situation. After all, he had been tricked into attacking the respected marine hero. I mean, obviously. But I thought they'd at least inform the wardens about this stuff. Enel said as he looked at the hole he had created. They didn't inform us of anything. Magellan said with shame rather apparent in his tone. By the way, sorry for ruining the place. Don't worry, I made sure no one would be able to escape using this. Magellan simply nodded a bit, Enel at least didn't seem to be the type of person that could benefit from freeing weaklings on the upper floors of Impel Down. They had a breakout already, and most of the truly dangerous pirates on those floors were already roaming free. So Enel truly didn't have much to gain from doing that. He was clearly only there for Garp. Magellan sighed as the situation was getting more and more difficult in his mind. POV narration Magellan eventually looked at the three of them and decided on a course of action. 
I don't know entirely what is going on. But the three of you should leave. Quickly. Magellan said as he crossed his arms, looking at the entrance of the room with a complex expression. Fine. Enel said as his gauntlets turned into his usual boat. Neither of the old men wasted any time getting on, although Francisco did study it with his observation hockey for a few seconds. Enel, could you please hit me with your staff once? Knock me out if possible. Magellan said as he looked at Enel with a serious expression. Oh. I guess that makes sense. You get to keep your post this way, at least hopefully. Enel said as he raised his staff with his arm. Magellan simply had a wry smile as he realized that he'd get in a huge amount of shit for allowing yet another breakout. But he knew that he'd get some leniency since an actual emperor broke into impel down that time around. Clench your teeth. Enel shouted as he swung his staff without holding back. Magellan closed his eyes and did as told, not protecting himself with armament in any way. Why, Garp was about to protest, but Enel didn't give him the chance. The former marine hit Magellan's head with his staff the next second, knocking him out instantly and sending him flying into a wall. Enel hadn't gotten to befriend Magellan all that much beforehand, but he now knew that he was an extremely righteous person. He also seemed to have a lot of respect for the marine hero. Enel silently thanked Magellan for his understanding and proceeded to also get on his boat, ignoring the odd look that Garp was shooting at him. The boat immediately took off, Neither Francisco nor Garp seemed to be startled and neither of them seemed to bother to hold on to anything. Enel was able to maneuver the ship outside of the prison by going through the hole he had created, the ship had to make a few odd turns in order to do that. The ship floated and circled around and fell down for a few seconds, as Enel studied the situation for a bit before sighing. The world government was already moving out to recapture you. Enel could sense the agents rushing to the lower levels of the prison. Many of them had also gathered near the hole that Enel had created, but they were a bit too late, not managing to even catch a glimpse of his ship. Bah! What gave them the confidence? Do they think I'd just allow myself to be captured again? Garp crossed his arms with a scowl, Francisco also chuckled a bit. The world government has always been conceited. Arrogance is almost in their nature at this point. Too bad they also have enough strength to back it up at times. Francisco said with a tired voice as he started taking deep breaths. Fresh air. Warm sunlight. I didn't think I'd feel them again in this lifetime. The old man's words sounded a lot more energetic now, as he lay on the golden boat and turned his eyeless face to the sky. Garp and Enel both stayed silent for a few moments, letting the crippled old man enjoy the atmosphere a bit more before Enel finally spoke out. Okay so. Who exactly is this? He asked as he looked at Garp with a raised eyebrow. I didn't take Garp to be the type to break pirates out of prison. Unless this old man was in a similar situation to his. But I've never heard of someone with his description before. I guess telling you wouldn't be so bad, since you're a pirate and all now, Garp said, the final part felt more accusatory than anything. Enel looked away for a few seconds and started whistling a bit when hearing it too. I can introduce myself Garp. Thank you very much, Francisco said as he slowly sat back, stretching his arms around and feeling the wind blow on his body as the boat moved forward and away from him pell down. My name is Francisco de Guzman. The old pirate waited for a bit, hoping for some kind of reaction. The smile on his face strained a bit when he failed to get any, and Enel just stared at him and blinked a few times. I was the first mate of Rox de Zebek, vice captain of the Rox pirates basically. Francisco said a bit disheartened that he truly had been forgotten by the world. He hoped that some people would at least remember the Rocks Pirates. Thankfully for Guzman, Enel's eyes widened in recognition when hearing that. Instantly, he looked at Garp, who simply nodded to confirm that the old man was speaking the truth. Then, Enel decided to study the old man a bit closer. Tattered rags, cuts all over his body, all of them scarred over. Obviously old and deep cuts near his wrists and calves, signifying that his tendons had indeed been severed. His face also had a few scars, at least what remained of it. It was clear that some manner of acidic substance was poured into his eyes, it made Enel wince a bit when seeing it. You're telling me that they tortured the right hand of the strongest pirate to this extent. Enel simply tried to wrap his head around why they hadn't just killed Francisco but seeing the number of scars on his body, it seemed pretty clear that they had just tortured him for a few years before throwing him away in a cell. 
Well, I guess there is still some hope if someone as young as you remembers us. Francisco said, a small smile rising on his lips. Don't get your hopes up too much. The world government deleted every mention of the rocks pirates the second Zebek died. Even God Valley got erased from all maps. Enel said as he crossed his arms and tried to remember whatever details he could about the rocks pirates from the show. He didn't have all that much to work with in the first place, all he knew was that they existed, the name of their captain, and that all legendary pirates had been part of it at some point, with the exception of G.O.L.D., Roger himself. It wasn't all that hard to believe that more legendary figures were part of the Rocks Pirates and that their names had been erased along with God Valley. Heh. It was to be expected. I guess Garp didn't want to be the one to break the news to me. Francisco turned his head towards Garp, who simply shrugged a bit. Where are we heading, Enel? The old vice admiral changed the subject as he cracked his neck a bit. He was still mad about getting imprisoned, he also wasn't sure if returning to the marines was an option for him anymore, at least not as long as they were tied to the world government. We are going to my actual home, the Sky Islands, Enel said as he raised his palms a bit. Garp raised an eyebrow when hearing that, a bit of confusion present on his face. Wasn't that just a legend? He asked while trying to remember more details about the story of the Sky Islands. It's real, not that huge a surprise though, Roger was there before. Garp simply shrugged, deciding not to press the issue further. Sky P, huh? Been a long time since I've heard of that place. Somehow, we had never managed to get there, I guess it simply wasn't meant to be part of our journey. Francisco said as he smiled a bit. Well, very few people have actually made it there which is also why the world government doesn't have any influence there. Francisco nodded when hearing that, and Garp seemed to remember something, which made him crack his knuckles. Oi, Enel. How much exactly did you lie while in the Marines? The old man seemed to gain a sadistic smile on his face, as Enel gulped a bit, wondering if rescuing Garp was a good idea after all. Well, I kept my devil fruit a secret till the last second, and I lied about my origin, that's about it really. Enel waved his hand a bit, trying to appease his old teacher. Garp narrowed his eyes a bit, before laughing a bit and digging through his nostril with a pinky. Good, I'll trust you since you saved Ace and Luffy, don't expect Sengoku to do the same though. Garp said as he looked around the ship for a few seconds. It was a small rowboat, not that big for three tall people to sit on. Francisco himself was looking like a frail old man currently, but he was still well over two. Meters, eight, ft, tall. Enel noticed his gaze and just made the boat a little bigger, to fit all three of them perfectly. Francisco laughed a bit, saying something about having an expensive getaway. And Garp simply grumbled a bit and continued to talk to Enel. Why'd you keep your devil fruit a secret anyway? The world government had been trying to collect and produce powerful fruits for a while now. I didn't want to get on their radar too soon. Although the Dress Rosa incident managed to ruin that a bit. Enel said as he shrugged a bit, remembering more and more about his time in the Marines. Well, I guess you're right. I still don't like it though. Some rice crackers would really be nice right about now. Garp said as he looked at the clouds below him with an exceedingly serious gaze. Wait. Francisco immediately shot up with a smile on his face. We're being followed. The old pirate said as he stood up. A tired and lazy smile was present on his scared and aged face. Enel raised an eyebrow and instantly started concentrating harder on his observation, expanding it greatly as his eyes widened. I forgot that they have ways to sneak around observation hockey. Enel narrowed his eyes as he concentrated harder and finally spotted the agents that were following his ship. There were only four of them, all of them using Jeppo and approaching the ship at relatively fast speeds. Guess we have to deal with them now wouldn't want them to follow us home. Enel said with a small laugh. Bah. Like they could keep up for that long. But I do feel the need to punch something related to the world government right now. Garp cracked his knuckles a bit as he smiled. I guess they'll handle this. Francisco simply continued to sit down, yawning a bit. POV narration Enel and Garp looked backwards in the direction of the agents, they were stepping on air approaching the ship rather quickly, hidden by the clouds. Interesting. What is their plan anyway? Enel said as he rested his staff on his shoulder. Their plan. They obviously plan to try and destroy your ship, 
which would lead to us falling into the ocean. Francisco said as he tapped the golden ship a few times with one of his nails. I can fly, Garp can use Jeppo and you should be able to swim. You are listening to this audiobook on web novel audiobooks Tkthigud. They must have something up their sleeve. Enel rubbed his chin, looking in the direction of the CP0 agents with a bit of curiosity. Bah! I don't care what tricks they can pull. I'll punch them down regardless. Garp then proceeded to Jeppo towards the incoming agents with a feral grin on his face. Enel observed the situation with his hockey, as he couldn't jump away from the ship without completely halting the engines and causing it to plummet. Garp stepped into the air with ease, flying further and further away as Enel also stopped the ship, making it circle around as he studied the situation. The first punch was thrown by Garp as the old marine appeared right in front of the world government agents in less than a second and delivered a powerful blow. Two agents scrambled to block it, covering their bodies in armament hockey completely. Garp's punch wasn't easy to stop though, their armament seemed to not mean anything to the old marine, as his punch sent them both flying back towards the third agent, who simply dodged. Enel could tell that one of the two agents, the one that had taken the brunt of Garp's fist, was most likely half dead already, with his organs rupturing from the sheer force of the old marine's fist. The other one was a bit luckier, having stood slightly behind his colleague and only received a few broken bones for his trouble. The third agent, however, was oddly composed. Enel noticed this rather quickly, narrowing his eyes a bit at the strange mask the man was wearing. The other two had just been wearing regular black suits, their faces not covered by anything besides black sunglasses. This one wore a fully white formal suit, he also had a white fedora as well as a fully white mask that seemed to also cover his eyes. It was easy to tell that he was a higher ranking agent just from one glance. Heh. Garp is still holding back on them. Classic Marine, reluctant to go against the world government even under these circumstances. Francisco said as he smiled a bit. To be fair, it might just be that he is holding back out of reflex at this point, it's probably been quite some time since he's had to fight someone that can keep up with him. Enel said as he crossed his arms and tried to remember his spars with Garp. I guess he's mellowed out because of his age. Francisco said as he rested his head in his palm, also observing the situation with his observation hockey. Enel also managed to listen in to their conversation though, and the words being said were a bit concerning. Vice Admiral Garp. I see you are just as strong as the rumors. The high-ranking agent spoke out, hopping in place and looking toward Garp without any discernible emotion. The agent's speech felt almost robotic to Enel. Shut it you little brat. The five elders better have a good explanation for this stunt. Garp said as he clenched his fists, even more, his anger was extremely justified. The old man had lived his entire life in the marines, fighting for justice, only to be treated like a criminal now. It was beyond infuriating. I will give you one chance. Return to your cell along with the other prisoner you broke out with. A few veins appeared on Garp's forehead when he heard the agent's words. Really now? And what are you going to do? Garp immediately used sorrow and appeared in front of the agent with his fist cocked backwards and prepared to strike. The agent's movements were weird at that point, his body seemed to bend around Garp's punch, completely, as the agent kicked out and managed to land a strike on Garp's face. The old man simply stood there, unmoving. The kick didn't even seem to injure him, only serving to make him angrier. With a heave, Garp kicked the high-ranking agent in the stomach, sending him flying into the other two behind him. You little punks. Garp then kicked upwards, sending a huge Rankyaku towards them, splitting the clouds once more as the agents scrambled to get away. Only the higher ranking one managed to dodge perfectly, the one that had been more injured was split in half while the other lost an arm in the process. The higher ranking agent and the other surviving one both sent a flying slash towards Garp too, the old man simply laughed, using Soru to get out of his way with ease. Enel had to make a sharp turn in order to avoid them though, they both grazed the ship, but Enel fixed it instantly. Enel knew that more and more agents were going to show up at that rate, and he was getting a bit frustrated. Garp. Would you mind wrapping things up? Or should I do it for you? Enel shouted as he felt more and more boats start gathering underneath them. Don't butt into my fun you brat. Garp shouted as he dashed towards the agents in front of him again. Delivering a flurry of punches, the shockwaves were somewhat pushing Enel's boat away as Garp was finally looking to end things faster. 
This time, the weaker one did not survive, as Garp's fist seemed to turn into a shirdan and impale him through the chest. Garp shook his fist once more, discarding the body with ease as he looked at the last agent. The high-ranking agent had his mask cracked, one of his arms was bent slightly to the side with a bone sticking out. But he didn't seem to be any less calm than in the beginning. It seems our time has run out. It can't be helped. The high-ranking agent said as he hopped on one leg and looked at Garp with no emotion in his eyes. Don't try to sound coy, you little punk. Garp said as he sent another flying slash towards the agent, who managed to barely dodge it. You will regret not playing by the rules eventually. Just because you are safe doesn't mean everyone else you care about is. The agent didn't mince any words as Garp finally caught him by the neck and started squeezing. You're a few decades too young to threaten me, you little shit. Garp crushed the agent's neck with ease, throwing his body to the side, and letting it fall to the sea. Enel scowled a bit, feeling more and more agents gather on the ships below them, many of them seemed to start jumping upwards, trying to also jeppo their way towards the escapees. It was pretty clear to Enel that the world government was really desperate about recapturing Garp and Francisco. If they even remembered that Francisco existed anyway. The agents didn't get far though, Enel simply extended his palm towards the ships. Sango, with a thunderclap, Enel's palm released an erratic stream of lighting that parted in many ways, striking the sea and creating waves everywhere. All of the approaching agents were electrocuted and burnt, their bodies falling limply into the sea as Enel stopped the attack after a few seconds. The ships below were also hit by some stray bolts of lighting, creating plenty of fire and smoke. Garp also landed on Enel's golden ship, after which Enel started leaving the scene. You good now? Blew off enough steam. Enel asked Garp as he sat back down on his golden throne. Heh. Those brats weren't even enough for a workout. Garp said as he laughed a bit, though Enel noticed that he seemed a bit worried about something. Still, Enel chose not to raise the issue now. While the three of them were fleeing, a figure was standing on the deck of one of the warships that Enel had almost just sunk. It was another man wearing a white suit, a high-ranking member of the chipper pole, this time wearing a mask that only covered the lower half of his face. He seemed calm, only looking at the escaping prisoners with a cold gaze. Bring out the cannon. With a wave of his hand, he gave an order to the lower-ranking members around him, all of them giving him a fearful look before executing their orders as instructed. The agent seemed to bring a strange cannon from the hull, it was relatively large, around four meters tall, and it seemed to be a normal design. At least until one got to the cast cable, the very back of the cannon. Instead of the usually pointed metallic part to which one could tie a rope, stood a strange and mechanical-looking hatch. The high-ranking agent opened the hatch and another agent brought a strange-looking container. A purple stone floating in some water that seemed to be releasing strange energy as the agents handled it with care. It was a Dyna stone, believed to be capable of catastrophic levels of destruction on par with ancient weapons, actually. But it was in fact nothing more than a fuel source for something else. The container seemed to fit perfectly in the hatch, which seemed to close automatically as some lines on the cannon seemed to light up. Back at the ship, Enel felt something strange, merely raising an eyebrow as he sped up the boat a bit. Old Francisco also immediately perked up, sensing something as well. But his reaction was a lot different, seemingly knowing what was coming. Jump. The old cripple immediately jumped off the ship, Garp and Enel only took a half second to look at each other before both followed him, Enel even abandoning his ship, in a hurry. Just as the two of them had jumped, a huge purplish laser completely swallowed the sky. Due to their late reaction, Enel and Garp were both forced to use their armament hockey to the maximum as they plummeted to the sea. But not even Francisco was safe from it, as his skin seemed to turn slightly red, as he covered himself with hockey as well. All three of them were affected by the strange attack, but Enel recovered the fastest, as he was immune to high temperatures. Enel stopped himself short of hitting the sea, turning into a lightning bolt and raising the waters a bit, creating something akin to a shield of water around the three of them. He could notice that both Garp and Francisco had received slight burns on their bodies due to that strange attack. And they had both managed to dodge it, the burns were just from being in proximity to it. What the fuck was that? Garp shouted as he covered his eyes, Enel seemed to be just as confused as he was. Francisco seemed to have an idea of what had just happened. Enel. Can you sink their ship? Quickly. 
Francisco said as he grabbed onto Garp's coat, as the vice admiral proceeded to start using Jeppo. Enel simply nodded, tapping his hand on the energized water around him and raising a tsunami, sending it directly towards the ships that had been pursuing them. Enel dove into the tsunami himself, turning into a lightning bolt and looking. For the source of the strange laser, it wasn't long before he found the cannon that was shot towards them. The cannon itself seemed intact, but the ship appeared to be in shambles, Enel had no clue whether that was due to the backlash of the cannon firing, or his lightning attacks from earlier. Regardless, the waters rushed in and wrecked apart the fleet of government agents in an instant, reminding them that Enel really wasn't the type of enemy one could fight at sea. The ships were washed away, pushed to the bottom of the sea as the government agent on them struggled to fly away, unsuccessfully, as Enel and lightning bolt form passed through all of the ones that tried to fly away, paralyzing them and letting them sink like hammers into the energized water. After a few seconds of that, Enel felt something snap in the large ship that housed the cannon, another foreboding feeling came to him as he quickly zipped out of the tsunami and back towards Garp and Francisco. Just as he left, a large explosion engulfed that ship, blasting parts of the tsunami away and making Enel a bit confused. Was the cannon shot again? Or maybe it was just the ammunition blowing up? Enel didn't know exactly, but he didn't feel like sticking around to find out. Garp was using Jeppo to keep himself afloat, and Francisco seemed to be content with just holding onto his cape in order to not drown in the violent waters that Enel's tsunami had created. Good job. Francisco simply showed Enel a thumbs up as he held on to Garp's coat. Much to the frustration of the Marine. Yeah, good job and all, can you let go of me now? The old Marine snapped at the legendary pirate that was still shamelessly clutching at his coat. And then what? Drown to death. The old pirate smiled widely when saying that. You guys keep bickering. I'll look for some mode of transportation for all three of us. Enel then started searching for the gold that had made up his ship. After a while, Enel hadn't managed to find any trace of his former golden boat slash gauntlets, the cannon shot had most likely pulverized it completely. Great. Now to look for something else. POV narration after Enel confirmed that the only ships in the vicinity were firmly sunk at the bottom of the sea and inoperable, he cursed a bit and ended up making a small ship from his staff. It wasn't going to be anywhere near as fast, or control as smoothly, but Enel really had no choice in the matter. Get on, you fossils. We still have to leave before more idiots show up. Enel said as he rolled his eyes in annoyance. Watch your mouth, you brat slash young man. Both Garp and Francisco said at the same time. Enel didn't know whether to laugh or not, but the old pirate, the supposed criminal, was actually more polite than Garp, a respected marine hero. Can you two just get on? Enel asked as his poker face cracked a bit. Young people really have no respect nowadays. Francisco said as he swung on the ship and patted the dust off his clothes. Garp only grumbled a bit before getting on as well. Now. Can either of you explain what that was just now? Enel asked the two old men, clearly referring to the huge laser that had just evaporated all of his gold. Garp himself looked at Francisco with a raised eyebrow, seemingly not knowing much about it either. That was a Pluton cannon. Remnants of an ancient weapon that the government had gotten their hands on a while back. Francisco said as he crossed his arms and shook his head. Wait. What the hell are you on about? I'm sure I'd know if they had any ancient weapons on hand. Garp said, slapping the boat in anger and making it shake a bit. Enel glared at him before also deciding to ask a question, a more polite one. So, you're saying that the world government have their hands on pieces of ancient weapons? How do you know this? Enel asked the old pirate as he crossed his arms and narrowed his eyes a bit. Francisco was still once the first mate of the rock's pirates, Enel didn't know enough about him in order to completely trust him. Garp also didn't seem too keen on believing that information. The reason for why I know that. That cannon was initially found and researched by Zebek himself. Francisco said as he shrugged his shoulders a bit. The old pirate didn't really think he'd be believed instantly anyway, he had been imprisoned underneath Impel Down for quite some time so it was reasonable for them to be skeptical about the information he held. Enel's eyes widened in shock, while Garp simply scowled and growled, not really believing that part either. So you're telling me Zebek had gotten his hands on that cannon? But never actually thought to use it? Garp asked as he voiced his skepticism plainly. 
it wasn't that he didn't want to use it. We're talking about the cannon of a warship considered an ancient weapon. The problem was that we had never managed to get our hands on the ammunition. The Dinah Stones. Francisco's mood seemed to be rather odd when speaking about the past. Enel thought more and more about his words, listening with interest. At this point, Garp was also calming down and realizing that Francisco was most likely not bullshitting him. But the Dinah Stones are weapons of mass destruction. Are you telling me they are actually supposed to just be ammunition for an ancient weapon? Garp clenched his fist, wondering just how much the world government had hidden from the Marines. Indeed. It took us a while to realize that they were ammunition as well. Zebek was actually planning a raid on the Marines in order to steal some. That was right before the God Valley incident though, so we never really got the chance to test it. Francisco seemed to sigh in disappointment and frustration as he recounted their discoveries. Still. I find it hard to believe that they stole a large suspicious looking cannon from right under our noses. Garp said as he rubbed his chin a bit. Well, to be precise, they didn't steal the cannon, that was destroyed during your raid on God Valley. They stole the blueprint that I and Zebek had perfected. Francisco said with a frown on his face. A blueprint. Ha. Huh. Enel said as he started thinking more and more about the situation. If the world government is hiding that. Then what else might they have? It's a good idea I already started making alliances in order to not face them alone. The cannon that was on their ship. It seemed much smaller than the one in the blueprint, it's possible that the world government developed many variations of that cannon that used Dinah stones as ammunition. Francisco rubbed his chin a bit, wondering out loud about the marvels that the world government scientists had likely created already thanks to his and Zebek's discoveries. This isn't good. Enel said as he started thinking of ways to bypass the cannon. Even the small version that shot at him, maybe wouldn't have been able to kill him thanks to his high resistance to heat, but it had the potential to severely injure him. Not good indeed. Francisco chuckled a bit when saying that. Well, I am old already, so I doubt I'll deal with too many of those. The old pirate said as he enjoyed the sun on his skin and whistled a bit. This managed to slightly annoy both Garp and Enel, as veins seemed to appear on both of their foreheads. But neither one felt the need to lash out at Francisco. The old man had been transparent with them, it was clear that he also no longer cared about piracy, only caring about living his retirement while basking in the sun and breathing in the fresh air. Garp felt rather conflicted, honestly. He still remembered how Francisco had almost killed both Rayleigh and Whitebeard. He was once so powerful that his blade could truly not be stopped. Had Big Mom also not betrayed the Rock's pirates, both of them would have surely died. It was expected though, that Zebek ruled through fear, so many turned their backs on him the second the opportunity to kill him appeared. The only people that could fight Francisco individually were Roger and Garp themselves. Zebek was the only one that could confidently say he'd be able to defeat him. It was strange to see such a legendary figure reduced to an aged bag of bones that simply wanted to die comfortably. Garp first considered whether or not a pirate like Francisco even deserved to die comfortably. But he remembered how the situation was back then, the more time he spent near the old pirate the more he remembered. Francisco was the only reason the crew was able to hold out. He was the first mate, and while everyone hated Zebek to the bone, everyone liked Francisco. He was a loyal person that helped his crew like they were his family. He and Whitebeard especially used to get along the best. But Francisco's loyalty was also strong, regardless of his captain's faults, Francisco truly believed that Zebek could make it, that he could become the king of the world. Alas, his strong loyalty was also what led to him fighting for Zebek till the end. Garp couldn't even begin to compare him to Zebek when it came to character, as the two of them were simply polar opposites. Francisco's only real sin was having his loyalty directed to the wrong person. The only reason he hadn't been killed was probably that none of his previous crewmates could find it in themselves to finish him off. Roger and Rayleigh were also not the types to just kill an unconscious man, no matter how dangerous he was. In retrospect, the fact that they spared him might have been more of a curse, as Francisco had ended up being tortured and abandoned for the next forty years. Though, to be fair, it might have been just that none of the pirates that fought him checked whether or not he survived, leaving it up to fate. Well. Fate has brought him to us. I guess. Garp thought to himself as he sighed a bit. Now that I think about it. 
Garp was the one to break the silence that had descended among them. God Valley completely vanished from the map after the Rock's pirates were disbanded. Do you think they used it to test the Pluton cannon? Garp rubbed his chin a bit as he started wondering just how much destruction that cannon was capable of. Francisco simply shrugged his shoulders. Who knows? It's likely that they did though, testing a brand new weapon that they had sought after for years isn't an opportunity they'd pass up on. The old pirate seemed completely relaxed when speaking about that, rightfully so, his old bones were heading for retirement in a fairy tale land. The old man was already starting to make plans, to spend the rest of his life on the Sky Islands. Maybe he'd even get to speak to other people. It had been a long time that he had to spend in isolation, he needed to work more on his social skills now. It's likely that they used it to destroy the island, but I'll try to look into it just in case. Remnants of the island should be left there, at least traces that it had once been there, I'll visit it sometime soon. Enel said as he twirled one of his earlobes around his finger. He had the speed to travel anywhere in the world. The traces of the island were 100% buried by seawater, but Enel could control it, so it was the perfect mission for him. Good on you. Do tell me about what's left of that place, will you? Francisco smiled a bit, melancholy creeping into his tone as he remembered his home and the years he spent on God Valley. Of course. By the way. What are you two planning to do from now on? Enel smiled a bit when saying that, as he prepared his pitch. Francisco smiled a bit when hearing that voice, thinking of his retirement and eating grapes while laying on clouds. Garp simply looked a bit shocked by the question, not really knowing how to answer it, seemingly confused. I'll make the two old men join me from now on. Enel thought as he smiled internally. POV narration Garp pondered on the question for a while, seemingly caught in a pinch by said question. Really? What do I do now? The old vice admiral didn't know if he still had a home with the marines. He didn't know what the world government was doing behind the scenes and whether or not returning would actually cause harm to the marines. There were also threats from that government agent. Garp had somewhat brushed it off, as he wasn't exactly about to be intimidated by some random agent, but he still needed to take them seriously. So, the question remained. What to do next? I think I should lay low for a while. Garp said as he clenched his fist for a bit, looking at the clouds around them with frustration. That might be the best choice for you, old guy. Francisco said as he scratched his chin for a few seconds. Most likely. The world government still can't really afford to announce your imprisonment to the world, they were desperate enough to bring out one of their secret weapons here. Enel said as his earlobe swayed in the wind. I'm aware of that as well, but there is also the fact that I'm technically supposed to be on vacation according to what Magellan said. Garp said as he stretched his legs a bit and smiled. I'm sure Sengoku and Akainu wouldn't let the world government harm people that are associated with me so brazenly. As long as they aren't pirates, of course. Garp's smile seemed to become energized as he thought more and more about the situation. To be fair, I heard about your imprisonment from Akiji. I think the marines, at least high-ranking ones, wanted me to break you out of prison. Enel said with a laugh. Well, I guess it would make sense for them to leave it up to you. Otherwise, Sengoku would have come by himself, I'd hate for him to get in trouble for me. Garp laughed a bit as well as he remembered Sengoku's enraged face when the agents were apprehending him. If Akainu hadn't held him back, the old fleet admiral would have likely fought the CP0 agents then and there, which would have likely caused even more problems. Well. There's always the option of staying on the Sky Islands for a while. There will be plenty of activities to keep you two occupied, I'm sure of that. Some work will also help, Enel said with a bit of a sly smile on his face, as Garp refrained from slapping the smile off his face. Heh. Of course, you do. Francisco said as he laughed a bit, he was planning to spend the rest of his days on the Sky Islands anyway, getting to do some work there wasn't exactly what he expected, but it was a million times better than just rotting in a jail cell. What? You want me to start working for you now? Garp squinted at his former student as he ground his molars together, feigning anger as he usually did. Well, not working for me directly. But you'd be helping me achieve a few goals. Enel said his resolute gaze peering into the two old men in front of him. Francisco merely laughed as he felt that gaze. Ambitious people will exist in every generation. Huh. 
The old man had thought he'd live the rest of his days peacefully. But he had never been a peaceful person. He was a follower by instinct, his loyalty unshakable and his power growing to be more useful to the person that was leading. Taking fate into his own hands and leaving that life simply wasn't in his nature. He enjoyed the action, he had enjoyed befriending the people that Zebek had gathered. Maybe Enel will also be like that. Hopefully not as big of an asshole. The old man couldn't help but smile internally. Although Zebek was a cruel man, he had his moments as well. Which was why Francisco had stuck with him till the end. Now, Enel didn't seem to be similar in any way to Zebek. But Francisco got that feeling from him, the same one that he received when meeting Zebek, the legendary captain of the Rock's Pirates. The feeling that he'd be able to follow the man in front of him till his breath stopped. I don't have a lot of time left anyway. Why not spend it meaningfully? Let's hear his motivations though. Francisco asked himself as he eventually also opened his mouth and asked Enel. I'll agree. On one condition. Enel perked up at that answer. To Enel, even though Francisco wasn't in his prime anymore, he could still prove to be a powerful ally. There was also Bonnie. Who he would hopefully be able to convince to work for him. If Bonnie could bring Francisco back to his prime, well then Enel would have gained an ally just as powerful as Kaido, probably even stronger. If your motivation and goals are ambitious enough, then I will follow you for as long as I have left. Francisco said as he crossed his arms and tilted his head. Garp looked at the old pirate with narrowed eyes. Figures. Someone like him would never be able to just rest. At least he is going to be Enel's follower from now on, not another Zebek. Garp himself didn't know of Enel's motivations, but he knew that Enel was strong, absurdly powerful even. A person that achieved that much power couldn't be a normal individual at all. He also knew that Enel was a good person, so he knew that Francisco was not going to misbehave while under him. My motivation is rather simple. Enel said as he smiled. To reveal the truth of the world to the public. To unveil all of the world's government dirty secrets and break them down at the same time. Francisco released a small humming sound when hearing that, and Garp raised an eyebrow, it was also the first time he had heard about it. Don't get me wrong. I couldn't care less about who gets to lead the world. But the current leaders are nothing more than parasitic worms to me. I need powerful allies, people that I can trust will have my back. Are you willing to join me? Enel finished his pitch, extending an arm to Francisco, going for a handshake. Gihahihi. Fine kid. Francisco seemed satisfied enough with Enel's motivation. Enel blinked a few times as he registered Francisco's odd laughter, before simply smiling, happy that he had gained another ally, I'll stick around for the few months I have left. Don't expect me to do a lot of work though, these old bones get tired really fast. Francisco said as he stretched his skinny arms a bit. You'll probably just be a teacher for a bit. I have a few prospects that you might find interesting as well. Good enough. I don't think I'll be all that useful in a fight with how quickly I tire out. Francisco then continued to enjoy the air and sunlight, as Garp and Enel looked at each other for a while. Sue, I guess you're really becoming a pirate, huh? Garp said as he crossed his arms and looked at Enel with a complicated gaze. Not really. Enel simply smiled at that. The world government has already titled me one, but I've no plans of sailing the seas and pillaging islands. Garp simply nodded at Enel's words, expecting no less from him, a former marine that had hunted down hundreds of pirates. Just so you know, Garp. My invitation extends to you as well. Francisco whistled to the side when hearing that. Is he seriously inviting the marine hero to join his pirate crew? The old pirate thought to himself as he tried to make himself less noticeable, just in case, a fight between the two broke out. Surprisingly though, Garp didn't seem mad at the suggestion, nor did he seem all that angry in general. Rather, he simply sighed a bit and started thinking about his options. Enel noticed his conflicted emotions rather easily, and decided to not press the old man already, he seemed to have plenty on his mind anyway. No need to rush into things. You can live with us for a while on the Sky Islands. Regardless of what you choose, you are still my teacher and friend. And that won't ever change. The honesty in Enel's voice made the old marine smile widely. Fine, you brat. I'll consider joining your little band of misfits. Hey. 
Francisco said from the side, feeling offended at being called a misfit. In the end, Enel just laughed a bit as well, and the three of them continued their journey in high spirits. POV narration as Enel, Garp and Francisco were making their way through the clouds in a relaxed manner, joking around and laughing at each other's jokes, the situation at the Holy Land Mary Geos was a bit more complex. The five elders stood around their table, five old men with grey hair and grey beards all looking at reports of the situation with darkened expressions. Eventually, one of them punched the table. What the hell is this? The old man seemed to be beyond mad. All of them had similar reactions though, the mood in that room had taken a dark turn the second they received the call from Hannibal, the newly promoted warden of Impel Down, about Garp breaking out. Garp breaking out was obviously something that they had prepared countermeasures against, even going as far as to have one of their trump cards, the Pluton Cannon, at hand just in case he attempted an escape. The Pluton Cannon was shot, but Garp had still survived. Not only that, they had lost the cannon and some ammunition, a fleet of ships large enough to be called a buster call and quite a few agents in the process. The cannon itself was replaceable, they had the blueprint, and Vegapunk could basically just mass produce them. Pluton cannons weren't that difficult to make, they didn't even need any special materials besides seastone and some conductive metals. It was a lot harder for them to make the ammunition for said Pluton cannons. The Dyna stones themselves had to be mined with special equipment by highly trained personnel. Very few of them were acquired each year and the mining process was so risky that the mine could literally explode at any second. They had lost three Dyna stones on that ship. It wasn't enough to put much of a dent in their stock, but it was still enough to be counted as a loss for them. The agents they lost were also highly trained. Finding new prospects to recruit in the chipper pole and raising them up would take quite a while. When it came to fighting strength, they still had pacifistas, which were still being mass-produced by Vegapunk. But pacifistas were absolutely useless when it came to espionage missions. They were just robotic guards and pirate hunters. Pacifistas could also not deal with any decently powerful pirates, so they were only useful as a movable army to protect the Holy Land in case something grave happened. It's because of that man. Enel. One of the elders said, keeping his cool, although his anger was still visible in the veins bulging on his forehead. Enel was reportedly the one that blew a hole into Impel Down, the man that knocked down the Vice Warden, Magellan, and sailed away through the skies. Indeed. Everything seems to be going in the opposite direction of what we wanted to. And every failure that we experience seems to be related to him in some way. One of the elders said as he started stroking his beard. Doflamingo's loss of control over the underworld, Kaido's crew no longer being supplied with smile fruits, let's not even talk about the situation with Marineford. Kaido's army was supposed to grow stronger and destabilize the sea completely. Enough so that at least Big Mom would try and attack him after a while. One of the elders said as he seemed to be rubbing the bridge of his nose in frustration. They had planned for Kaido to grow the most powerful army using the smile fruits, they had agents already present on the Emperor's, closed off, territory. Smile fruits were defective goods in the first place. They had managed to coerce and lead Caesar Clown into discovering the sad formula, which was a collective of lineage factors from different animals. It worked perfectly to replicate Zoan fruits. At least in the strength given. But they made sure to have a failsafe put in place for when Kaido eventually tried to overthrow them after building a pirate army large enough and taking out his competition. The sad formula involved a faulty lineage factor, one that could grow to blow up the inside of a person that had consumed such a fruit. All the world government had to do was to activate a bunch of speakers in the Holy Land when the pirates attacked, and a sound at a strange frequency would play loudly throughout the island, turning all of the beast pirates that had consumed smile fruits inside out. Vegapunk's genius shined when he created that strange lineage factor through extensive lab testing, and the world government's deviousness shined when they managed to fool Caesar Clown into using it to stabilize the smile fruits. Now, their plan, Im's plan to get rid of the strongest pirate simply failed. Kaido no longer had any method of quickly mass producing smile fruits, as the factory had been erased completely by Enel. The situation at Marineford was an even bigger mess. With the only good thing that came out of it was the death of Blackbeard, who had managed to fool them slightly by freeing so many dangerous pirates and attacking Whitebeard. He was a dangerous individual, as him also told them that he would have most likely stolen Whitebeard's fruit in that exchange. But that was the only halfway decent thing to happen there. 
Eno betrayed them on live broadcast, attacking marines and basically tuning the war completely in the favor of the pirates. The world also saw how the marines had failed to kill even one of Whitebeard's commanders, and Whitebeard himself was more than healthy enough to escape them. Even worse. Ace survived, and the world learned that G.O.L.D. Rogers' legacy continued through him. For them, a worse result wasn't even possible. It went to the point where they regretted not using something like the Pluton Cannon in order to win the war. Enel's involvement was not something they expected though. They suspected him a bit, as he came into the picture abruptly and was absurdly powerful for his rank. But they had no way of knowing he would actually be that monstrous. The Goro Goro no Mi is one of the few fruits in the world that could stand up to an actual ancient weapon and even outshine one in some aspects. Well, at least now they knew who ate it, and they could stop looking for it. Nothing good has really happened since his appearance. It's rather clear that, whether intentionally or unintentionally, he is going against us directly. Im, his highness, has also been getting more and more stressed lately. It can't be helped. But we will go through this, the world government has had powerful enemies before and even countless setbacks. Indeed, besides, the people will eventually forget all about both G.O.L.D., Roger and Ace as soon as this, great pirate age, actually ends. We need to somehow supply Kaido with more smile fruits. But we need to manipulate a new pirate in order to do so. The elders seem to be getting a bit more hopeful at the first sentence, but they seem to all get complicated looks when hearing the ending. Finding one opportunistic and greedy pig won't be difficult. But he also has to have decent enough strength in order to catch Kaido's interest. Kaido won't start a business with a weakling no matter how beneficial it would be for him. Eventually, the elders seem to all relax. We'll deal with it. This is a setback, but we will handle it. How should we deal with Garp? Asked one of the elders, finally getting all of them back to thinking about the current situation. At this point. I think we can deal with him publicly. One of the elders said as he stretched his legs underneath the table. Indeed. Didn't he break out with one old man? At least going by the reports. Jaja Jaja. Just imagine the headline. Former marine hero breaks into impel down alongside Sky King Enel, freeing a dangerous pirate in the process. Dot. Wait. Who exactly did he free? The elders then quickly scrambled and called the CP0 agents they had available, getting all of them to give more details about the old man's reported appearance. After a few minutes, all reports of all the prisoners in Impel Down were on their table. Including the oldest records, they had, as the prisoner was reported to be extremely old. Then. They stumbled upon it. The file of one, Francisco D. Guzman. Someone that had attained one of the highest bounties in the world. Larger than all of the current emperors. This. Isn't good. The elders were then stuck mulling the situation unfolding in front of them. Out of every pirate down there. It just had to be him. One of the elders said as he sat down. Wasn't he the one that killed ten CP0 agents while bound in sea stone chains and almost dead when he was first captured, dot. He was indeed. The right hand of the strongest pirate of his generation. The rocks pirates should no longer exist, we can't afford to publish anything related to him. Regardless of his former strength, now he isn't anything more than a decrepit old man. We could try to keep his identity out of it. Yes, but then people will start asking questions about it. And that pestering bird, Morgan, would also likely start investigating it. Let's avoid that for now. But what are we supposed to do regarding Garp? We just need to keep doing what we've been doing for years. Work away from the prying eyes of the public. We can start at his hometown. We can easily hold it, hostage, discreetly. Build a base there, and make sure a celestial dragon is also moved there. The elders proceeded to throw around a few more ideas, but the consensus was done. They would just have to consult him before proceeding. Enel and Garp certainly won't be liking the news though. POV narration It took a week for the three old men to fly over to the Sky Islands, the whole way through the old men caught some newspapers and managed to find out that the world government simply hid the incident at Impel Down. It was what they had expected to happen anyways. Francisco's existence needed to be kept a secret from the world, as was Rocks and God Valley in general. After all, they had gone through a lot of trouble to erase it. So that was just about within expectations for all three of them. 
What came as a bit of a surprise was the fact that the world government decided to silently raise Enel's bounty to 4 billion berry. It wasn't hyped up or anything, they had decided to just pin some random attacks of marine bases on him and call it a day. Enel didn't really find it all that odd. The world. Government was finally acknowledging that Enel posed a huge threat to their influence, albeit silently. Well, they tried to do it silently, but Morgan made the news blow up. Creating more and more articles that proclaimed Enel as the fifth emperor of the sea. Enel wanted to laugh at that, as he remembered Morgan always being a bit of an unknown quantity to the world government. He was also relatively strong, but his influence was actually what mattered the most. The world government couldn't exactly assassinate him easily. The big bird also likely had enough blackmail on them to cause some momentary annoyance, at the very least. Regardless, Garp laughed a bit when seeing Enel's bounty. He hadn't gotten to see Enel's poster before letting himself get captured. Francisco himself was rather surprised to hear about such a large bounty being put on what was technically a newbie. You must have really pissed them off. That was what he said exactly after Garp read out a few headlines about Enel's new bounty and atrocious crimes. Still, Enel's shock was only amplified and learning that he was still a rookie when compared to good old Francisco. The old pirate's bounty had been at a solid six. Billion Barry. Having one of the highest bounties ever given to any pirate ever. His captain, Rox D. Ezebek, wasn't any less impressive. Standing tall at around six. Billion Barry, the actual highest bounty to be given to a pirate. G.O.L.D., Roger may have pissed on the world government's parade the most though when starting the golden age of piracy right at his execution. His bounty would have surely soared to new heights had he managed to do so under different circumstances. But there was no use to place a bounty on a dead man. Francisco told both Garp and Enel quite a few tales about his adventures in the Rocks Pirates. Garp also joined in wherever he could, as he knew quite a few of the tales, as some of them included him and Sengoku hunting the Rocks Pirates down. The two old men had clearly once been enemies, now they were just two people past their primes reminiscing about the days that they had been at each other's neck while laughing about it. Enel found their dynamic quite endearing. He also found out that Francisco was older than Garp, ten years older to be precise, being around eighty-seven currently. So he was rather close to Enel's age, well at least when one put both of his lifetimes together. The three of them reached the Sky Island swiftly, Enel landing his white boat near his cabin, the old man hopped off and Enel turned the boat back into a staff. I need to get my hands on some gold. Enel said as he scratched the back of his head. Hmm gold is quite expensive, might take you a while to scrounge up the money. Francisco said as he rubbed his chin. Bah, you can always steal it. You're a pirate now anyway, who cares? Garp said as he picked his nose with his pinky. The three old men then heard the cabin door open, Bonnie came out looking at them with an odd gaze. What's this now? A nursery for old men? The young pirate said as she swiped her pink hair backwards. Wait. Is that? Her eyes quickly widened as she recognized Garp, quickly taking a step back and gulping. What is the marine hero doing here? She asked as Enel simply sighed. Damn. I guess news reaches this place rather slowly. Garp said as he narrowed his eyes. He's taken a small vacation, he'll be hanging out around Sky P for a while. Enel ended up explaining the situation at best he could. He wasn't about to go into detail with Bonnie, she was far from close enough to him in order for him to tell her much. Yeah. A vacation. Say, Enel, why is a pirate from the worst generation in your home? Garp asked as he tilted his head. He wasn't about to try and apprehend Bonnie, as his situation wasn't exactly like before. He wasn't one to go after a rookie in the first place. About that. This here is Bonnie, she's got a special ability that the world government really wants to get their hands on. You can guess the rest from there. Enel smiled a bit as he spoke, wondering if Akijij had even reported about their negotiations and whether the world government had any idea that Bonnie was with him. After all, as long as Akiji ordered them to, the people on his ship would have kept silent about the situation. Gaihahihahihi. I guess we now know why the world government seems to really hate you. Francisco laughed a bit as he spoke. Enel had basically taken every opportunity to get in the way of their plans and ruin as much of them as he could. 
I guess I have been butting head with them from the shadows for quite some time. I have quite a few plans, and every single one of them somewhat affects the world government negatively. Enel said as he scratched the back of his head with a bead of sweat on his brow. Trying to ignore Garp's intense gaze when he mentioned his plans. Figures. You brat. Your schemes better not harm the marines, or I will not hesitate to beat you up. Garp said as he cracked his knuckles. Don't worry about it. The only one that was explicitly going to affect the marines was the one at Marineford. I've made plenty of friends there and I don't feel like harming any of them. Garp simply nodded when hearing Enel's words, smiling a bit as he thought more and more about Enel's proposal from earlier. Enel, I won't be joining your band of misfits. But, as long as it's something I can do, I'll help you. I already owe you quite a lot. Garp said as he stroked his small beard. Bonnie's eyes widened when hearing that. The marine hero is agreeing to work with an emperor. The situation was extremely unusual to her, she found it difficult to even comprehend. Gaihahihahihi I told you he'd come around eventually. Francisco laughed once more as he turned his head in Enel's direction with a smile. And who's this old guy? Bonnie looked at him for a few seconds, trying to see if she could remember him. But even if she had seen Francisco's poster back in the day, she had no chance of recognizing him as he was now. The trio also made no effort to inform her, instead, Enel got to explain to them, what their duties will be while they lived on Sky Island. Basically, you will both be tasked with training the people of Sky Island, this isn't a pirate crew, just a country separate from the world government, Enel said as Garp seemed to be contemplating his answer for a bit. In the end, he just nodded, much like Francisco did. I already gave them the manuals for the six powers. This is more so that they can defend themselves if something happens and I am unable to help them. Garp wanted to protest the fact that Enel had imparted the Rokushiki to the Sky People, but he stopped himself when hearing the second part. In the first place, the six powers were abilities that the Marines used to protect others. He could accept them being taught to others for protection. Garp, you would be tasked with sometimes training the recruits. Your mastery over the six powers is way above my own, so you are the best fit for this. Garp merely nodded, immediately thinking of starting to use the training regime he had used on his two most recent students. Kobe and Helmeppo, Garp somewhat missed them, but he couldn't exactly return to them yet. Francisco. I heard that your speciality was swordsmanship, right? Enel asked as he tilted his head. Of course. I used to be the strongest swordsman on these seas. I get you, I'll pick a few disciples and teach them a bit of swordsmanship. I'll also teach hockey to a few people if I deem them prepared enough. Francisco didn't need to hear any more than that, having already planned out everything on the way there. He knew that an old man like him was only useful in so many ways, as he was now, he wouldn't be all that useful in a battle, as he wasn't anywhere near as fast as he used to be. He tired out too easily as well, so the second Enel recruited him he knew that he'd have to teach a few younglings how to fight. Great. Well then, you two will be living in the city, I'll make arrangements with Gon Fall, the current leader of Sky P. I'll make sure your homes have a nice view of the sunset. Enel smiled a bit as Francisco laughed when hearing about the view. I can't wait to feel the sun on my skin in the morning after a full night of rest. I've not felt a bed in a very long time. The old man said as his bed seemed to creak like a rusty door hinge. The three old men laughed a bit at each other, while Bonnie looked at them with some sweat on her brow. A man named Francisco, one that was also once the strongest swordsman in the world. Not all that many people fit that description. In fact, only one did. The first mate of the infamous Rocks Pirates. She had heard about them, they had been active while she was still in hiding from the world government. She ended up excusing herself and heading back to her cabin, as the trio simply continued laughing and started heading for the city. Bonnie sat on the bed and looked at the ceiling with quite a bit of wonder. How did he manage to attract this many legendary figures to him? POV narration The next few days everything seemed to settle down in place. And in a week, plenty of things had already been established. Gone Fall was rather happy with having a few more old people to talk to, so Francisco and Garp both moved in rather close to the center of the city. Both of them started looking for people to train, Garp was doing things mostly out of boredom and not really taking it seriously. Although his training was still relatively tough and many wanted to give up after the first day. 
The stronger ones lasted though, which was what Gon Fall and Enel wanted in the first place. With Garp's help, they'd likely be able to create their special squad in about a year with how things were looking. Enel couldn't do much to alter Garp's enthusiasm when it came to teaching. Garp just treated all of them as regular marine recruits, he didn't give any special attention to anyone. Francisco was a bit different. Instead of teaching a lot of people his techniques, which wouldn't have been all that optimal anyway, he chose a few people he deemed talented enough to learn from him, and started with them from the basics of swordsmanship. Wiper was also among the people he chose, not as a prospect for swordsmanship, but as a prospect for hockey. Meanwhile, Wiper was also attending Garp's training sessions, starting to learn Rokusahiki from an actual master. This would also end up strengthening his body even further as he underwent grueling training from both teachers at once. Enel himself was also satisfied with the results. He had also started teaching Bonnie the six powers and hockey separately. Garp didn't want to teach a pirate, and Francisco wasn't interested in her talent all that much, so it came to Enel to take care of her. He didn't have to do much to convince her either, as Bonnie saw the situation as an opportunity to get closer to him. Huge mistake on her part, Enel's training was basically Garp's training. So, Enel spent the majority of his week beating her up and letting her heal, then beating her up again. Bonnie was obviously mad, but she decided not to complain too much. She technically got to spend more time with him anyway, so she was also advancing in her goals. At least in her mind. She thought that she'd be able to get Enel to fall for her rather easily with her looks, but he was rather reserved, even building himself another cabin a few meters off to the side of his old one. Bonnie liked having her own space, but she still found it annoying that her job of seducing him became harder. Enel had placed an invisible wall between them, as he didn't want to get too attached to her. Making her an ally would make things easier for him, but he wasn't willing to test how far she wanted to take their friendship. Bonnie's odd attempts at flirting were also solidifying his opinion of her being an open person. He wasn't one to judge, but he simply didn't have any time for distractions. Bonnie at least took her training seriously. But when thinking more about it, how couldn't she take it seriously? She was being trained by an actual emperor, if she wasted the opportunity to grow stronger with his help then she would simply be an idiot. Still, they were only a week deep into her training when Enel decided to leave her to fend for herself in the wild. Garp recommended that training method, saying it brought up someone's instincts and sharpened them to sickening extents. Enel told the old men and wiper that he would be away from the Sky Islands for a bit and that he was looking forwards to seeing how the citizens would develop while he was away. Wiper didn't protest, as he wanted to get stronger and beat him up already. Sparring didn't make much sense when Enel outmatched him in every aspect. Garp and Francisco didn't ask him where he planned to go, although Francisco reminded him to check up on what remained of God Valley. The next thing Enel did was tell Gon Fall about his departure. He also requested a few more tons of gold, which he received rather quickly, much to Francisco's surprise. The old pirate didn't know it was that easy to become filthy rich. Enel ended up just laughing at him and telling him that the sky people put more value on earth than on gold. After that, Enel proceeded to depart with Bonnie, who didn't really know where they were headed or what was expected of her. The two of them eventually passed above an island that was lacking any form of civilization. Enel smiled as he deemed it passable with his observation hockey. Strong wildlife, overgrown weeds and poisonous plants with no particular paths to walk on. It was perfect. First stops here. Enel said with a wide smile on his face. Bonnie raised an eyebrow before looking at the island underneath them. There doesn't seem to be anything here though. She said as she looked at the island all over, trying to find any form of civilization. Yep. Which is why it's perfect. I'll pick you up after a month or something. Bonnie immediately snapped her head at Enel, she opened her mouth and was about to complain almost immediately as well. Wah, but the ship underneath her disappeared just as the first syllables left her mouth, Enel recollected his gold and reformed his gauntlets rather quickly. All that he heard was Bonnie screaming and a few slurs as he turned into lightning and zapped away. Enel headed took a stop on a cloud and marked an island on his map. Heading for the country called Tequila Wolf. He could clearly remember Robin being held there as a slave, forced to help with the construction of a bridge. Currently, Robin was his only link to the Revolutionary Army, she was the one that could lead him to Baltigo, where he'd finally be able to speak to the monkey D. Dragon. 
Enel didn't know what type of person Dragon was, but he knew that Dragon wouldn't attack him. He had saved both Luffy and Garp on separate occasions, Dragon was also unlikely to reject him as a potential ally. With the help of the Revolutionary Army and their network of spies, he could find information much easier. He wouldn't even have to go around random libraries himself, he could just request the information he needed from them. And he planned to do just that. To ask the Revolutionary Army for a list of all of the gods that were known in that world, and to see if he could find any mentions of the one that was currently bothering him. He'd look more deeply into each religion that sparked his interest. He'd also ask them to provide as much information as they could on souls and willpower. He'd likely have to wait around for a bit, for them to gather that information. But he was more than willing to do so, as gathering it himself would likely take much longer anyway. He reached the country slash island of Tequila Wolf, he could see the bridge still being built there. He could also feel Robin somewhere in the crowd of slaves, still wearing sea stone shackles as she worked away at the bridge. She wasn't being treated specially, despite her status as a pirate and as the last survivor of O'Hara. Enel assumed they didn't know about the world government wanting her dead, so that was why she was just being used as a regular worker. Enel decided to wait. He simply sat around on a storm cloud for a while, sometimes going off to a city not that far away and eating there with a disguise or simply wearing a cloak. He could rescue Robin by himself, and rather easily at that. But he wanted the ship of the Revolutionary Army to arrive and rescue her first. They would only show up after a while, so Enel was expecting to wait quite a bit. He didn't spend that time idly though, as he started working on a new type of engine for his ship. It was similar to what the original Enel had built on his own, but he now had to make it much smaller, more compact. Enel wanted his ship to also be fitted with the storm cloud creator that Enel's ship used to have. He already had prepared a few dials in his backpack to experiment with them. The reason why was rather simple. For most of his island destroying moves, like Rago, he needed to have storm clouds at hand. The clouds could constantly get blown away by the stronger fighters in that world. That would leave him unable to use his most powerful techniques without spending an ungodly amount of stamina as he had back at Marineford. But if Enel created a machine that could constantly create more and hit it on the island he was fighting on, he'd basically have more chances at performing those powerful moves. Enel had been confident that he wouldn't need it in the past, as the work it would require seemed like it would take quite some time. He had also been confident that he'd be able to deal with most situations. But after seeing just how powerful the world government's trump cards were, he decided that he would also have to get even trickier in order to match them. Almost dying alongside Garp and Francisco reminded him that even those with observation hockey could be easily taken by surprise. The cannon that had been shot at him was made of sea stone, harder to detect and more unassuming than regular cannons. Its design seemed rather deceptive, made to look almost normal, but by the time one noticed the difference it would already be loaded and aimed toward them. Enel's attention was also split in a lot of different directions as his hockey could spread pretty far. In the end, Enel decided to use electromagnetic waves to enhance his hockey. It was what he had been using to listen in on conversations. But now he would use it to feel objects more precisely. It would take a lot more stamina than usual, but it would at least allow him to detect the cannons pointed at him no matter the materials. He wouldn't be able to keep that up at all times though. It seemed to be somewhat taxing, his use of it could also use some more mastery. So he would need to decide whenever he would need it. He'd have to rely more on instincts for that, but for now, at least he had set a goal to work towards in order to improve himself. So, the wait continued, Enel scouting the region for revolutionary soldiers at all times while training and redesigning his ship. POV Enel I spent the following days honing my control over my new method of using observation hockey as well as testing a few other moves using gold and other metals I managed to get my hands on. Using metallurgy is a lot less expedient than throwing around lightning like a madman. With that thought in mind, I decided to develop the ability more and more until it got to the point where I would be able to use it against stronger opponents. The fact that my staff contains sea stone is still a very good thing. But it wouldn't do much to weaken someone like Shanks, although it might disrupt his use of hockey momentarily. Kaido and Big Mom would become a bit easier to deal with if I can disable their devil fruits as well as hamper their hockey. But Shanks, and likely even my hawk, are opponents I'm not confident that Sea Stone would do much against. While it can momentarily turn off their hockey, it wouldn't weaken them all that much. As swordsmen, they would still be extremely dangerous. 
and since my staff isn't made entirely out of sea stone, both of them would likely be able to cut through any binding that I put them in. Kaido and Big Mom could also technically break out of shackles made out of my staff, but I should be able to work around them somehow, as long as I constantly keep hindering their devil fruits. I also developed a few decent moves using a combination of both lighting and metals, my training and rest lasted for around a week. Ending exactly when the revolutionary army arrived to free the slaves that were constructing the bridge. I watched over them for a while not intervening right away, as I do want them to focus on saving the slaves and Robin for now. Eventually, I also saw them saving Robin, she was escorted out by two special agents that seemed to be reassuring her that they were her allies. After that, I waited a bit more, for the ship to depart. I don't want to hold them here for too long, as the marines would likely arrive to stop the revolutionary soon. After ten minutes of the ship leaving port, I decided to jump in. Just like that, my wait was over. POV narration Robin didn't quite know what to think about her time as a slave. She did her job, but her mind constantly wandered off, thinking of the incident back on Sabaity. Seeing her captain's terrified face as she was sent away sometimes sent shivers down her spine. Although that might have just been due to the cold weather. Robin already knew that their crew was far from prepared to face an admiral ever since they had met Akiji after their excursion on the Sky Islands. Meeting Kizaru on Sabaity was yet another reminder that someone like her would never be able to survive without strength. She needed to get stronger, to protect not only herself but also the people that had accepted her as she was and saved her life on numerous occasions. As much as she was determined, she was also worried, after all, she had no idea where the rest of her friends ended up or if they were doing okay for themselves. All that pondering came to an end and the revolutionary army arrived. They freed the slaves and boarded them on various ships. She was also rescued, learning that she was considered an important asset to the revolutionary army. It was a bit concerning to her, but at the very least they didn't have any nefarious plans for her. What mattered the most to her was finally learning what had happened to her crew, or more specifically, her captain. The revolutionary army provided her with information about everything that happened to him. From his brother's scheduled execution to the breakout he staged and impel down, and even the Marine Ford War itself. Robin was shocked to hear about these events, to hear that her captain had gone through so much hardship by himself. Well, she learned that he wasn't exactly alone. So he was a Marine for a while. Ha. Huh. Enel. A name she had barely thought about after leaving the Sky Islands. She had kept his story in mind, she had appreciated his determination silently. She regretted not clearing up the misunderstanding with him before leaving the Sky Islands. By the looks of it though, Luffy had managed to do that by himself. Enel had saved both Luffy and Ace during Marineford. Not only that, but he had fought the entire navy in a terrifying display of power. Saving Whitebeard and showcasing his full power to the entire world. Robin was rather glad that her crew hadn't fought Enel on Sky P, especially after seeing the pictures taken at the war, of Enel clashing with all of the admirals at once, including the fleet admiral and even the marine hero. She was rather shocked when seeing the pictures. She knew Enel was strong, but she had expected him to be at the level of an admiral, after all, even that would put him at the top of the world. But Enel was apparently now considered an actual emperor of the seas. A person with no crew to speak of, only personal power to back up his title. At least someone like him is an ally. Not an enemy. In the past, she had thought that meeting Enel once more would be a bit awkward, but now she figured it would be rather pleasant. She'd have to thank him for saving her captain too. Not only that, but she wanted to discuss Ponolifts with him for a while. Robin sighed in relief with that in mind. The revolutionary soldiers around her also seemed to be rather glad to confirm her safety. The news also included a photo of the giant ice snake statue, their captain was in front of it, raising his arm in the air with two fingers pointed at the sky. Two years, huh? Robin understood the message instantly, smiling a bit to herself as she continued to look through the information given to her. And, just as she was about to be escorted to her room, a roar of thunder was heard from the skies, as a figure landed on their ship, shaking it a bit as he crouched down. All of the revolutionary soldiers moved to take out their weapons, and the ones with devil fruits were prepared to use them as well. The figure then got up, standing tall above the people present with a calm and lazy smile on his face. He was wearing a white shirt with rolled-up sleeves, it seemed to be tight around his developed muscles, 
and he was wearing a pair of black suit pants and formal shoes. His hands were adorned with a set of spiky golden gauntlets, making him look like a rich man. He was also wearing a coat over his shoulders, ripped and torn in places, a stained word written on its back, reading as, Justice. All of the revolutionary soldiers gulped when seeing his figure, all of them recognizing him almost instantly as they also noticed his most identifying feature. His earlobes, adorned with golden earrings and swaying in the wind. S. Guy King Enel. The revolutionary soldiers seemed to take a few steps back, looking at the situation with horror in their gazes. Indeed. I'm glad to see that my reputation precedes me even in this place. The revolutionaries sure keep themselves informed. Enel looked around the ship for a few seconds, the soldiers were still tense, looking at Enel with both fear and confusion. I don't think our revolutionary army has any grudges with you. The captain of that ship stepped forward, he was of a higher rank in the army compared to the rest of the regular soldiers, and he was tasked with rescuing the slaves and protecting them to the best of his ability. Finding Robin was like a godsend for them, as she was one of the few people that could read poneglyphs in the entire world. Now, if Enel was there for something, the captain was scared that he was there for Robin. After all, Enel was still a newbie pirate, likely looking to assemble a crew. And if he, like all other pirates, wanted to become the king, having someone that could read poneglyphs was a large advantage. How Enel had gotten that information didn't feel important that very moment, but that was the first thing that came to the captain's mind. I don't mean you any harm. Enel said that as he raised his gauntlet hands in a defensive manner, showing them that he wasn't a danger through body language. Some of the soldiers could be seen visibly relaxing at those words, but not all of them believed Enel's words or body language instantly. That is reassuring to hear. The captain specifically also didn't believe him. Would you mind if I asked you what your purpose is? The captain asked as he clenched his fists and hoped for the best. He couldn't give Robin away to him, she was too important for their cause. But he wasn't confident enough to face Enel. Maybe we can stall him a bit. They would likely have to send an emergency signal to the Revolutionary Army and hope that someone strong would come soon. But it was unlikely that they'd get there in time. So they were basically at his mercy. Enel. The captain quickly turned his head as he heard the sound of high heels hitting the wooden deck of the ship. Robin had finally caught sight of the person that had arrived on their ship, and she was visibly surprised to see him. Oh. Robin. Great to see a somewhat familiar face here. Enel's calming smile and relaxed manner of speaking served to calm the nerves of the revolutionary soldiers around him, most of them sheathing their weapons when seeing that he seemed to know Robin. It's great to see you too. We have plenty of things to speak about now. Robin said as she crossed her arms, giving Enel a rather serious gaze. She extended her arm, aiming to shake Enel's hand with a grateful smile on her face. I'm sure there will be time for that soon. Sorry if my appearance is a bit sudden. I can tell that everyone here is stressed out. I just want to meet Dragon. Enel scratched the back of his head as he shook her hand using one of his earlobes. Robin was a bit weirded out by that, but she decided not to comment on it as some sweat appeared on her forehead. At this point, all of the revolutionary soldiers that had gathered calmed down, especially when hearing him apologize. The captain rubbed his chin a bit. Very well. I think Dragon would like to meet you as well. The captain ended up shrugging a bit. Not like we can stop him from following us. POV narration The revolutionary army soldiers didn't stand awkwardly for long after their captain confirmed Enel's objectives. Everyone was glad that they didn't have to fight an emperor. Not one person thought themselves powerful enough to do anything to Enel. In the end, Enel was also given a room on their ship, one right beside Robin's, as the captain didn't think he'd be a threat to her at that point. Robin and Enel didn't speak much at first, both of them retreating to their respective rooms and resting. Enel spent most of his time catching up on some books and reading a few random parchments. His sleep schedule was already quite bad, so he rarely felt sleepy during the night. So, he kept reading till morning all until he felt Robin knocking on his door. Before even the first knock was heard, he got up. Walking to the door slowly and opening it. Just as slowly. Robin's calm gaze scanned him, and he also looked at her with a bored smile. Robin had already changed out of her prisoner attire, changing into a more relaxing summer dress. Enel also noticed that the slight tan on her skin was already gone. 
spending a few weeks on a winter island seemed to be enough to make her skin forget about the sun's warm embrace. It was rather strange to Enel, but he decided not to look that deeply into it. What he looked deeply into were her dark eyes, she was one of the people he had been most curious about, as their interests seemed to be somewhat aligned. Robin, how nice to see you drop by, Enel said as he gestured for her to enter his room. It was bare bones, with a comfortable bed, a chair and a table with reading materials spread all over it. Enel turned the chair and sat down, facing the bed, as Robin ended up sitting down on the bed. We do have quite a bit to talk about. Robin said as she smiled a bit, her calm expression not changing for one second. It was clear that she wasn't feeling stressed or scared being near Enel, despite the fact that he was arguably more dangerous than all of the people she had met previously. At the very least, he wasn't a danger to her. Hmm. I guess there might be a few subjects I can think of. But what exactly do you have in mind? Enel's words had a melodic undertone to them, as he leaned back on the chair and crossed his legs. I should probably start by saying this. I am truly sorry for what happened back on the Sky Islands. Robin bowed her head slightly, much like her captain. Enel's calm smile trembled a bit in awkwardness as he wondered why she was even bothering to apologize. But it wasn't like she had any idea that Luffy had already done so. In the end, he simply sighed. I appreciate the thought. Your captain had already apologized, so there's no need to bow your head. One of his earlobes patted Robin on the shoulder as he leaned back and spoke with a reassuring smile on his face. Luffy did? That's unexpected. Robin said as she rubbed her chin for a few seconds. Well, I guess he felt bad about it. Either that or he wanted to soften me up and invite me into his crew. I guess. Robin's confused gaze managed to get a chuckle out of Enel, but that didn't last longer than it should have. Now, on to more important business. I've not looked into any poem glyphs recently. Enel said as he yawned a bit, turning his head slightly to the books on his table. They were all history books, but none of them had the information he really wanted. And he had no way of knowing if they were truly portraying the truth. The problem when facing a totalitarian and authoritative government was that you could never know what was true and what was false. They controlled what was being thought in books and one had no way to know or verify their legitimacy without having lived the events written down in those books. Enel was having a difficult time discerning truth from lies, the only things he could be sure about were the things he already knew thanks to the show, so he was at an impasse. I've also not seen any after the Sky Island. I'm assuming there are more of them in the New World. Robin said as she crossed her arms a bit. Of course there are. Plenty to go around. But you aren't prepared to sail those places yet. Robin simply nodded at Enel's words, remembering the incident at Sabaity once more and thinking about the two years that she now had to get stronger in region with her crew. We will get stronger. Don't be surprised when your title as an emperor gets taken from you. Robin showed Enel a cheeky smile. Enel himself simply raised an eyebrow, wondering just how confident she was in Luffy. I couldn't care less about that title. I'm not a pirate. I will see my goals through to the end, then I will live the rest of my life peacefully. Enel said with a rather uninterested gaze. Robin shrugged a bit, not expecting too different of an answer. She already knew that Enel only cared about exposing the world government's lies from their previous conversation on Skype. You have got a long way to go then. Robin said, shaking her head slightly. Taking down the world government isn't that simple. They are strong, the marines underneath them are just as dangerous, as I'm sure you know. Oh, don't worry. I've been sowing plenty of seeds during my times on the marines. I'll do just fine, I'm sure of it. Enel smiled as he thought of Garp and Sengoku. Currently, all of the leading members of the navy owed him. Sengoku, Akainu and Akiji all owed him for saving Garp, Garp himself owed him for saving his grandsons. Kizaru was the only unknown quantity to Enel. The Light Admiral was known to be the most loyal to the world government, and he wasn't known to respect anyone within the marines. But he was a great friend of Akainu, so the two of them were likely a package deal. At least Enel hoped so. Kizaru was an annoying opponent in all aspects, and Enel didn't feel like fighting against him too many times. But with how loyal he was shown to be to the Celestial Dragons, they were bound to clash again. Regardless, Enel could likely garner the support of many marines, 
and he could even spur a revolt to shake the entire navy by revealing Garp's imprisonment to them. But Enel needed to wait for the best moment to do that. And he needed to get Garp to agree to that type of thing in the first place. So things weren't going to happen too quickly, as Enel didn't want to just use people that were close to him. I'm sure you'll do fine. You are strong after all. But don't get too cocky. I know you are capable of facing most foes, but the world government certainly has plenty of hidden weapons. Otherwise, they would have been taken down long ago. Quite perceptive of you, Robin. I do know of a few of their weapons. Besides weaponized ignorance in some crazily devoted marines, they also have a concerning amount of powerful weapons, even parts of ancient weapons. Robin's eyes widened when hearing of Enel's words. She gulped a bit as she started trying to remember more and more about ancient weapons. There were three of them in total, at least three recorded ones. The people of O'Hara had surmised that those weapons once belonged to a grand empire that the current world government had taken down in order to get its hands on its current power and influence. In truth, it was hard to tell what exactly those weapons were. But they were powerful objects of mass destruction capable of changing the tides of war in seconds. The fact that the government had pieces of those weapons made Robin's spine tremble a bit. No need to be too scared at this information. I was curious if you had any idea about this, but I guess not. Enel laughed a bit as he remembered the Pluton cannon shooting a hole through the sky. And no. I didn't know about this. I had assumed all of the ancient weapons were lost, and their location was only recorded in various poneglyphs. Well, you are right, but plenty of people have tried to look into them across the decades. The world government obviously confiscated everything related to them. I see. Robin looked a bit discouraged, as she remembered her efforts to make sure that the ancient weapons didn't fall into the wrong hands. I guess I was a few decades too late to gatekeep them. Don't look so downtrodden, there isn't much a single person can do against such a massive power. Enel's reassuring words made her sigh, but she also raised an eyebrow as she started thinking about whether or not Enel was able to do anything against the world government by himself. Enel smiled knowingly, guessing her thoughts just from her expression and opening his mouth to answer. Personal strength is important. But it's not everything. There were others stronger than me, and not one of them managed to take down the world government, or even come close to it at least in known history. Robin narrowed her eyes a bit at those words, not liking the fact that Enel had basically just read her mind. That was when she also took a closer look at the books on his table. Common history, huh? She asked with an amused smirk. Heh. Good for a light red, but it's hard to tell what is correct and what is modified, dot. Enel turned around slightly and grabbed one of the books with a bored expression. I could help you. If you want. Robin smiled when saying those words. Enel raised an eyebrow, remembering that O'Hara was known to have the largest library in the whole world. I guess she's the one most likely to know about history, both recent and before the dark century. Enel gestured for her to go on, realizing that there was likely a catch to her proposal. No way anything is free in this world. In return. I want you to help me get stronger. Robin's confident smile shined in the sunlight that entered his small window. With new sunrise, came new adventures, it seemed. This is interesting. POV narration Enel obviously ended up agreeing to Robin's proposition. Seeing no real downside to it, as training, someone was exceedingly easy with Garp's methods. I can work with that. Robin was pleased to hear his acceptance, but his following words managed to disappoint her quite a bit. But I will only be around for two months at most. Enel wasn't about to spend the following two years training her, he valued his time. I should be able to get whatever information I need within two months of staying with the Revolutionary Army. Robin sighed, making her disappointment audible as Enel just shrugged. I'm a busy man. I'll spend some time on Baltigo, but I have some other tasks to take care of as well. Robin ended up just nodding at Enel's words. He was an emperor, after all, he certainly had bigger things to worry about. The young archaeologist clenched her fists as her lips trembled into a smile. Still, even two months is enough. If I can learn something from him in that time then it will be worth it. We'll start your training formally when we reach Baltigo. Just so you know, I don't hold back just because you are a woman, so expect to not be able to move the first few weeks. 
Robin's smile trembled a bit once more, this time it wasn't really out of happiness or excitement. Well. As long as I grow stronger, it should be worth it. Robin regained her calm after saying that. Her eyes sparkled a bit as she looked back to the books on Enel's desk. Should we get to it? I can help you with the books you're currently reading, I'm assuming you'll have more during your stay with the Revolutionary Army. Enel also smiled when hearing that. Sounds perfect. I was a bit curious about the history of Alabasta. The two of them proceeded to talk like that for the rest of the journey. Sometimes taking breaks to sleep and or eat. Robin mostly ate her meals inside Enel's room, but the two of them would sometimes move over to Robin's room if it was convenient. During the day they would also sometimes go on the deck and read there. The captain of the ship immediately assumed that the two of them had some type of arrangement. Normally one would think they were a couple, but no one would think of an emperor as a normal individual, so that wasn't exactly the first thing that came to mind. The ship they were on was fast, incredibly so, Enel also aided that by sometimes pushing it forwards with a laser or two, boosting its speed greatly and allowing them to reach Baltigo in a week. Enel felt rather strange when seeing the island. It truly deserved to be called the Island of White Soil. He had been following a few landmarks on his map, and he was able to find out that the elusive island was actually somewhere within the Grand Line, more specifically, on the border with the Calm Belt. The sea around it seemed to be shrouded in a strange fog, and one could easily get lost and turned around by the sea when trying to cross the fog. Thankfully, the revolutionaries seemed to be trained in how to pass the fog, otherwise, Enel would have just had to fly to Baltigo at that point. Due to its secluded location, the island was not yet discovered by the world government, one of the few bastions that still escaped the influence of that massive power. Enel whistled a bit as he noticed just how large the revolutionary army was when feeling the island. It was a full country hidden in that fog, an extremely large city was built in the middle of the island where most of the population seemed to be gathered. Robin was also staring at the island in the distance with interest, she couldn't exactly feel how many people there were on it, but she now at least had an understanding of the army's size. The city could be seen in the distance, and Enel did end up telling her more about what he was feeling on the island as well, as he figured she'd also find it interesting. The captain was pleased with the time of arrival, he quickly went to report the situation to his superior. Meanwhile, the rest of the crew started making living arrangements for the former slaves that they had rescued, Robin and Enel weren't moved in with the rescued slaves. Enel was just there to speak to their leader, and Robin was a special guest, one of the few people in the world still able to read poemglyphs. Both of them were to have special accommodations. But for now, they were waiting for the one to escort them to Dragon, as both of them would have to meet him first. Eventually, Enel could feel a familiar face approaching them. A blonde young man with a rather large scar on the right side of his face, covering his eye. His eyes were round, similar to those of Luffy. He was wearing a long black jacket, with a blue shirt and vest, a frilled tie, and a simple belt holding a pair of loose light blue pants with black boots. He also wore a pair of brown gloves and the same top hat with goggles over the band. Enel could easily recognize that person. Hello there. My name is Sabo. I'm the chief of staff, I was told to take you guys to your rooms. Enel nodded a bit. Well, I'm Enel, just a newbie pirate. Glad to see the Revolutionary Army is hospitable. Sabo was technically the second in command, he came out to greet him and Robin personally, which was something he could appreciate. Sabo sweated a bit when hearing Enel call himself a newbie pirate but decided not to comment on it. My name is Robin, though I am sure you've already been informed of our identities. Robin tilted her head a bit, her calm smile making her voice sound rather serene. Sabo scratched the back of his head a bit as he gestured for them to follow. Robin did just that, walking shoulder to shoulder with Sabo, not really shy or scared for her safety in that situation. Well, it's only polite to introduce yourself, Enel shrugged his shoulders as he stepped forwards, tagging along a few steps behind Robin. Enel was the main reason why she wasn't exactly scared of the Revolutionary Army, if they tried to do something shady, then she at least had Enel. The longer-lobed fellow had already rescued her captain and his brother while fighting the entire navy all at once. She also now had a deal with him, so she could at least trust that he'd look after her, at least for the two-month period he'd be there with her. The three of them didn't speak a lot along the way, but most of the people that they passed by seemed to be rather friendly towards Sabo, most of them smiling and waving at him as he passed by. 
Enel couldn't remember much about either the Revolutionary Army or Sabo, they weren't a group all portrayed all that often, so the details about them and their internal structure were rather foggy. Eventually, the three of them arrived in what appeared to be the biggest building on Baltigo, at least from what Enel could see slash feel. It was built in the middle of the island, carved out of what seemed to be a large and spiked mountain. No one stopped them from going in, the guards at the door simply parted and looked at them warily. Mostly at Enel, as no one knew exactly what he was after. At this point, most of the upper echelon knew that Enel meant no harm, as he could have easily killed most of the people on the island already. But the regular soldiers were still rather stressed out due to his presence, unlike the ones that had been on the ship with him, who were rather used to him by now. Sabo stopped in front of a large double door. Dragon is expecting you already, I'll be heading off to arrange your homes. We aren't sure how long you'll be here, Enel, but I'll still prepare something preemptively. Sabo smiled warmly as he scratched the back of his head once more. Enel also smiled when seeing how polite Sabo was. Could you do me a favor and make our houses close to one another? Robin looked a bit at Enel when he said that. His way of talking will definitely cause a misunderstanding in the future. Of course. Sabo looked at the two of them for a bit, before walking off. I think he might have already done it. Oh well, who cares? Robin just ended up shrugging and started entering Dragon's office. Enel followed her, not hurrying as his mind was still studying the island a bit more. He wasn't paying all that much attention to his words, his mind preoccupied with understanding how the island remained hidden for so long. Eventually, his eyes caught sight of him. Monkey D. Dragon. Dragon was a tall middle-aged man with spiky black hair and a dark red tattoo on the left side of his face. He also had a bit of stubble on his chin. He was wearing his usual long green cloak, underneath which he wore the orange garb of a revolutionary. He seemed to smile warmly when greeting Robin, but his expression was a lot colder when his gaze met Enel's. Emperor Enel. Revolutionary Dragon. Neither of the two smiled as they both tested themselves with their gazes for a few seconds. The atmosphere in the room took a turn as the two of them had similar thoughts. He sure is worthy of being called an emperor. So he's also at the level of an emperor, huh? Ahem. Robin's fake cough managed to break both of them out of their stare down. Enel smiled awkwardly and looked at Robin with an apologetic gaze. Dragon's usual grin also returned, as he also nodded to Robin, silently apologizing for ignoring her like that. And just like that. The meeting began. POV narration, now, let's start with you, Robin. Dragon was the one to speak first after that awkward stare down. Robin simply nodded and Enel took a seat on a nearby chair, crossing his arms and legs while looking at the situation with quite a bit of curiosity. As you know, your knowledge is something we need, and we've been looking for someone with a perfect grasp of pwn glyphs for quite a while. Dragon said, his usual grin plastered on his face as he looked at the devil's child with a warm gaze. Your associates had told me something similar in the past. What exactly is your goal here? Robin asked, tilting her head slightly as her calm gaze scanned over the father of her captain. Enel didn't say much while looking from the side, he also had no clue what Dragon was truly after. Not having many things to go off of even in his memories of the show. My goal is similar to yours. As you probably know already, the goal of the Revolutionary Army is to bring down this authoritarian government that has enslaved and killed so many of us. Dragon's grin didn't die down one bit, not even when talking about the government's crimes. It was to the point where Enel thought the grin was just his poker face. In order to do so, we need to find out more about the things that they've been trying to hide. That's where you come in. Dragon looked at Robin with an intense gaze. You are the only person that perfectly knows the language, the last survivor of O'Hara. We need your help with this. I see. From the way you've worded things, I'm guessing you have people capable of transcribing some parts of the poneglyphs, right? Robin looked at Enel to the side as she spoke. If he was able to learn it by himself, then others must have been able to do the same. Quite perceptive of you. We do have a designated team, all of them knowing the ancient script to some extent. But mistakes in translation happen quite often, which leads to constant revisions, and we are usually unable to translate more than half of a poneglyph. Robin raised an eyebrow at that claim. 
even half of it was rather impressive, it meant that the revolutionary army could make out bits and pieces of the world's history even without her. Still, only having bits and pieces meant that they were missing half of the story, interpreting the other parts of the text would be almost impossible with nothing to go off of. I guess not everyone is like Enel. I'm still confused as to how he was able to decipher poemglyphs by himself. Robin rubbed her chin once more as she looked to the side. Enel had been able to decipher the ancient language by himself. To Robin, his achievement was the mark of a genius mind at work. She had no way of knowing that he had some external help in the form of the memories of his previous life, so to her he just reverse-engineered an ancient language from nothing. Which was a feat many couldn't even dream of, let alone attempt to achieve. Enel himself was sporting an interesting look in his eyes. Didn't expect the revolutionaries to be that far ahead. But I guess it does make sense for them to have accomplished at least this much. After all, if they had absolutely no knowledge of poemglyphs, then they likely would have tracked down Robin a long time ago, not just now when she was 28-year-old woman. I guess this team of theirs reached a bottleneck recently, and that's when they started trying to seek her out. I understand, so you want me to help this team of yours with translating texts? Robin gave Dragon a bored gaze, not really being intimidated by the revolutionary leader's overwhelming presence. Well. That, and if it's possible. Would you be able to teach a few from our team the rest of the language? Dragon was looking down at this point, his grin residing into a more serious expression. After all, he knew that the ancient language in general would be a taboo subject for a survivor of O'Hara. He wasn't daft, unlike his son. Robin could be seen mulling over some thoughts, not exactly sure how to answer, so Enel decided to push her a bit. I guess the more people know it the better, huh? Enel couldn't see anything wrong with more people learning how to decipher poemglyphs. The world government was certainly incompetent in places, the fact that Nico Robin was still alive was one of the parts that best highlighted their incompetence. During the time she was free, she was basically able to teach countless people the ancient language, and the world government was just sitting on its ass while she was roaming the world. Enel chuckled a bit as that thought reached his mind, he looked at Dragon, then at Robin, who still seemed to be conflicted. Eventually, though, she sighed. Then her tone seemed to gain a lot of confidence. I can act as a teacher, but I am not really the only person with a near-perfect grasp on this language. Robin gained a mischievous smile as she spoke, and Enel narrowed his eyes a bit. Hmm. Have you taught it to others in the past? Dragon seemed excited at the notion, after all, having more people in the world know how to read poemglyphs would really be shitting on the doorstep of the world government. Unfortunately, the answer wasn't exactly what he was expecting. No, unfortunately, I didn't want to teach it to others. I was afraid of it falling into the wrong hands. Dragon deflated a bit, before nodding, accepting her response. Enel also knows it almost perfectly. I've seen some of the texts that he translated, and there weren't all that many improvements to be made to it. Robin gazed at Enel as she spoke, her mischievous smile hidden behind her palm as Enel glared at her. Is she hoping Dragon will convince me to spend more time here? Not gonna happen sweetheart. Dragon looked at Enel with a shocked gaze, he rubbed his chin for a while, thinking about the situation a bit more. I see. This is good to know, Enel, would you mind helping us as well? Dragon asked, this time bowing fully. It could be said that Robin owed them, as they rescued her from slavery. But it was actually the opposite with Enel, where Dragon owed him for saving Luffy during Marineford. Sure. But my help won't be free. I need your help with some things. Enel said as he slowly sat up, circling around the room a bit as he looked at the paintings on the walls with a bored gaze. Of course, we will do our best to assist you with anything you require. With both of you helping us, everything should go much smoother than before. Dragon straightened his back and nodded. A business transaction was a lot better, at least he would know that Enel had something to gain and what he had to gain by helping them. If Enel had agreed to help them out of the goodness of his heart then Dragon would have been a bit more cautious around him. What do you need information on? The sooner you tell me the faster you'll get what you want. Well, first off, I need information on every single religion in this world. Any you can find, of course. Both past and present. Enel looked at Dragon with a bored smile, his gaze scanning the room a bit more. I will also need any information you can find that is related to the soul and how it affects willpower and consciousness. 
Robin looked at Enel with a curious gaze, she wasn't exactly expecting him to ask for that, she figured he'd likely ask for them to find some glyphs or something similar. I guess he has other problems and interests as well. I see. Dragon also smiled when hearing Enel's request. If that is all then I will put my best man on the job, we should see some results in a few weeks. I'm not sure about the second request, but the first one should be rather straightforward. Don't worry about it, bring any results your men are able to find to me. I'm already assuming that there are plenty of theories on souls and willpower, I want to study them all. Dragon's smirk widened when hearing that. Enel's request was a straightforward one, he also didn't request any information that could harm the revolutionary army, so Dragon was obviously happy to provide anything he could. Of course, granted Enel also kept his part of the deal. But that would remain to be seen. Good. Perfect. Dragon seemed excited that the negotiations went well, Enel sweated a bit when seeing him that excited. Should he really celebrate this openly after a deal? Robin had a similar thought, but neither of them commented on it, chalking it up to Dragon just being somewhat similar to Luffy. One last thing. I'm sure your people have heard rumors of Garp going on a vacation. Right? Enel figured he'd inform Dragon of his father's whereabouts. Yes, I currently have some of my men looking into this. Why? Dragon's excitement seemed to die down, as his tone became serious. It seemed that Dragon was still not the type to joke around when it came to family. I'm sure you're aware how uncharacteristic this is for him. To just vanish like that. Dragon simply nodded at Enel's words, his worry growing as the seconds passed by. Garp was imprisoned by the world government a few weeks back. Enel decided to just rip the band-aid off quickly. And he received the reaction he hoped for. Dragon's smile turned upside down, his eyebrows scrunched up as the clouds above Baltigo seemed to be roaring with anger. Enel squinted a bit, as he felt a powerful conqueror's hockey wash over the island, all originating from Dragon. Enel stepped in front of Robin, shielding her slightly. He was unaffected, although he didn't try to clash with it. After a few seconds, Dragon seemed to calm down, the veins on his forehead were still visible though. Sorry about that. Dragon said as he rubbed his forehead in frustration. Don't worry about I, Enel's words were interrupted by the door to the room being pushed open, Sabo's figure jumped in almost instantly, he seemed prepared to fight to the death. Dragon. Are you all blurred? Dragon proceeded to punch Sabo in the head, sending him flying out of the door. Knock before you come in. Dragon shouted as the doors closed on their own. I guess he felt the need to hit something. Enel looked at the situation with an empty gaze, while Robin was still shivering from the conqueror's hockey that had washed over her before. It was a miracle she hadn't passed out. Well, she would have had Enel not stood in front of her. Enel. Can you please tell me where he is being held? Don't be so worried, dragon. I rescued him a while back. He's living with me on the Sky Islands for now. Enel said with a small smile. Why didn't you start with that? Dragon shouted, anger in his voice palpable, but Enel could tell that most of his stress seemed to have vanished. I was judging your reaction. Call it a small test, dragon. If you didn't care for your family, then our deals would end the second I got my hands on what I needed. Dragon raised an eyebrow at that straightening himself up once again. Enel had just come into his territory, made a deal with him, and even tested him, to see if they would be able to become allies in the future. He didn't even bother to hide that fact, despite the fact that it could potentially anger him. This Sky King. He's a lot more shrewd than I expected. POV narration Enel's meeting with Dragon ended not long after his small test. Enel did make it clear that he was looking for a long-term partnership with Dragon and the Revolutionary Army. But Dragon was still not quite sure what to think about Enel as an individual. On one hand, he had saved both Luffy and had rescued Garp from Impel Down, but on the other, he was also a dangerous individual, any one of his plans could end up affecting his revolutionary army, much like they did affect the marines. Dragon was a bit ashamed of his outburst, but the family was something he would always care about, and hearing of Garp's imprisonment managed to anger him beyond anything else. Although the father and son duo Weren't on great terms, Dragon still considered Garp his father, a blood bond couldn't simply be broken so easily. In the end, after a few hours of contemplating, Dragon reached a conclusion. If Garp is able to trust him, then I will try as well. 
but the second he does something harmful to the Revolutionary Army is the second our partnership breaks. He decided to trust Enel. But he refused to drop his guard. First, I'll have to see exactly what type of person he is during his stay here. Sabo should be able to keep tabs on him. And so, Enel's stay at the Revolutionary Army HQ started. The very next day, Dragon contacted his agents to look for the information that Enel had requested. Plenty of them were confused about Dragon's sudden interest in theology, but no one really questioned his orders. Robin and Enel were both moved to the outskirts of the island, their homes next to one another. They ended up spending more time together in either home, neither of them all that concerned over how their situation looked to the outside world. Enel had decided to keep his end of the deal and start teaching Robin. Helping her grow stronger. The first thing he wanted her to learn was Rankyaku. It went well with her ability to create countless limbs. Having all of them send flying slashes would be draining, but two years of training would be enough for her to acclimate to it. Robin took well to her training, she had also started sparring with Enel daily. Enel obviously didn't even come close to getting serious, but he did punch her around all over the place. Robin didn't complain all that much though, physical training might not have been her forte, but she accepted Enel's harsh training anyway, as she could feel herself grow stronger after each session. This went on for another week before Sabo finally came and interrupted them. Hello Robin, Enel. He was waving at them enthusiastically, not caring about interrupting them from their training, as he felt rather bad seeing Robin being beaten around like that. Sabo. Figured it was about time someone would show up. Enel, the one with the most energy after the training, was the one to speak up. He was currently wearing his training clothes. Which basically meant he was wearing his baggy pants, with no shirt or shoes. He didn't like staining his suit, and these were comfortable clothes at the end of the day. Robin was still sprawled on the ground, panting and with bruises all over, which would make most people that looked at her wince. But Enel didn't seem to be all that bothered, having been the one to create those bruises in the first place. W.L., yeah. Sabo rubbed the back of his head as he stopped looking at Robin with pity in his eyes for now. The leader of the archaeology team is prepared to meet with you now. She wants to set up the dates for the classes as well as inquire a bit more about poneglyphs. Sabo said as he gestured for the two guests to follow him. Robin was still on the ground, not quite ready to start moving around. This led to Enel just carrying her on his back. He didn't bother to get changed, only putting on a white furry coat that reached all the way to his ankles. I'm comfortable enough, so I don't care. Enel also wanted to get it over with quickly, as he didn't have a lot of time to spend there. The faster he kept his end of the deal with Dragon, the better things were for him. Robin also didn't seem to care about the way she was dressed. She was just wearing regular violet sportswear. The three of them traveled a bit further into the center of the island, arriving in front of a large building with a book sign right at the entrance. Really basic. Robin, who was still on Enel's back, commented half-heartedly while yawning a bit. Who are we to judge? Enel just shrugged with his earlobes as he continued walking into the building. The outside was looking like a regular home, but the inside did manage to surprise both Enel and Robin at the same time. The building was mainly underground, at the top of the staircase, Enel and Robin could see a huge library, one so big that it could almost compete with that of O'Hara. I can only hope this library has just as many history books. I'm taking back my previous comment, this is quite nice. Robin said as she tapped Enel on the shoulder, signaling for him to put her down. Enel obliged, crouching down slightly and letting her slide off his back with ease. I'm glad this place is to your liking. Dragon went through a lot of trouble to acquire all of these books. Sabo said with a proud smile, being quite happy with their reactions. I bet. I'm assuming he had to visit every old person in the world to collect the editions with the least editing from the world government, right? Enel said with a small smile as he could see that some of the books on the shelves were extremely old, which gave them more authenticity in his eyes. Something like that. Sabo laughed a bit as the three of them climbed down the stairs and into the main hall of that large library. The atmosphere was bustling, dozens of people were reading books, either together or by themselves. Enel could see that there were some even trying to decipher small transcripts from poneglyphs, no doubt some type of exercise to familiarize them with the language. So they are training quite a few people in the ancient language. I thought we'd be teaching one or two people, but I guess we'll be running college courses. 
Enel smiled to himself as he thought about the situation. It had been a long time since he had acted as a professor, he remembered doing so in his past life after making his great discovery and becoming renowned in his field, but many years had passed since that time. Oh yeah. Fair warning. Sabo's voice sounded out again, gaining the attention of both Enel and Robin rather quickly. The team leader can be a bit eccentric. Yeah, that's the word. Enel chuckled a bit as he remembered that most of the people he had worked with in his past life could have been described as eccentric. Hell, most would have even described him as an eccentric person. We'll keep that in mind. Robin nodded as the three of them eventually reached a room to the side. Enel could feel what was inside of it, nothing more than a regular office, not large like dragons, also not decorated, it was basic. The only thing peculiar about it was the fact that it was filled with a variety of sweets. There was also a person inside, the three of them entered the office after Sabo knocked on the door a few times, and Enel finally got to see the face of one of the few people able to read Ponglyphs. It was a blonde young woman, she had a pair of bright blue eyes and she was wearing a tight pair of jeans and a white jacket with a white t-shirt underneath. She was sipping on a large mug of what Enel assumed to be black coffee while eating what seemed to be a chocolate-filled croissant. Sabo. What did you want? I'm on my lunch break. The woman spoke with her mouth full, obviously not horribly interested in the newcomers. Larthai, did you forget that Enel and Robin were coming around today? Sabo seemed to tilt his head at an odd angle. Enel could feel some anger coming from the chief of staff, so he decided to just defuse the situation a bit. Eh, who cares? You did say she was eccentric. Enel's shrug made Sabo cough a few times. Anyway, I'm off. I still have some work to do. Sabo waved at Robin and Enel with a smile, his previous anger seemingly forgotten. Feel free to ask for me if you need anything. I guess he was just playing around. Anyway. Now that he's gone. I'm glad to meet you too. The woman walked up to Robin and Enel, putting her coffee and food down while studying the two of them a bit closer. She wasn't all that tall, only standing at around one. Meters, five, hefty, from what Enel could see. Robin was taller than her by quite a bit, and Enel basically towered over both of them. The blonde woman was quite good-looking, somehow, her bust was of normal size, around half of Robin's, and her figure was also well-proportioned for her size. Enel raised an eyebrow as she seemed to study the two of them quite a bit, getting a bit too close for comfort to both him and Robin. In the end, she seemed to remember something, slapping her forehead with an open palm, then extending that same palm towards them. Sorry about that. I have some issues with that. My name is Rhonda Larthai, you can just call me Larthai, I don't really care. The woman spoke with a wide smile, as Enel and Robin took turns shaking her hand. It's a pleasure. Robin said as she smiled at the enthusiastic archaeologist. No, no. The pleasure's all mine. I've been hoping to meet you for a long time. I'm so glad to finally see you. Enel looked around the room awkwardly as the two of them conversed, not really sure how to intervene, or if he even should have. Eventually, he got bored of counting the number of suites in her office, and he also joined in the conversation. The three of them would then proceed to speak about quite a few things, and also make arrangements for the future classes that Robin and Enel were going to run. POV narration Larthai didn't hold them up for long, Enel and Robin decided to start their classes the very next day. Robin did spend a bit more time speaking to the archaeology head while Enel ended up just eating some pancakes he found laying there. He didn't pay much attention to their conversation, but they were mostly talking about ponglyphs. Their subjects also seemed to involve theories about the hidden history of the world and what the world government was trying to hide. Usual girl stuff, I guess. Enel munched on random sweets as he was still being ignored. For some godforsaken reason, Larthai seemed to not be all that interested in him, an actual emperor of the seas. But she was interested in Robin by the looks of it. The head of the archaeology team did end up giving both of them some advice before they left. By the way, not my job what you guys do behind closed doors, but Enel, please refrain from hitting her face, wouldn't want bruises to show up during class. Larthai gave the startled Enel a thumbs up after that, Robin raised an eyebrow, she was about to interject but decided against it after thinking about it a bit more. I'm not the one being suspected of domestic abuse. He can speak for himself, 
it's his fault his training is this harsh anyway. Don't worry. I'll refrain from hitting her face during training from now on. Enel tapped himself on the chest and walked out, thinking the misunderstanding was cleared with his words. Unfortunately for him, no amount of words from a suspect would ever clear suspicions. Larthai simply sighed as she looked at Robin. I guess some would call it training. In truth, it wasn't that everyone started thinking Enel was a wife beater, it was just that his training basically consisted of beating Robin to a pulp every day. That coupled with the two of them sticking together all the time, people started putting two and two together, leading some to reach that conclusion. Robin simply shrugged. He must know something. Otherwise, he wouldn't be an emperor. Her tone sounded hopeful, as Larthai simply sighed. Power dynamics in their relationship are really skewed. Larthai placed her palm on her cheek in concern as Robin also started walking back to her home. Still, I can't shake this feeling. Nico Robin sure looks really familiar. Larthai was left alone in her office, to continue drinking from her already cold coffee as she tried to put her finger on the origin of that strange thought. Meanwhile, Enel was looking everywhere around him with a poker face, wondering how his alliance with Dragon would be affected by the domestic abuse rumors. It should be fine, both Sabo and Robin can vouch for this being just regular training, and for the fact that I am single. Robin walked behind him, not really concerned by the rumors or clearing up the misunderstanding. She liked to think of it as retribution for Enel's rough training and the constant beatings he gave her. She had accepted the training, and she could feel that she was growing stronger, but that didn't mean she had to like the pain that came with it. Getting a bit of off-hand revenge like that felt satisfying. Of course, it was only fun because it wasn't affecting him directly in any way, Robin didn't actually want to harm Enel at the end of the day. If she really wanted to stir the pot, she could have started crying some crocodile tears while following Enel, but that would have been a bit too much. The newbie emperor decided to stop caring about the situation altogether and proceeded with the rest of his day as usual. He didn't spare Robin the harsh training, but he did refrain from hitting her face now, as he wanted her to look well for the classes they were about to conduct. The classes themselves were held in a rather large auditorium, and not just the archaeology team was attending, but all of the higher-ups were present at the lecture. Even Sabo and Dragon seemed to be interested in learning more about Pongliffs. Enel and Robin both walked up to the podium, being greeted by dozens of faces, Larthai was also somewhere in the audience, and she seemed to be carrying several notebooks, preparing to write on two at a time by the looks of it. Nerd alert! Enel thought to himself as he remembered how some of his students in the past had been similar. It was odd how he called others nerds when he was technically the biggest nerd of all. Greetings everyone. I'm glad to see so many friendly faces in here. Robin greeted the audience with a bright smile on her face, she was wearing rather conservative clothing for once. A purplish leather jacket covered her torso and arms, only leaving a bit of cleavage out, as she seemed unable to zip it up properly due to her large bust. A pair of long jeans and high heels also accompanied it, all form-fitting and with matching colors. Enel was also back to wearing a black shirt with rolled-up sleeves, dark blue suit pants and shoes. His golden gauntlets were still present, but a little less bulky and spiky. His staff was strapped to his back, right behind his frilly white coat with the word, Justice, spelt on its back. Well, today we have quite a few things to talk about. This will be an interactive class, so don't expect you'll just be able to sleep through it. Enel said as his lazy gaze scanned the crowd. I figured they'd want more people to know how to read poneglyphs. But do they actually plan to make it common knowledge? Enel sweated a bit as those thoughts settled in his mind. But he didn't let his apprehension or confusion show outwardly, merely starting the lesson the way he had planned it with Robin. We'll start off with a question. Can anyone tell me what the ancient script is? In broad terms, of course. A student from the research team raised his hand to respond to that. The ancient script refers to the language which is encountered in poneglyphs. That was about the extent of the understanding that most of the archaeological team had. Correct. But not exactly what I was hoping for. Enel's words seemed to confuse some of the people in the room. Enel sighed as he reminded himself that the Revolutionary Army didn't come close to the understanding that the people of O'Hara had in regard to the poneglyphs. The ancient script, in the first place, was a language created by the people that wanted to record the history of the world in a covert manner, to prevent the current world government from erasing all of the records of their past. 
Some theorized it to be the actual language that a once great kingdom had used during the void century, even knowledge of that kingdom's existence is something that the world government considered a threat. Many people seemed to have questions regarding that, but Enel didn't bother with them for now. Larthai was mostly writing down what she was hearing, as Enel was remembering more and more about Pongliffs. In my travels, I had discovered that the Pongliffs originate from the land of Wano, and that is also most likely the origin of that language, where it was created. Enel could see that even Dragon was surprised by that information, Enel smiled as he continued. Joel D. Roger, the former pirate king, was able to read the Rio Pongliff thanks to a samurai on his crew, that originated from the land of Wano. Enel was then interrupted by Larthai, of all people. Do you have any proof? What you are saying is interesting, and certainly thought-provoking. But how can we be sure it's the truth? Physical evidence isn't something I can provide. Enel shook his head a bit, his eyes closed as he thought about how to respond to that. It didn't take long though. That person on Roger's crew, he was called Kazuki Odin. Part of the royal family of the Wano country, he even had a wanted poster at some point, though I was unable to find it. Enel shrugged and continued to explain more. The Kazuki family should be the one where Pongliffs originated from, the world government also shouldn't be aware of this, but I was able to find out about it in my travels. Murmurs seemed to fill the study hall as the people inside started thinking more and more about the implications of Enel's words. So, that paints a more exact picture of the ancient script and its origins. Let's continue with the next subject. Ancient Weapons Enel smiled widely, giving everyone a good look at his white teeth as they shined in the light. POV narration Robin looked over the crowd with a bit of frustration in her gaze. She had accepted Dragon's request, but that didn't mean she was 100% comfortable with imparting the knowledge of Pongliffs and the ancient script to so many people. She had guarded it for a long time out of fear. After all, only in Pongliffs would one be able to find the location of the ancient weapons. If those were to fall into the wrong hands, then the world would suffer greatly. And she felt responsible for that. But meeting Enel gave her a bit more perspective. Just like Enel, others should have been able to research the Pongliffs covertly as well. Suddenly, the load off her shoulders was taken off. Even if it was only one person that she knew about, now the situation became a possibility in her mind. Now she wasn't the only person that could read Pongliffs, she wasn't truly alone in that fight. And if Enel saw no issue with teaching that many people the language, then neither would she. It was rather the opposite, she enjoyed seeing his enthusiasm as he spoke on the subject of Pongliffs, revealing information that even the residents of O'Hara weren't privy to. It was somewhat ironic, Enel was a much greater threat to the world government than the entire island of O'Hara, yet they couldn't do anything about him either. It was likely that they didn't even know about his research on Pongliffs and the world's history, which was quite impressive as that was his main profession, an archaeologist. The thought made Robin quite pleased, seeing the world government fumbling about while Enel pulled the strings and prepared the stage in order to bring them down was extremely enjoyable. Ancient Weapons now, this is actually my expertise. Robin raised an eyebrow at that phrase. His, expertise, he says. Almost like he didn't bring a lot of newfound knowledge to the table in every other field as well. Even her part of the lesson had plenty of additions from Enel. Enel didn't have a lot of exact knowledge yet, he didn't know quite how history had played out. But he seemed to have a pretty good understanding of all the parties involved, which was beyond impressive, as not even O'Hara had gotten that far. Robin could see that quite a few people in the room were excited when hearing about that. Ancient weapons were something that plenty of people knew about, but not many knew a lot of details about those weapons. We'll start with the first one, Pluton. Enel's smile seemed to be contagious, as he scanned the room with his eyes. Pluton is a warship powerful enough to be considered an ancient weapon. It's also considered the only ancient weapon that can be replicated. It's said to be able to wipe out entire islands with a single cannon shot. With good reason as I've recently found out that the warship uses Dyna stones as ammunition. Enel could see quite a few confused gazes in the crowd, few people besides Dragon seemed to have any idea what Enel was talking about. Dyna stones are objects capable of mass destruction, they are currently in the possession of the world government and the marines. Each one is capable of almost destroying an island, and many of them together could even erase any trace of an island ever being there. Dragon explained in a calm tone, although he seemed to be rather surprised by Enel's words as well. 
Quite a few people in the room looked at their leader with a thankful gaze, and then attention was directed back to Enel, who continued. Thanks for that, dragon. It's true that they are objects of mass destruction, but they are also the ammunition, and possibly the fuel source to that ancient weapon. Recently, whereabouts of the blueprints for Pluton had been discovered by some chip or pole agents, but the one safeguarding them managed to rip them apart before they got in the wrong hands. This time, Robin looked at Enel with wide eyes. A bit of panic ran through her mind as she clearly remembered that the blueprints for Pluton were with Frankie during the Eni's lobby incident. She did calm down after a few seconds. I guess he found reports regarding the incident. Currently, said Keeper should be the only one that should believably have knowledge on how to construct Pluton, thankfully, he is out of the reach of the world government. Robin also gulped a bit at the conclusion Enel had reached. She could only find solace in the fact that Enel didn't seem to be a danger to the world and would likely not misuse an ancient weapon of all things. I'm guessing you all have plenty of questions, but I will keep that person's identity secret for now. I know plenty about the incident as I've been paying attention to the world government's movements for a while, even while infiltrated in the Marines. Enel decided to use that as an explanation, not expanding further on the problem and simply continuing with the next weapon. Next weapon we'll talk about is Poseidon. Now, little is actually known about it on the world government side, so I'm about to give you some basic information about it. The people in the auditorium seemed to be getting more and more interested in the lecture as the time went on, even Robin was immersed in Enel's words. Poseidon is not an object. It is merely an ability that seems to manifest in an individual. It allows one to communicate with and command sea kings. The wielder of Poseidon seems to have command even over the strongest sea kings living at the depths of the seas. Enel blinked a few times, there weren't any questions at this point, as most people in the archaeology team seemed to be a bit too busy taking notes. This ability of Poseidon is tied to a prophecy, one that is definitely also tied to the great kingdom from the void century and even the One Piece, but I won't get into details about that. Enel at that point could see everyone's gazes snapping at him as if he had just said something outrageous. He simply shrugged, ignoring any raised hand and continued. Poseidon already exists and has manifested in someone. A person whose identity I will once again keep secret, for their own safety, of course. At this point, even Dragon seemed to have plenty of questions. How do you know any of this? If what you say is correct, this is information that even the world government doesn't seem to know about. Larthai looked at Enel with a skeptical gaze, she had stopped writing at some point, being too immersed in listening to Enel's words. I understand your skepticism. But these are things that I've discovered over entire decades of looking into this matter covertly and traveling the world. This isn't something I've theorized over a lunch break, this is the result of years of hard work and searching. Larthai seemed to be satisfied with the answer, nodding a bit and blinking a few times before coughing in embarrassment and apologizing for interrupting the lecture. I can tell you all now, that my discoveries certainly had a lot of luck involved in the mix. As the last ancient weapon on our list still remains a mystery to me. Everyone seemed disappointed to hear that, some people seem to have expected that though. At least he's not all-knowing. Dragon sighed to himself as he digested all of the information he had received. Enel had exact knowledge of two of the ancient weapons, even knowing the exact location of one. He was already a lot farther than the world government when it came to that aspect, which could only be a good thing. Uranus, I know absolutely nothing about it besides the fact that it's also an ancient weapon and that it was named after a god. Enel shrugged as he looked over the disappointed audience with an amused smile. Now, a few things I feel I should add here. Instantly, everyone's attention seemed to return to the stage, their disappointment momentarily forgotten. All three of the ancient weapons were likely belonging to the Great Kingdom in some way or another. Poseidon is the only exception. While this news took plenty by surprise once more, there were also plenty that had expected to hear that. After all, the world government didn't have their hands on any of the ancient weapons, which meant they likely never belonged to them in the first place. And another thing, the world government has parts of the ancient weapon Pluton. More specifically, they have its cannon. I can confirm this as it was used against me a while back. This news was the one to get the most gasps, but once again, there were still plenty of people that expected the world government to have something like that up their sleeves. That's about it for the ancient weapons. There is also not much else to add regarding the Great Kingdom. 
Actually, I think one thing should be mentioned. The great kingdom was likely a kingdom of slaves, one ruled and guided by the god of liberation, a figure everyone called Nika. This is more of a working theory, but it deserves a thought or two, as Nika is a prevalent figure in the void century. Still, take it with a grain of salt. Enel didn't wait for any questions as he moved on almost instantly. Giving the stage to Robin. Well, I'm glad we got over that. Now that you have a brief overview of what Ponglyphs are, their origins, and a bit of context on the Great Kingdom, I think it's time we get into the actual ancient script. This will be told by my companion, Robin, who is best qualified to teach you all regarding that. Enel then proceeded to walk away from the podium, standing to the side and smiling at Robin as she gulped a bit and proceeded to continue the lesson. POV narration Robin's lecture was a lot more straightforward than Enel's. Only being related to the ancient script, the basics of it and deciphering the first few words in a simple text that they had prepared beforehand. Enel didn't have much input for the rest of the lecture, but plenty of people were still sometimes looking over at him, especially the higher-ranking figures of the Revolutionary Army. People like Bello Betty, Morley, who was taking up a quarter of the room by himself, Karasu, Ivankov and even Sabo and Dragon were constantly looking at Enel with curious gazes. Ivankov especially was looking at Enel with quite a bit of appreciation. Having been part of the war, he was well aware that many of his people were unharmed thanks to his lightning. He had only come to Baltigo in order to meet Enel in the first place, as he wanted to thank the lightning emperor in person. Well, the lessons were mandatory, he would have had to learn the contents of them even if he failed to show up for the class itself. There would be more classes in the future, but Enel, who was by this point considered the master archaeologist of the group, only lectured in the very first class. The rest was to be handled by Nico Robin, the only survivor of O'Hara. Ivankov could tell that, for some reason, Enel was a lot more experienced as a professor. Robin herself wasn't bad, but the queer king could still tell that she was a bit uncertain in places. Enel, by contrast, was completely confident in each and every word that he had spoken, even when admitting that he didn't know shit about some things. It was endearing though, all of the head figures, and everyone that knew about Enel's feats found him endearing. Not only was he strong enough to make the world government bend backwards and constantly get in their way without any repercussions. Hell, Ivankov was shocked when he heard about one of the secret weapons that the world government could employ. The most shocking part was that Enel had faced it, and was completely fine. Now, usually, he wouldn't believe a claim like that without any evidence. But these were the words of an actual emperor of the seas. Enel was a person that didn't need to brag about his strength, as it was already recognized by the world to be at the very top. Ivankov waited diligently till the end of the lecture, just as everyone else did. He memorized as much as he could from Robin's lecture. But the job of the high officials was just to have a basic understanding of the language, not to know it by the back of their hands. They could choose to learn it earnestly, but knowing it was still the job of the archaeology team. So, Larthai, the leader of the archaeology team was the one that paid the most attention to the lecture. The blonde woman had managed to fill out half of each notebook that she had brought with her. She was also the most likely to follow all of the future lectures as well, and the higher-ups would likely just learn from her notes. It was mandatory for her subordinates, the rest of the members of the archaeology team, to also attend these lessons with her, so they all had their own notes to rely on. Enel walked off the podium with a smile on his face, he sidestepped the questions from the archaeology team with a smile on his face as he walked out the door whistling. Ivankov followed him, and Dragon decided that he would likely just visit him afterwards. Larthai seemed to have more questions for Robin, as the two of them left the lecture hall together. Ivankov managed to run into Enel after asking around a bit, he got directions to his home and managed to find him on his way there, with some luck. Enelchin so glad to finally get a hold of you. Ivankov's sensual voice reached Enel's ears, as the Sky King's spine trembled in fear. What the fuck? He looked around slowly, the sweat on his brow accumulating as he sighed when seeing that it was just Ivankov. I forgot about him. Enel had felt someone approaching when he was mulling over his thoughts, but he wasn't exactly in a state of high alert while in allied territory. Ivankov. Haven't seen you since the war. Glad to see you are healthy. Enel asked, his poker face not breaking one bit when the queer king winked a few times at him. We didn't speak all that much, but I had heard about you before. Enel said as he shook Ivankov's arm with a cordial smile. 
Oh. I didn't know little old me was so famous. Ivankov said, sounding somewhat flattered as he randomly turned himself into a woman. In his female form, he looked completely different, a lot taller and better proportioned. Enel sweated a bit as he started remembering more about Ivankov's ability and how busted it was. Was he even originally a man? It's honestly impossible to tell or know. By the way, your previous lecture was quite enlightening. Ivankov said as she started rearranging her hair and makeup. I wouldn't mind a private lesson, I'm afraid I don't have time for that. I, unfortunately, don't have long to spend with the Revolutionary Army, but I am flattered by the proposition. Enel's tone was extremely polite, Ivankov sweated a bit as she felt as if she was speaking to a corporation or a politician, or both. In the end, the queer king slash queen decided to stop joking around. Enel. On a serious note, I want to thank you for saving so many of my people during the war. Ivankov's words lost their usual, sensual, tone, being replaced by a marginally more serious one. Enel raised an eyebrow at that, he was a bit confused until he remembered that plenty of Ivankov's men and quite a few revolutionaries were there helping Luffy rescue Ace during the war. No need to thank me. Our goals aligned back then, I saw no use in letting so many die. Enel's voice was calm, but it was also quite cordial this time around. He was clearly appreciating Ivankov's gratitude and the fact that the queer king had felt the need to thank him in person. Well, you had no obligation to save my people. Nor did you have any obligation to save so many marines and pirates that day. The casualties of war were relatively small after your lightning started interfering. Ivankov crossed her arms and flashed Enel a wide smile. Well, that was all I wanted to say. Even if you don't end up allied with the Revolutionary Army, know that you will always find an ally in the Kamabaka Kingdom. Ivankov then walked away, swaying her hips as she walked forwards, making Enel sigh a bit when thinking about the situation. The Kamabaka Kingdom wasn't a horrifyingly powerful nation, but they had their fair share of powerful fighters, all masters of the Okama Kenpo. Plenty of the people in that kingdom also knew hockey, and with Ivankov they were actually a force to be reckoned with even on the world stage. I guess doing good deeds does pay off sometimes. Enel didn't regret saving that many people in the war. He hadn't done it expecting something, but in doing so he had managed to not completely burn the bridges with the marines, and gain new allies in many parts of the world. Now, saying that he didn't burn the bridge with the marines was a bold claim. But it was the truth that most of the high-ranking figures in the marines weren't outright hostile to him. Enel had the power to kill a lot of people during the war, yet he chose to protect the marines as well. That was also why Sengoku, Akainu and Akiji even felt like they could rely on him to save Garp. Enel sighed, no longer thinking about the war and starting to look into other activities that he could get into while waiting for the information he had requested from Dragon. He also started thinking of ways to improve Robin's training. He had Garp's techniques, and they worked great short term, but they needed one to have an extremely powerful mentality in order to bear with them. Enel could tell that Robin was slowly reaching her limits, so he needed to adjust a few things. He didn't want to make it too hard for her. She has two years to get stronger. I'll just help her build a foundation, the rest will likely be done by the rest of the Revolutionary Army. Enel then proceeded to go on with his day, not really bothering to do much else besides planning out Robin's new training program and looking for ways to appease his boredom. Maybe I should have given Ivankov some private lessons, after all. Enel laughed a bit at his own thoughts as he remembered his conversation with the queer king. Welp, I still have to rebuild that engine Enel had originally created. I've yet to figure out how to make it more compact. POV narration The weeks flowed by for Enel and Robin, as the two of them trained tirelessly. Well, Robin trained and Enel struggled to create the engine slash cloud machine he wanted. Enel had spoken to plenty of people during that time, he was visited by just about every cadre of the Revolutionary Army at that time. Surprisingly, it was taking a bit longer than anticipated for the Revolutionary Army to gather the information he requested. So that meant that he wouldn't have as much time to study it while with Baltigo. Still, for now, he was stuck with waiting. Studying and training. At least Robin was great company. The two of them had managed to become rather close during their training. Helped immensely by Enel starting to go easier on her, which she appreciated greatly. Still, even with her, Enel felt that he was stuck on Baltigo until he got the things he wanted. 
Unfortunately, the world didn't stand around waiting for him. Quite some time had already passed since the five elders had ordered a special base to be built in the Goa Kingdom. The said base was not quite a marine base, its front was that of a marine base. In fact, it housed and trained CP agents. The base was built secretly, and it was relatively close to Fusha village, which was known to be the home of Garp, the marine hero. A celestial dragon was also moved there, much to his displeasure. He was of a lower-ranking family, and he had no right to refuse orders from the five elders. Why am I being moved to a stupid little village, forced to live near dirty peasants? The mentality of the celestial dragons was bound to be rotten, no matter how low the rank of said celestial dragon's family was. A mansion was swiftly built for him, with a strange air bubble surrounding it. His arrival in the Goa kingdom was made public, as the world government wanted Garp to know that they already had his hometown in their hands. They certainly didn't care about the saint's life, to them, it was a matter of no importance. He was only there to serve one purpose. Threaten Garp's hometown with his presence. He was hand-picked by the five elders, as he was one of the most problematic world nobles around. The celestial dragon also had plenty of personal guards and had even brought some of his slaves for amusement. I hope this situation isn't permanent. I can't be living in this filth for the rest of my life. Saint Jonathan was the name of this particular celestial dragon, he was just as fat as the rest of his ilk. A permanent sneer was also present on his face as he constantly wore an air bubble around his head to avoid breathing in the same air as the lower classes. He was so disgusted by his surroundings that he decided to not venture out of his mansion at all. Seeing no issue with sitting on his bed all day and enjoying all the good food that he could as well as the company of his slaves. Today was a day like any other for him, eat fresh fruits and whip his male slaves while sometimes fondling the female slave that fed him. At this point it was routine for the slaves, most of them had empty eyes, and they were doing nothing more than going through the motions. That was the scene the Vice Admiral Mamanga walked on. He was still wearing the same purple and white pinstripe suit with a coat draped over his shoulders. His hair was also the same as it had been, with his mustache pointed outwards on each side and his hair was arranged in a mohawk, with a ponytail. A blank expression was on the face of the respected Marine Vice Admiral. He had been called in by St. Jonathan, probably to provide him with entertainment. I will never get used to this sight. Slavery wasn't exactly something easy on the stomach. Mamanga especially didn't like it. He had been tasked with protecting the celestial dragon in Fusha village, his head was obviously on the line if something were to happen to St. Jonathan. Mamanga released a deep sigh as he tried to hide his disdain for the parasitic blob of flesh he was stuck protecting. Things really went downhill after Enel left. Yes, he may have lost us the war, but their treatment of us really has hit a new low. In the first place, the marines had always been subservient to the world government, but the majority of marines could go their whole careers without even meeting with a single world noble. Now, they were moved to the middle of the holy land, tasked with a seemingly permanent protection job. All marines of any significance were now forced to protect and serve the whims of the celestial dragons. Many accepted that and took it as punishment for their failures during the war. There were also many marines madly loyal to the world government. But Mamanga was not part of either group. He was only loyal to the marines themselves and what they stood for. The marines were never meant to be guard dogs for the upper classes. We were supposed to be the protectors of the public. Even now, many suffer while our best are stuck catering to the needs of these world nobles. Mamanga was disgusted by that thought. And, since he was distracted by his thoughts, he let that a bit of displeasure show on his face, something which St. Jonathan had finally managed to take notice of. Oh. Are you bored, marine dog? Mamanga became expressionless when hearing the saint's voice. I could lend you a slave. I feel generous today. Jajaja, the celestial dragon laughed out loud while staring at Momonoga with disdain in his eyes. I am quite fine, Saint Jonathan. Mamanga didn't try to be any more polite than that. He didn't like the person he was protecting, but it was his job. He wasn't anywhere close to the only person with those thoughts. In fact, the majority of higher-ranking marines were in similar situations. All of them could only keep in mind the words of their new fleet admiral. Bear with it for now. I will do my best to rectify the situation. Akainu had taken a drastic shift after becoming fleet admiral. 
he was no longer as uncaring about his fellow marines as he had been in the past. That shift was brought both by Enel's actions and presence and by his new friendship with Akiji. This also brought forward an unexpected amount of respect even from Sengoku, whom he hadn't been on good terms with in the past. Against everyone's expectations, Akiji actually didn't protest Akainu's position. The two of them ended up working together, and both were just as displeased about the situation. Akainu wanted the marines to go back to doing what they were meant to. Killing pirates, which was also his speciality. So, Momonga would just bear with it for now. What a boring person. Guards. I want a new marine dog. This one is defective. St. Jonathan said with a shite-eating grin as his guards looked at Momonga wearily. St. Jonathan. My mission strictly refers to making sure that you are not in physical danger. I am not here to entertain you. Momonga simply turned around to leave after saying his piece. He hated being in the presence of that man slash pig, it always ended up with him restraining himself and leaving the room. This time though, it was a bit different. St. Jonathan was not actually in any good mood, he simply wanted to make fun of the marine that was assigned to him. After seeing that Momonga had no desire to play along, he got really mad. He took out a golden pistol and immediately pointed it at the back of the departing marine. Momonga stopped in his tracks, slightly turning his head around as his eyes narrowed a bit. St. Jonathan. I would advise against doing something like that to the person tasked with protecting you. Momonga's voice sounded calm, yet his eyes burned with frustration and anger. This is what I am forced to waste my time on. The celestial dragon didn't listen to him though, why would he? A shot rang out, with Momonga's body seemingly turning into a piece of paper and bending around the bullet with ease. Momonga was a 46-year-old vice-admiral, he was one that already had mastered all of the six powers to perfection, despite being a swordsman at heart. How exactly would a leech with a gun be dangerous to him? Momonga scowled a bit, before continuing to leave the room. The guards were acting like statues, not a single one of them tried to stop him, despite St. Jonathan's incessant whining and screaming. Although they were loyal pawns, their logic was quite sound when not approaching Momonga. A beating from St. Jonathan is a lot better than one from a vice-admiral. After years of working as guards, they knew how to bow and how to act in order to survive. And not one of them was willing to stop Momonga, as he was a protector assigned by the five elders, who were far above in jurisdiction compared to the saint they were guarding. St. Jonathan whipped his guards a bit, but he was still angry even after Momonga had left. So, he finally decided to go outside. I'm already bored of beating up the same people. I bet I'll find quite a few people to take out my anger on. POV narration St. Jonathan didn't waste any time gathering his posse of guards and random battle slaves. He was a fool, but not stupid enough to go outside without proper protection. Although he had that same feeling of invulnerability that all celestial dragons had, he still wanted to make sure nothing bad would happen. After all, there had been brazen pirates attacking a celestial dragon before, one such incident had happened quite recently in fact, during a slave auction. He didn't inform Momonga of his departure, disregarding the marine's presence as he didn't think he'd need a dog's protection when visiting nothing more than a remote village. And so, St. Jonathan proceeded to be carried by his slaves as he surveyed the surroundings of his new temporary home. Meanwhile, the village was unaware of the disaster approaching their small village. Most of the residents didn't really bother to think all that much about the movements of the government and the new buildings that seemed to spur up near their village. The mayor was a bit different though, he was keeping a close eye on the situation. Whoop Slap was quite concerned about how things were unfolding at a large scale. He had been keeping up with everything. He, as well as a few others in the village, were quite shocked to hear of Ace's execution and Luffy's involvement. At the very least the two of them were safe. The same couldn't be said about Garp. At least from Whoop Slap's perspective. Retired to a tropical island my ass. Garp's retirement had been already announced to the entire world. And most of the people that knew Garp on any level could tell that it was complete bullshit. Whatever happened to Garp? It's probably related to the failed execution. And his disappearance might also be the reason for that strange marine base and mansion appearing nearby. Whoop Slap didn't like the situation one bit. Old he was, but he was not a fool. The picture became clearer and clearer the more he thought about the situation. I guess the entire family is one of outlaws now. 
would slap rub the bridge of his nose in frustration. When that thought reached his mind, he also realized that their entire village was most likely being held hostage. It wasn't exactly a difficult conclusion to reach, it was rather obvious and in your face. It wasn't that hard to understand the game when knowing the pieces on the board. Unfortunately for Whoop Slap, knowing the game didn't mean anything, as there was absolutely nothing that he could do about it. Things were about to get worse though, a messenger came to the village, someone announcing to the villagers loudly that a world noble would be visiting them. Whoop Slap instantly became even more stressed, not that many people knew just how deplorable said world nobles were, but the mayor had been paying attention to worldly affairs, so he had some idea. The rest of the villagers were merely proceeding as usual, going to the tavern, having fun and drinking after a good day of work in the fields. The arrival of the world noble wasn't given much attention. And Saint Jonathan wasn't impressed when seeing the way he was received by the villagers. Why are they not here bowing their heads obediently? He was looking at the entrance of the village with anger in his gaze. No one had been there expecting him despite the fact that he had sent a messenger to inform them of his arrival. To him, the villagers were now nothing more than uncivilized swine. Not that his opinion of them was any greater beforehand. Veins would have been visibly popping up on his forehead were he not overweight. He whipped the slave he was riding to move faster as he and his guard started looking around the village randomly. He was disgusted by what he was seeing. Peasants were all around, laughing in the dirt and working in the fields, walking around drunk and not even bowing to him as he rode his slave around. It angered him greatly. It wasn't as if no one was paying attention to him, he was rather hard to miss, riding on a half-giant slave while whipping it with guards all around him. Plenty of people observed him from a distance, warily. Many entered their homes when seeing him, bringing their children inside as they didn't want to get involved with such a despicable person. Unfortunately, not everyone managed to get away from him. You! St. Jonathan shouted as he pointed his hand to a nearby drunkard. The man looked at the world noble with a shocked gaze. Who are yous? The man's slurred speech made some of the guards sweat a bit, as they knew the man would suffer the consequences of addressing a celestial dragon informally. The celestial dragon didn't even say anything, merely taking out his gun and shooting the drunkard in the stomach. The man collapsed to the ground, clutching at his wound as he screamed out in pain. Useless peasant. Humph. Saint Jonathan then proceeded to get down from his slave's back and start walking towards the place that had the most people gathered, the tavern in the middle of the city. The people that had witnessed that scene all looked on in fear, cowering and hiding in their homes. That gunshot had been heard everywhere in the village, so most people were already aware of the situation, at least to some extent. Whoop Slap grit his teeth when he observed what was happening from a distance, he gulped a bit when seeing the world noble approaching Makino's bar. Nothing good will come out of this. The old man walked forward with steady steps, stepping in front of the celestial dragon and the guards, looking at them coldly. He bowed to the fat man, and in a calm tone he spoke out. Sir World Noble, to what do we owe the pleasure? He decided not to bring up the man he had injured, for now, he didn't think further angering the world noble was a good idea. Ha! Huh. Did this ant just speak to me? Did I hear that right? The celestial dragon took out his golden gun once more, pointing it toward the old mayor. Whoop Slap trembled a bit when seeing that, not sure what to do. He had heard rumors about the world nobles, but it was a lot worse in person by the looks of it. Sir, please don't harm any more of our villagers. Whoop Slap quickly got to his knees, hoping to somehow appease the celestial dragon. Unfortunately for Whoop Slap, celestial dragons weren't the type to care about the lives of those underneath them. Heh, that's better. Ants should crawl on the ground. St. Jonathan said as he pointed his gun at the old mayor's head. Without any remorse or hesitation, the celestial dragon pulled the trigger as a shot rang out in the village once more. This time though, instead of screams, a loud clang was heard as a tall figure appeared in front of the old mayor that instant. A tall figure wearing a white and violet striped suit, alongside a marine coat with blue epaulets. It was none other than Vice Admiral Mamanga. His sword was raised, blocking the bullet with the hilt of the blade without much issue. Although stopping the bullet was easy, Mamanga was still sweating a bit, as he knew the situation was a bit problematic. I should have followed him from the beginning. Mamanga had rushed out of the mansion as soon as he heard the first shot ring out. 
he saw the injured person on his way, being tended to by a few other civilians. It helped somewhat remind Mamanga why the reputation of celestial dragons was so bad among the public. What ashamed him the most was that he had failed in his mission. He was tasked by the world government to look after the celestial dragon, sure. But he also received a secret mission from former fleet admiral Sengoku. And that was to look after the Fusha village and make sure no harm came to its residents. He was informed that this was the marine hero's hometown, and he was honored when given the duty of protecting it. Now, to Momonga the mission given directly by Sengoku was quite a bit more important than the one given by the world government, so he felt like a fool for failing the way he did. How could I think that this pig would walk around without causing trouble? The guards gulped a bit when seeing that Vice Admiral Momonga was blocking the bullet of a celestial dragon. What's the meaning of this? How dare you stop me, marine dog? St. Jonathan glared at Mamanga with fire in his eyes. At this point, the guard sighed, knowing that there was no way for them to escape a beating from a vice-admiral at that point. St. Jonathan. I am under direct orders to look after your physical health. I am under the impression that attacking these villagers will directly affect it. I apologize, but I am merely doing this for your safety. Mamanga bowed his head as he spoke. Whoop slap behind him finally recovered from the shock but he didn't move, knowing that it was probably safest for him to stand behind Mamanga in that situation. The guards of the Celestial Dragon were hopeful when hearing Mamanga's words, as the Vice Admiral had managed to spin the situation around a bit, somehow. But logic was not a factor in that situation, unfortunately. Especially not when a Celestial Dragon was involved. You all. I order you to bring me his head. Now. St. Jonathan waved his gun around as the guards looked at each other and jumped into action. At that point it was either they fought Mamanga or got killed by the Celestial Dragon commanding them. Vice Admiral Mamanga, please do not resist. These are direct orders from a world noble. What? Am I supposed to just kneel and wait to die? Mamanga seemed to tremble in rage when seeing the way things were developing. There simply was no arguing with a Celestial Dragon. The guards all took their weapons out, but Mamanga flashed around them using Soru, knocking all of them out instantly. Saint Jonathan, please refrain from such actions. Even as a joke, this is taking things too far. Mamanga still tried his best to appease the Celestial Dragon, although he was hating every single second of it. The Celestial Dragon was basically filing his teeth together at that point, Mamanga had already put his sword back on his waist and his palms were raised forward, as he tried to calm down the man in front of him. That's it. I'm not having this. The celestial dragon seemed to be searching his pockets for something, then he quickly took out a golden snail. Momonga immediately recognized it as a buster call. And when he did, he remembered Sengoku's words. Under any circumstances, stop a buster call from occurring. It doesn't matter what you have to do. Just make sure that doesn't happen. It was the thing that Sengoku had emphasized on the most. So it had remained ingrained in Momonga's mind. So, without even thinking, just as the saint's finger was about to touch the snail's button and call in the buster call, Momonga swung his sword, swiftly cutting off the saint's entire arm. The celestial dragon blinked a few times, the pain not setting in instantly. But it didn't take long for him to realize what had happened as the pain dropped him to the floor the second his adrenaline died down. Momonga stood there, petrified, as he realized what he had just done. This. I may have made a mistake. The celestial dragon squirmed on the ground, the golden snail had also been dropped somewhat close to him, still clutched into his severed hand. But the fat man was paying it no attention, as he was too busy clutching at his bleeding stump. Whoop Slap was also pale when seeing that situation, he knew enough from rumors to understand what happened and a celestial dragon was injured. We're dead. Whoop Slap muttered as he looked at the ground with despair in his gaze. POV narration Mamanga looked back at the old mayor behind him, his shoulders slouched and his gaze tired. The vice admiral was trying to wrap his mind around what had happened. I, I, don't bother. I think this would have been the result regardless of your actions. Whoop Slap said as he slowly got up from the ground. He looked at the struggling world noble with disdain but despair was still present in his gaze as he tried to think of ways he and his people could avoid genocide. I was the one to do it. Maybe they will just take my life. 
Momonga clenched his teeth as the celestial dragon finally seemed to pass out from blood loss. Unlikely. We all know how this situation is going to play out. Even looking wrong at a world noble can get your entire family killed. This village is done for. Although Whoop Slap was filled with despair, he was still somewhat managing to keep his calm. A buster call didn't scare him, he had been in the presence of Yonka level figures before and he didn't know any fear when it came to that. We need to evacuate this place. Quickly. Whoop Slap said as he rubbed his chin a bit. He was sure he'd be able to get the rest of the villagers to follow him, so there was no danger of anyone getting left behind. There was another problem though. Well, well, well. An assault on a celestial dragon, huh? Another figure in a white suit appeared in the middle of the street, Momonga narrowed his eyes when seeing it. A masked man wearing what seemed to be a rear admiral's marine coat. Momonga didn't recognize him though, and he knew every marine from Commodore and up personally. So he instantly assumed the man was a chipper pole agent. A CP agent masquerading as a marine? Momonga said as he mulled over his thoughts, his voice still lacking some of its usual confidence. Momonga contemplated what to do in that situation. His honor as a marine prohibited him from allowing the marine hero's hometown to simply be destroyed. He had disrespected the world government's orders though. Usually, he'd accept any punishment without hesitation. But this time was different. Even without thinking of Fusha village as the marine hero's hometown, Momonga still felt different about that situation. Was what I did really wrong? Momonga simply couldn't bring himself to think that letting the celestial dragon use the buster call on a random village was a good thing. A celestial dragon left to bleed out by an esteemed vice admiral. Are the marines rebelling against the world government? The masked man asked with an empty tone. Most CP agents were emotionless in the first place, especially high-ranking ones. Momonga could tell that the man in front of him was strong, so he assumed he wasn't exactly a grunt. This was a personal decision. Momonga's face looked grimmer and grimmer as time passed. Still, he decided to shoulder the blame, not willing to create a greater disaster by implicating Sengoku and Akainu in the matter. Personal. Huh. The CP agent seemed to tilt his head when speaking, seemingly mocking the vice admiral in front of him. Ten more marines all appeared around Momonga and Whoop Slap, shocking the old mayor and making the vice admiral grab his blade with a weary gaze. It's quite clear that the people of this village posed a threat to a celestial dragon. Saint Jonathan acted appropriately and decided to use his right as a world noble to use a buster call. Who are you to stop him? The agent dressed as a rear admiral spoke out without much emotion as two of the lower ranking agents went to grab the celestial dragon. Momonga wasn't an idiot though. He didn't care about the celestial dragon, but he knew that he could let the CP agents get their hands on the buster call, lest they finish the celestial dragon's job. So, the second the agent started moving, Momonga jumped into action, slicing the head of one of the approaching agents, the other one had barely managed to block his blade with a blackened fist. Momonga scowled as his wrist tightened, his blade turning pure black as he cut straight through the second agent as well. He swiftly reached out and grabbed the golden snail from the ground. It's already too late for me. I must at least protect. This village. Momonga thought to himself as the agents seemed to rush in from all directions, more of them appearing as he fought with fervor, protecting the snail in his palm. A buster call is only initiated if the golden snail sends a signal to the silver snail in the headquarters, this usually happens when a button is pressed. But, if the golden snail is to die, then the signal will be sent all the same. Momonga's blade danced around, slicing through the CP agents with devastating precision, sometimes stopping and clashing with one, while receiving cuts and injuries from all of the others surrounding him. The high-ranking agent hadn't even joined in the fight yet. The masked fake rear admiral was only observing the situation from a distance. Whoop Slap was looking at the situation with a grim expression as well, he could tell that the marine in front of him was fighting to protect the village, it was quite obvious even to someone blind. At that point, most of the people in their homes were looking at the scene with horror, and the old mayor could feel it as well. As a mayor, it should be my duty to protect my people. But I am nothing more than a weak old man. The old man looked around, the agent seemed to be ignoring him, as they had a bigger threat to deal with. Even though injuries were accumulating, Momonga was still slashing away at their numbers. At that point, 
Thirteen agents had already fallen, two blades were sticking out of Mamanga's back and his body was filled with wounds, yet he was still fighting. At that point, the houses around them were also wrecked, and plenty of people were running away further from the conflict. Makino's bar also had its roof cut off by a stray flying slash. Only ten more agents were around, yet Mamanga was already exhausted. It was now that the higher-ranking agent jumped in, his strikes a lot heavier, his arms growing mantis blades as he cut towards the vice-admiral with impressive speed. Mamanga blocked a few slashes, but he was forced to jump backwards after a while. At the very least, I shouldn't let this man shoulder all of the blame. The village is already doomed, with or without this, it's clear that the world government wants to use us to punish Garp or draw him out. Whoop Slap slowly crawled towards the celestial dragon, grabbing the pig's golden pistol from the ground with a weary gaze. The old mayor acted quickly, pointing his gun at the celestial dragon in that same instant. The high-ranking CP agent took notice of that, quickly snapping his head toward the old mayor and trying to rush towards him. Turning your back on an enemy? Presumptuous. Mamanga slashed him across the back, sending him tumbling and rolling to the side as he shouted. Stop that old man. The lower-ranking CP agents finally started acting. But they were far too late. A single shot rang, a bullet entering the celestial dragon's head just as an agent got in front of the old mayor. Shit. The agent quickly kicked the old man into the bar behind him, breaking the wall of the bar and knocking the wind out of him almost instantly. You dare kill a celestial dragon. The high-ranking CP agent disregarded his injuries, looking at the broken wall of the tavern with hate. Mamanga was shocked by what had happened as well, momentarily freezing. Cough. The old man crawled out of the building, coughing a bit of blood as he started speaking. As if you were going to spare us. At the very least he gets to die too. Here's hoping you all will follow him. The old mayor looked at the CP agent with fire in his gaze. His anger bubbled in his tone. His rage was directed at the world, as the situation was looking worse and worse. He looked at the body of the celestial dragon with a tired gaze. The old man couldn't even bring himself to feel anything about Saint Jonathan. The celestial dragon was nothing more than a pawn in the world government's game. Whoop Slap simply wanted to kill the pawn to spite the king, a form of struggle. It was the only way someone weak like him could strike back. Killing someone insignificant. But the celestial dragon was only insignificant to the higher-ups, the people present all seemed to be trembling when seeing the corpse of the celestial dragon. To the CP agents, the death of the celestial dragon meant that they were also going to get killed. Still, they hoped that they'd be excused if they were able to do their missions. Well, at least the high-ranking one hoped he'd be spared, the others didn't have high chances. Still, all of them recovered from their shock and started fighting once more. Whoop Slap wasn't killed yet, as all of the agents rushed trying to finish off Mamanga first. The Vice Admiral was unrelenting though. All until one point. After so many slashes and accumulated injuries, Mamanga's attention slipped for one second, which led to his hand being swiftly cut off by the mantis claw of the high-ranking CP agent, forcing him to drop the golden snail he had been holding that entire time. Mamanga's eyes widened as he jumped back and clutched at his bleeding stump. Blocking a few flying slashes with his blade and sending a few with his legs. Shit. He said as he saw the high-ranking CP agent crush the golden snail underneath his foot. We're done for. I failed. Mamanga said, his voice tired as blood poured from his wounds. This has been the case for a while now, young man. Whoop Slap said as he shakily got up. Humph. I'll make sure to kill you both before any marine ship gets here though. This kingdom will be purged thanks to your efforts. The CP agent said as he seemed to transform completely into a three meter tall mantis. Our efforts. Bah. Do you usually eat this much shit? Whoop Slap said as he held himself up, leaning on Mamanga's leg. Mamanga sighed a bit, taking a few seconds to catch his breath. I hope Sir Sengoku has something planned for this occasion. As the situation developed on their side, the silver snail seemed to intercept the dying signal from the golden one on Fusha village. The fleet admiral was instantly informed, and he then proceeded to walk over to the communications room. Akainu's mind was filled with anxiety as he walked into the room, fearing the worst had happened. Which island is it? 
Akainu asked the scrambling officers as he looked at the silver snail with narrowed eyes. IITs from the Goa Kingdom, Fleet Admiral Akainu. Specifically from a place called, Fusha Village. An officer spoke as he intercepted the signal and found the location almost immediately. I see. Akainu walked over to the table with the silver snails and looked at the one in question. Such a shame. He put his palm over it, magma consuming it in seconds as the signal proceeded to die down instantly. Fleet Admiral. The officers asked as they all started sweating when seeing the look in Akainu's eyes. Such a shame this silver snail malfunctioned. It seems we need to order a new one from Vegapunk. Akainu glared at the officers without any restraint, narrowing his eyes. All of them simply gulped and nodded. Understood, sir. We'll cancel all orders and get it replaced right away. The leader of the communications team quickly got to work, commanding the other officers to quickly clean the defective snail. Sengoku also entered the room as that was happening, the look on his face was grave, as he could only imagine just how bad things were back in Fusha village. This is bad. The former fleet admiral said as he took off his round glasses. Let's continue this in my office. Akainu then walked out, not even bothering to look back at the communication team as he walked out. He and Sengoku started speaking instantly. Do we have anyone nearby that can assist Momonga? The situation must be pretty dire if this ended up happening. Sengoku asked as he sat down on the couch and looked at the current fleet admiral. Two rear admirals are already on their way, Akainu said as he tapped onto a special transponder snail, sending a signal to his men. I had them move nearby in advance, but I hoped they wouldn't be needed. Let's just hope they aren't too late. Sengoku said as his goat came to his side to comfort him, likely sensing his stress. We do know of someone that will likely arrive in time. Akainu said as he leaned back on his chair. I'm sure Kizaru won't be okay with going the against the world government like this. Sengoku said as he stroked his beard. Wait. You don't mean. Enel already helped us once with Garp, they are clearly friends. All we have to do is inform him of the situation, and we won't even need to ask for his assistance, he'll likely just give it to us. Akainu said as he searched his desk a bit, taking out yet another small transponder snail, one that had formerly belonged to Sengoku. Do you think he still has his transponder snail? Sengoku asked as he clenched his fists. The former fleet admiral hadn't come close to forgiving Enel yet, but he could understand why he had done it, at least to some extent. It was clear that Enel had chosen his friendship with Garp over the Marines, much like Garp had chosen his family over his duty by not helping much during the war. He couldn't bring himself to hate either of them, but that didn't mean he didn't feel betrayed. They had planned to inform him of Garp's capture in that way, by calling him on the transponder snail that Sengoku had gifted him at one point. But they didn't have to do that, as Akiji had managed to run into him at some point. Akiji didn't go into detail about the circumstances of their meeting, and all of the people that had been on the ship were mute about it too, but Enel had learned of Garp and saved him after a week or two. This time, they could only hope Enel would pick up. POV narration Enel didn't think much of his day. His training with Robin had already been over, and he was just laying on his bed and looking at a few books, trying to study a bit more about steam engines. He was somewhat interested in the trains built in Water 7, as they reminded him a lot of his world's trains, but on water, which didn't make much sense to him. But the world of One Piece was always strange to him, so it wasn't like he expected the logic and even physics of his own world to apply in all places. Dragon had given him access to their entire library, and it was quite extensive. Not quite as large as the one in O'Hara going by Robin's words, but it was still a lot of information all gathered in one place. Enel received a few bits and pieces of news regarding the outside world, but he tried to focus on his tasks for a bit. Dragon seemed rather anxious about the reports he was receiving though. A celestial dragon being moved over to Garp's hometown was certainly something of notice. As Garp's son, he felt the need to mobilize a few agents nearby, just to observe the situation from a distance. Enel didn't act when hearing the information though, thinking that the world government was likely announcing that as a way to gloat to the marine hero. Enel assumed they were planning on keeping the village hostage for at least a few months, not nuking it instantly. In the first place, he didn't think they would dare to destroy it. The world government would really be playing with fire if they tried that. 
That was the hometown of the marine hero, Ace, who was a commodore to the Whitebeard Pirates, and Dragon, the world's greatest criminal and leader of the Revolutionary Army. That place also happened to be where Shanks and his crew stopped by a few times and befriended the locals. Of course, Enel didn't think they'd know about all of that, but at least the parts with Garp and Dragon should have been enough to stop them from attacking. It was as if they were starting a war. Though the war might have been started the second they tried to imprison Garp. Enel stopped thinking about the news after a while and concentrated on his light reading material on advanced thermodynamics. What Enel didn't expect was to hear a familiar ringtone. Well, it was a snail making ringing sounds with its voice. Enel had still kept his transponder snail, he always carried it at the bottom of his travel bag. Even after he left the marines, he still kept it. It was still a useful tool. He could also use it to speak to Gon Fall at greater distances, so he always brought it with him. What he didn't expect when picking up was to hear Akainu's voice. Enel. Good thing you picked up, you piece of shit. It was in an angry tone, as usual. But Enel could tell that Akainu was actually glad he had picked up. Enel blinked a few times as he wondered why Akainu would even call him. He doubted it was a mandatory health check or to speak about marine pension benefits. Didn't expect to hear your cheery voice. The hell do you want? Enel asked as he tilted his head a bit, his tone was a bit amused as he spoke without any filter. He didn't think he was still considered a friend to the Navy, so them contacting him obviously came as a surprise. Akiji's situation was a lot different, as it was still him that jumped on their ship. With Akainu, Enel was half expecting him to find a way to trace the call back to Baltigo and lead a buster call there. Even if they decide to attack this place, I'll just sink their ships and suggest a new base for the Revolutionary Army. On the Sky Islands, of course. Enel would have liked to have his allies closer to his main base, but he also couldn't just ask them to uproot everything and move to an island in the middle of the sky. Especially not when their island was already well hidden and devoid of any government agents. I just felt the need to let you know. Fusha village is most likely getting attacked currently, we intercepted a buster call request as well. Do what you wish with that information. Akaina hung up after saying that, making Enno stare at his transponder snail with a startled gaze. Seriously? They're actually acting already? Enno quickly got up and walked outside, looking at the sky with a cold gaze. He quickly spotted Dragon flying towards his home, he seemed to also be sporting quite a grave look in his eyes. He had clearly received a report from his agents near Fusha village. He was heading towards Enel's residence, as he knew Enel would reach there fastest. Enel. Dragon shouted as he the two of them stopped in midair, Enel's lower body was made of lightning and Dragon was controlling the clouds around him to prop himself up. I already got the news. I'm going first, don't worry about it. Enel then turned into a flash of light. With a loud burst, a thunderous roar was heard across all of Baltigo as Enel's figure turned into lightning and departed. Thankfully, Enel already knew the location of the Goa Kingdom, so all that was left was controlling his speed in order to reach it properly. Turning into an electromagnetic wave and flowing in that general direction. Moving at light speed wasn't something that Enel could control, not even with future sight, his perception fell far behind. But when forcing his observation hockey and mind to its utmost limits, Enel was able to reach and almost control at least half of the maximum speed that his devil fruit could provide. He could only go in a straight line while at that speed, as even the slightest alteration had the chance to spiral him out of the stratosphere and into space. Such a speed was simply not usable in most situations, but when traveling a long distance in a short time, it was perfect. And thanks to that, Enel would manage to reach the village in around two minutes at least by his calculations. He also took into account that he would have to stop and readjust his direction a few times. He just hoped that he'd get there in time. And while he was flying over, the situation at Fusha village was worsening. The high-ranking CP agent gave Mamanga and Whoop Slap a smug look, having crushed the buster call under his shoe and gloated to them a bit. But he wasn't foolish enough to spare them, he quickly jumped into action. At least tried to, but his stride got interrupted. A loud bang rang in the village as a cannonball cut the CP agent's path. He managed to turn his body and slice the cannonball in half, but he was momentarily distracted, which led to him almost receiving a flying slash from Mamanga. Dayton. Whoop slap muttered as he looked in the direction of the cannonball. 
mountain bandits rushed the village, trying their best to rescue the citizen and fight against the CP agents. Cannons and bazookas weren't common weapons for them, so they didn't have a lot of ammunition. But Dayton, their leader, felt the need to use them at that point. Mountain bandits. The CP agents were shocked to see that. But they weren't scared. Not by any stretch of the imagination. The mountain bandits were quickly getting overwhelmed, and all of them didn't stand a chance against the trained government agents. What the hell is going on? Dayton asked in a loud voice, the bazooka in her hand pointed towards the high-ranking CP agent as she stared at the destroyed village with rage. She fired another shot, this time, the CP agent simply stepped aside, also dodging a slash from Momonga in the process. You shouldn't have gotten involved. At least you'd have survived in that way. Whoop Slap said as he sat on the ground, his wounds bleeding slightly. Shut it. You ain't the boss of me. Dayden said as her men kept trying to shoot at the CP agents. Many fell to flying slashes sent by the agents, and their bullets did little if anything at all. Regardless of that, the bandits were unrelenting. Trying to hold on and save as many villagers as they could. Boss. This ain't going well. One of the bandits shouted as he looked at the situation from a vantage point, climbing on a ruined building. Dayden simply scoffed. We can't just let everyone here die. She grabbed her club and rushed at the high-ranking agent that Momonga was fighting, having run out of ammunition, this was the best that she could do. The CP agent only gave her a sideways glance as he kicked her torso, sending her flying into a building and breaking it rather easily. The agent then turned to Momonga, whose injuries were already impossible to ignore. He was clearly unable to fight anymore, at least his body was no longer responding in time to his commands. The CP agent smiled under his mask as he raised his arm, aiming to slice off Momonga's head in one sweep. That was when they all heard it. The sky trembled with rage, and the clouds instantly turned dark. L4. A voice sounded out from the sky, tired, lazy, but at the same time angry. The high-ranking CP agent only got to direct his gaze at the sky for a tenth of a second before a lightning pillar engulfed him completely. At that moment, all of the agents looked up. All of the villagers and bandits present looked at the sky as well, confused as to why a freak storm had suddenly appeared at such a dire time. And in the sky, sitting on a small cloud, was a man. A shirtless man with baggy pants, and draped over his back was a long-sleeved white furred coat with justice written on it. Enel had finally arrived to 1 minute and 32 seconds, and that was because he had to backtrack a little, as he had overshot the island by about a hundred kilometers initially. But that was irrelevant, he had gotten to Fusha village in record time. Enel surveyed the island, only to find it in an even worse shape than he had expected. An absolute mess. Villagers and bandits were running all around. CP agents were either killing the bandits and some villagers, or all encroaching into one location, where Momonga had been fighting the CP agent he had just killed. Iitis the Sky King. An emperor of the sea. People had different reactions to his appearance, but all seemed to recognize him. But unfortunately for the CP agents, recognizing Enel only meant that they would know what killed them. The people of Fusha village and the bandits weren't exactly relieved by his presence either, but Momonga released a tired sigh when seeing him descend. With him here, everything should be fine. I doubt he would harm Garp's home. And so, Momonga finally let himself fall to the ground, dropping his sword to the side as he took a deep breath of air. None of the agents that had been attacking him took advantage of that though, they had far greater concerns now. The CP agents looked at the sky with fear, but they didn't wait for death to take them. They all instinctively knew what to do, as their leaders had already instructed everyone on a way to combat Enel, at least while on land. All of you. Disperse the clouds. At least we'll have a chance that way. The agents quickly swiped their weapons and legs at the sky, releasing flying slashes, as many as they could. Their efforts were shown, as they managed to part the cloud slightly, forming a small hole in the sky. But it didn't mean much in the end. Sango. Lightning flash. Enel pointed his palm at the ground, and an erratic stream of lightning flowed out of his palm, parting in many ways and extending towards the village almost instantly. The agents didn't get the time to dodge, as the lightning struck them down one by one. Not even five seconds passed, and the CP agents were already down from 34, 
which had been all of the agents they had moved into the nearby base, minus the ones Momonga killed, to a measly four. The four had managed to somehow either hide or use the bodies of others as shields. But Enel didn't even take a second glance at that. Surviving a casual attack wasn't something that deserved praise in Enel's eyes. The sky discharged some more lighting bolts onto them, creating small pillars of light that killed each of the agents. Enel then landed near Mamanga, who was already sprawled on the ground from exhaustion. Enel. Mamanga muttered as Enel turned around. Vice Admiral Mamanga. You look worse for wear. Enel said as he grit his teeth a bit. He hadn't expected to see a marine defending the town, but it seemed that Sengoku and Akainu weren't exactly on good terms with the world government. As if that hadn't been made obvious by the fact that Akainu had called him of all people. I guess they won't be acting on the buster call. Covering it up won't be easy though. They absolutely have spies in their ranks. As well as plenty of world government fanatics. I'm fine. I can still fight if I need to. Momonga said as he shakily got up. Looking at Enel with some confusion. Nah. They're all dead or dying now. Pretty sure Akainu stopped a buster call from coming here, so there shouldn't be more enemies. Momonga sighed a bit when hearing that, wondering how Enel even knew about Akainu's actions. But he decided not to get into that right away. Instead, he felt as if he was meeting an old acquaintance. A former comrade in arms even. He may have turned coats and betrayed the marines, but Enel had never actually killed a marine in the war, so there wasn't much resentment on Momonga's part. I didn't expect to see you so soon after Marineford. Figured you'd be lying low for a few years. Momonga said with a bloody smile. Heh. I'm sure there's plenty to talk about. But let's get your wound looked at first. There's surely a medic in this village. Enel then looked at Whoop Slap, the mayor of the village. The old man was looking up at Enel without any trace of fear, he also didn't seem to be bothered by his injuries. Heh. I guess Garp has plenty of friends. The old mayor said as he slowly got up. I'll gather everyone. We'll have to leave this place if we want to live. Whoop Slap said as he stood up and went over to the middle of the village, quickly calling what remained of the bandits to him. Their group quickly started gathering as many civilians as possible, and Enel was stuck thinking of ways they could use to escape the island. There was always the possibility of stealing a ship, but he doubted any of the people present knew how to run a ship beside him and Momonga. Seriously. Why did things have to go to shit so quickly? POV narration Enel walked around the battlefield with a scowl on his face. Momonga was being tended to by a random civilian, the doctor of the village was busy, as there were dozens of people injured. Enel couldn't help but be mad at himself when seeing the damage done to the village. This could have been avoided. I should have acted the second Garp told me that he got threatened. I didn't think they'd have the guts to do something like this. Enel also found the corpse of the Celestial Dragon, which he kicked over a bit, studying his clothes for a few seconds before sighing. I don't recognize this one, but that's not important. A Celestial Dragon died here. Enel sighed as he realized that there was little chance of the government sparing the villagers from that point on. They're likely going to be branded demons just like back in O'Hara. For a few seconds, the Sky King considered destroying the body of the Celestial Dragon and taking the blame for his death. But that really wouldn't have made any difference. The world government never needed evidence to brand someone a criminal or demon. Even if I take the blame, nothing would change. In the end, he decided not to bother himself, he simply stepped over the body and continued to pull out people from broken down buildings. After a few minutes, all of the stuck villagers were freed, and even the bodies of the ones that didn't make it were laid in the middle of the village square. Enel continued to look around, surveying the wreckage and sighing once more as he felt two large marine ships approaching. More specifically, one was a cargo ship, and the other was a warship. He could tell they weren't part of a buster call though. There was no trace of other ships besides them, and cargo ships were not used in any military activities besides the transport of goods and or weaker prisoners. In the first place, a buster call was a mobilization en masse, moving a force even greater than the army of a developed country to take down a perceived threat to the marines or the world government. They're either here to survey the situation or are responding to some distress calls. Of which there should be many. Then, as Enel was contemplating jumping on their ships and questioning them, 
he felt two figures starting to approach the island. More specifically, Enel could sense them hopping over to the island. At first, Enel didn't know who they were, but after seeing them he did manage to recognize them. Two rear admirals, faces that he had seen back in Marineford. Hmm. Followers of Akainu, if I remember correctly. At least I hope so, I've killed enough people for the day. Enel obviously had no way to be sure of the intentions of the people approaching the village. But he could somewhat assume that they were sent by either Akainu or Sengoku, or both. Otherwise, there was no reason for two legitimate and grand line treading rear admirals to be in East Blue, the weakest of the four seas. Enel smiled when seeing them, realizing that Akainu and Sengoku had actually taken more precautions to protect Garp's hometown than he had. Still, their precautions still weren't enough. Not that I have any right to comment. I guess the world government was keeping an eye on them and they were restricted in what support they could provide. The two rear admirals also instantly recognized Enel noticed him approaching them and decided to land as soon as they could. They didn't know the intentions of the newbie emperor, but they knew that fighting him in the air with only Jeppo to rely on was actually suicidal. Especially for them, who couldn't really push away all of the storm clouds gathered in the sky. A fruit like the Goro Goro no Mi was actually impossible to face on most occasions. Very few even had the qualifications to withstand even one of Enel's hits. And the rear admirals were somewhat aware that they didn't quite belong to that group. They both ended up stopping at the shore as the former marine appeared in front of them. Startling them slightly as they immediately prepared for action. The two of them had their hands on their blades and Enel was holding his staff, using it as a walking stick, but neither group decided to act. Enel could tell that the marines in front of him were extremely tense, but he could tell that they weren't outright hostile, which only further strengthened his assumption of them being there to help. In the end, Enel decided to relieve the tension, by starting up a conversation. I'm assuming the two of you are here on Akainu's orders. Enel's voice sounded somewhat tired, but he wasn't exactly physically exhausted. It was mere mental exhaustion, and he could ignore that for now. He looked at the two rear admirals with narrowed eyes, waiting for their answer. The two marines looked at each other for a bit, before they nodded and one of them decided to speak up. Indeed, we were stationed near this place, waiting for a signal from Akainu to intervene if something happened. The two of them looked at the state of the village with serious gazes, likely realizing that they were a bit too late in their intervention. Good. At least you aren't enemies. Enel said as his cape flowed in the wind. Sometimes sparkling with electricity. The fewer people I have to kill the better. I don't wish to harm marines, but the people attacking the village before all seemed to wear marine clothing. Enel looked at the bodies of the CP agents he had fried. Well, they certainly weren't marines, that's for sure. Seriously, what shitty disguises. You'd think CP agents would do better than this. I mean, all of them were decently strong, enough to have a decent rank if they were marines. I would have certainly seen some of them in Marine Ford too if they weren't fakes. Our warships already have been filled with enough supplies to transport the villagers living here over a long distance. The other rear admiral said as he looked back at their approaching ships. Enel smiled when hearing that. Pleased that he no longer had to look for a way to get the villagers out of the island. But his smile didn't last long, as the conversation continued. Enel then proceeded to give the newcomers a rundown of the situation, as best as he could. Including the death of the Celestial Dragon. Which made the two rear admirals freeze completely. Both of them looked genuinely scared when hearing that. Enel could somewhat understand that. They were now basically involved in an incident that had a lot to do with the death of a world noble. If that was found out, then they'd simply be executed, or branded as traitors slash pirates and be forced to flee and uproot their lives. Enel decided to give them some reassurance. No need to worry. Akainu is sure to protect the two of you. If he doesn't, then I will. You are making Garp a huge favor by helping these villagers, and, by extension, you are also making me a huge favor. The rear admirals seemed to relax a bit when hearing that before one of them seemed to notice something strange. Wait. Is Vice Admiral Garp currently your associate? The other one also seemed to snap his startled gaze at Enel when hearing that. Enel just gave them a wry smile. I guess they wouldn't be informed of stuff like Garp's imprisonment and subsequent breakout. Let's just say he is my friend. 
There's no way Garp would ever become a pirate, so you don't have to worry. For some reason, the two of them decided to believe Enel for now. They also decided to ignore the fact that out of every person in the Marine headquarters, Garp certainly matched the temperament and demeanor of a pirate the most. They continued to speak a bit more, Enel bringing them to the middle of the village, where everyone was gathered. The rear admirals received quite a few wary gazes from the residents. Dayton was actually about to smash one of them with her club, but Enel got involved and calmed the villagers down. Whoop Slap was glad to receive help from the marines, and the villagers were all rather mortified to find out that they had actually been attacked by a secret government organization posing as marines. The marine ships had also managed to reach the island in the meantime, dropping their anchors and disembarking all at once. They quickly got to work, marines were all trained in first aid on the battlefield, so they immediately started helping the injured. Enel could tell that there weren't as many as one would usually have on a warship and a cargo ship, but that was likely because Akaniu couldn't use people sympathetic to the world government for such a mission. In truth, the majority of marines were crazily loyal to the world government, and only the higher-ups would criticize or even slightly go against the world government. Most marine recruits were born and bred with the idea that the world government was the reason for peace in the world. Still, Enel was impressed there were that many of them willing to go against the world government in order to do good. The fact that they were helping in the marine hero's hometown certainly was a motivator though. Regardless, after another hour, the citizens, as well as Dayton and her family, were all bandaged up and moved onto the ships for further treatment where needed and to prepare for fleeing the scene. Momondo was already unconscious, his wounds were being tended to, but the marine doctor that was present didn't have high hopes of being able to reattach his arm. He was the one that received the gravest injuries, it was a miracle he even survived long enough for Enel to arrive, let alone to be treated by the marines. Now that everyone was on the ships, and the marines were preparing to leave the scene, there was only one question left. Where do we go? The two rear admirals hadn't received any instructions on a location they could move the civilians to. They were not sure where they could even go. Everyone, even the recruits, knew that the people of Fusha village were going to be branded as criminals, so they weren't sure where they could safely allow them to continue living. Enel had an odd look on his face when hearing that problem from the rear admirals. Did Akaina not think that far? Or did he simply not have the time and resources to find a secret spot for these people in case something happened? Enel sighed as he realized that the second option was the most likely one. At that point, it was already clear that the Marines didn't have anywhere near as much leverage as before. Akaina likely had to jump through countless hoops just to bring two ships to the scene. So, it remained up to Enel, where the people of Fusha village would end up. Well. The answer is quite obvious, isn't it?